Good morning. The Mayor of Entebbe Municipality, Mr. Fabrice Rolinda, the Vice Chancellor of Nkumba University, Professor Jude Lubega, the University Secretary, Professor Francis Kasekende, the Academic Registrar of Nkumba University, Professor Andrew Yiga, our esteemed international and local scholars, presenters at this research webinar, Professor Mary Nanyondo from Durham University in the United Kingdom, Dr. Ricardo Peters from Salt Lake University in South Africa, Dr. James Kariuki Njenga from the University of the Western Cape in South Africa, Professor Mande Wilson Muyinda of Mkumba University, Professor Richard Mwirumubi Arali of Mkumba University, and Ms. Diana Nabuato of Mkumba University. Colleagues, both local and international, joining us online. Our student body, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you all for joining this virtual meeting of the SBA Research Webinar Series of the 22nd of October, 2021. As someone said, the show must go on. I am aware that this is not perceived as a show, but rather an academic gathering for constructive engagement and sharing of knowledge. I appreciate your efforts to be together virtually. I especially extend our sincere gratitude to all our esteemed presenters for accepting to participate actively in this webinar, and we are excited and look forward to learning from you today. One of the critical roles of university is research and community engagement. We are delighted as a school that these platforms enhance our research capacities and bolster our footprint and relevance in the immediate communities and beyond. Through research, we intend to capacitate each other with knowledge, skills, and we engage in problem-driven and result-oriented research that continuously addresses our inadequacies as Uganda, Africa, and contribute to our region putting its best foot forward in the new era. The selected theme for this research webinar is State of Business and Management in the Digital Age was chosen to help us ponder on the Uganda's position and Africa at large in the digital age. The topics discussed today, or the topics that will be discussed today, um, including corporate responsibility, ethics, accountability, accounting and finance, entrepreneurship, managing technology and innovation, resource management and sustainable development, are just guidelines to a more enriched insights that we anticipate in this webinar. Our reality in Africa, according to the IMF report on digitization in sub-Saharan Africa 2020, captures the following. We perceive a fast-paced digital revolution and promise of transformation of economies and people's lives. The reality of the unprecedented health and social economic crisis due to COVID-19 pandemic. We note that government's attention has been directed to the protection of lives and livelihoods at various levels. Connectivity disparities still higher in lesser income countries and especially in rural areas. They are perceived benefits of diffusion of digital technologies and knowledge to create opportunities of inclusion, greater resilience and efficiency access to global markets, increased transparency, accountability, and creation of new jobs, among others. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, while we find ourselves entangled in these realities, we are still a developing region, but we also believe that there are signs of hope in the efforts to embrace the digital age. Are we ready as a region, as Uganda, embracing the positive wave of the digital era? in business and management. 
I invite us all into fruitful deliberations and thank you for taking time out today in joining us in this research webinar. We look forward to the presentations, the discussions, and learning from your insights, and most importantly, your recommendations. I owe you. May I now take this uh, opportunity to invite our Vice Chancellor uh, to welcome us all officially. Professor Jude Lubega, you're welcome. His Lordship, the Entebbe Municipality Mayor, Mr. Fabrice Rurinda, who is attending with us online, all professors attending, researchers attending, all students and staff from all over the world attending this academic discourse, all other op uh, protocols observed, ladies and gentlemen. I would want to add my voice to the Dean on welcoming each one of you uh, to this very important webinar which has been organized by the School of uh, Business Management and IT in trying to tackle issues that pertain us in this particular era. As the theme goes, the state of business and management in the digital age, I think it's a very paramount theme that has been selected for us to have a discourse on. With the emergence of uh, the COVID-19, it was evident that many things had to be de done differently. And therefore, there was a need of rethinking on how to undertake so many things in terms of service provision. There was a lot of change in the business processes. And we saw ICT coming at the center stage in trying to get things up and running. So once we have a theme of this kind, we are just trying to have a very good discourse on what should be done in terms of improving our business processes. I hope this particular discourse organized by the school will be a good opener to all of us to start thinking about how to do things differently. As in Kumba University, we had to remodel a lot of our business processes to fit into the current era which had been brought about by the COVID-19. This happened in our teaching, management, research undertaking, and even supervision, among others. This has had to put Nkumba University at a different level among so many high institutions of learning. So what we are discussing today is very, very, very important. And colleagues out there should be happy that we are actually discussing it. At this point in time, I want to welcome our colleagues from far and near. There are some from the UK, there are some from South Africa, 
there are some from Kenya and Uganda that are attending this webinar. Thank you for sparing your time to come and have and participate in this discourse so that we can tell the story, we can try to guide others on how they can remodel their business processes to support uh, service provision. I would want to take the opportunity to request all colleagues attending from far and near today, let's further develop synergies that will support our institutions to be further strengthened in areas of research, education, and the like. If we can have this together now, why not even participate in other particular aspects like research uh, and any other collaborations? So I call upon our colleagues from the UK, South Africa, please, let's go beyond this and let's get things done. Let's undertake the collaborations among us, others. I think it's what the world calls institutions to do. These days you can't do it alone. So collaborations, we are very willing to collaborate with you in all these uh, particular aspects, research, teaching, and learning, and so on. I would want also to thank so much His Lordship, the Mayor of Entebbe Municipality, for joining hands with Nkumba University and allowing us to sign an MOU with them to see how we can improve teaching and learning research undertaking within the country. We appreciate your endeavors and we promise to work with you in trying to develop our country. I would want to thank the school and all those members that have uh, done a lot to make sure that uh, this webinar is a reality. The ICT team and everybody, thank you so much. At this point in time, I would want to request all I want to welcome His Lordship, the Mayor, Mr. Fabrice Rulinda, to talk to this <coughs> gathering that is attending online, and then also officially open this webinar officially. Okay, as uh, we're waiting uh, for the mayor to come in, uh, we would want to request uh, the IT team to just give us a feel of uh, uh, Uganda, a feel of Uganda as we wait for the mayor uh, to come in, uh, so that uh, people abroad who are attending can get the feel of uh, Uganda. Uh, it could be a traditional dance, it could be, let's have something as we, we are trying to, to get this done. Once again, welcome, and please let's enjoy and uh, participate yeah, in this webinar. I thank you and welcome you to Google.
Um, okay. Um, what we are going to do is, uh, as we are waiting for uh, the guest of honor to open, uh, officially open uh, and give his remarks, we are going to proceed with the first uh, presenter. Uh, and then, once the mayor is available, we can be able to allow him to open after the first uh, presentation. So, at this point, we are going to allow the first presenter to come, in, to come through and allow the presentation to, uh, to take place. Uh, the first presenter, please. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, our oh, Vice Chancellor, the Mayor, the entire municipality, His Worship, Fabrice Rulinda, our oh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Judy Rega, our University Secretary, Professor Kasekende, Kremper Registra, Professor John Peters Higa, Andrew Peters Higa, senior consultants, professors, the international and virtual community, lecturers and staff of Okoba University, students, ladies, and gentlemen. I'm here present to you our presenter for corporate responsibility, ethics, and accountability. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Wilson Moinda Mande is a renowned and established Ugandan academic. He received his PhD in leadership and ethics from the University of Aberdeen in UK. He holds a master's in sacred theology from Union in New York and a master's in arts from Virginia, USA, a bachelor's of divinity from ITEA, a diploma from Macquarie University, and an advanced certificate in education management from Register in the UK. He was the vice chancellor of Cuba University from 2017 to 2021. He was also a deputy vice chancellor of Okoba University from 2014 to 2016. From 2009 to 2013, he was the academic registrar of Okoba University. And prior to that, he was the head of the department in the School of Business Administration and uh, that is from 1999 to 2008. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Mande has undertaken consultancies in areas of education, management, monitoring and evaluation, training, 
human resources and policy development for many local and international organizations. He has held editorial roles for several journals and has served as a receiver, a reviewer for journals published both locally and internationally. He has numerous publications. Ladies and gentlemen, in the world of business we are in today, the most grounded person who could discuss with us the theme corporate responsibility, ethics, and accountability could be no any other person apart from Professor Wilson Mande. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the place of corporate social responsibility, ethics and accountability form a firm foundation for sustainability in the global business environment. On very many occasions, we have had people say that uh, the world is becoming a global village because of ICT. And uh, I want to assure you that without ethics, accountability, and corporate responsibility, then the world could, get, could change and become a global jungle. Ladies and gentlemen, join me and welcome Professor Wilson Mwinda Mande to share his views with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Samuel Kamsime, for your kind introduction. I would like to join those who have spoken before to thank the university and especially the School of Business Administration for organizing this webinar. I, I would like to say that I think it is timely for us to meet and discuss some of the issues that are critical to the state of business in Uganda, Africa, and the developing countries. I was given that particular theme, but I decided that it would be maybe appropriate for us to look at the topic which I've decided to address that is the ethical personal advantage meditating against the attainment of SDGs in Uganda during the global age. <clears throat> when we talk about the state of business, we are all aware that the public and private sectors must come together. And uh, when they come together, and they are successful, they contribute to the attainment of SDGs that were adopted by the UN in 2015, and they are supposed to be attained by 2030. The public sector puts up structures, laws, resources, services, which enable the business to operate smoothly, effectively, and profitably for the good of the citizens. However, in this country and many other developing countries, especially in the African continent, we find that the public sector is dogged by a problem of corruption, which negatively affects business and the attainment of SDGs. In spite of the fact that we have the ICT, which does facilitate both the private and the public sectors. 
as a way of introducing what I want to talk about is that the ethical personal advantage has influenced many people, even though this ethic would seem to be worthwhile because every person has an obligation to take care of oneself, the challenge is that this ethic often is often enjoyed at the expense of the communal or national advantage. In so doing, the attainment of the 17 sustainable goals remain a mirage. So, in the current paper, I contend that corruption is perpetuated by the ethic of personal advantage, or ETA. Secondly, that corruption militates against the attainment of the SDGs. So, that is the issue which I would like to focus on in my presentation. And of course, the presentation is structured that way. So that is, we like to look at the concept of personal advantage. I'm saying that the ethical personal advantage is a moral prioritization by the agent. The agent is the one who makes a decision, the one who carries out the action at the expense of others. This is an ethic theory that focuses on individual rights, especially when the agent is supposed to either personal benefit to others or to share with others even when they are not entitled to a share or not. Such an agent is often described as a screws or cheapskate. In Ugandan society, an agent who upholds the ethical personal advantage would be described as a mukodo or a miser. Furthermore, the ethical personal advantage breeds corruption, as those who anticipate exclusion have to buy you can use the word bribe, to be accepted. At group level, ethical personal advantage emerges as nepotism or sectarianism. At national level, it becomes uh, tribalism. At international level, it can be described as racism. This is so because decisions and actions are often ex executed in such a way that the others are disadvantaged. So the ethical personal advantage serves the interest of the individual while alienating the interests of the others or organizations or the community or even the whole nation. Sometimes a whole continent of Africa can be alienated and disadvantaged in many ways, either in public, that is in international organizations or in business arrangements. The ethical personal advantage is antithetical to Ubuntu. As the ethical personal advantage underlying the individualism at the expense of others, it runs contrary to the internal oneness inherent in African philosophy of existence, which you can call cosmology. In African cosmology, oneness is interconnectedness of all life. Every person lives and thrives because others also live. So a person who seeks to exist unilaterally while disadvantaging others becomes anti-people and therefore anti-commentarian. Ubuntu philosophy was well encapsulated in Mbiti's assertion that I am because you are, and since you are, therefore I am, in his African philosophy, the book published in 1970. This statement emphasizes the fact that communitarian good transcends the individual selfish interests.
that concludes the event. So the far away you are from one, and the less transparent you are. So uh, if the Ugandans are here, you can know where you stand. Then the CPI, or Corruption Perception Index, is out of 100. The, out of that percentage. So the higher you are towards 100, the better off you are. But if you are scoring very little, it means you are not anywhere near transparency. So if we have been scoring between 25 and 29, those of you teach you know, if somebody scored that mark, I don't know, I don't think that on the on attainment of transparency that one would have passed. So that is the way we are for, for consistently. We are not scoring very well on the perception index and the ranking. We are doing very, uh, should I say badly? But let me give some explanations here. The year, the years in column one, which you saw there, beginning with 2012, which is the year when Transparency International changed this method. In 2015, SDGs were adopted by the UN. In column two, the country with the least corruption is ranked to one. So the far away country is from one, the more corrupt it is. In column three, the higher percentage, the higher the percentage, the more transparent a country is. A country that scores less percentage is more corrupt. From that explanation, a country which scores between 25 and 29 has a high tendencies or instances of corruption. But 2015 was also a year when people again took to the streets for test corruption in very many areas of the world, including this People globally say it is time to tackle grand corruption. So that is the situation. <clears throat> now, does this personal 
ethical personal advantage cause corruption. One view advanced to explain the causes of corruption is poverty. This view is supported by some leaders. They contend that it was better to employ children of the rich families in order to reduce corruption. If you read Mugera and Raku 2021, they will tell you, you will see the full story. The clear implication of this statement is that people engage in corruption because they are poor. They want to get has been used as a tool to perpetuate corruption. If you read Adam and Ezekiel, they will tell you the stories of where ICT is also used for uh, corruption incidences. In view of the above debate, it is clear that ICT can be used either way. 
It is a tool like any tool. It is a sword. You can cut this way, you can cut the other way. It can be used by the corrupt and also by the honest. It also depends on the inclination of the agent or the agent has. That is the one who is acting. If is is inclined towards corruption, of course we use it for that. If he's honest, you also use it for that. So if the agents are more inclined towards the ethical personal advantage, they replace ICT to perpetuate corruption. In view of the above analysis, it can be inferred that corruption is caused by the agent upholding the ethical personal advantage. This ethics is selfishly materialistic. The more the agent possesses, the more the young to acquire more so that they are in advantageous states. Now here, I try to put down some areas to show where ICT has also been used to perpetuate corruption. In the education sector, there are change of marks and grades by students. Now what is the problem here? It is a forgery. And uh, ICT use misuse of data on computer systems. The ethical issues violated, we are saying virtue of honesty and the virtue of contentment, those are violated. And what are the effects and qualified people assigned roles for which they have no competence? Then we have banks and telecoms, their stories. For example, one of them is that they lost $3.2 million why? Through hacking and fraud. And uh, there was, what is the ICT issue? That there was security breach on the computer system. And therefore, what do we see here? The virtue of honesty is violated, and lots of money lost, and the cyber security is doubted. They, does cyber security really work? <laughs> Those are the questions which people are raising. Because banks, and telephones, these are businesses, big businesses. But if somebody can hack into and they end up losing money, then the question is what do we do now? Because we are losing money, yet we thought that with the ICT, things would be fine. Then companies and individual emails. Money fleeced from victims. Fraud. Computer aided fraud. People are using ICT to steal money from individuals, either on your mobile money or on your account or whatever. So people who do that, they have no virtue of contentment, they have no virtue of honesty. And victims lose loss of money, that's the effect. Of course, I'm not mentioning the stress and the confusion and what have you. Then the business sector, printing illegal documents. This is a forgery. These ones are also assisted by ICT because they can scan and reproduce uh, electronically some things and so on, the documents. So here again, honesty is not there. But I'm saying the effect is that important decisions are based on wrong documents. So uh, the digital age, good as it is, it must be handled with care. Then the next one, we are looking at social media. It used to spread nasty information about others. So what do we end up with? Malicious scandals. And what <clears throat> the ICT there, it is where platforms which are used. And the virtue of respect is lost. Psychological suffering is caused to the people concerned. Then cyber criminals access company systems. They steal money. These also use IT and the virtue of contentment, the virtue, I mean the ethic of utilitarianism and justice are lost. And therefore the effect is loss of money to the companies. Then students cheat using computers. What is the offense there? Plagiarism. We have something now we are referring to as e-cheating used to plagiarize academic work uh, and so on. The e-cheating, I know you are used to e-commerce, but there is also e-cheating. And therefore, virtues of honesty, assiduousness, utilitarianism, all those are lost. 
or violated. So the important decision is based on fake information. So this also comes out of this global age. Then ICT used to, to counterfeit products. What we are saying here, counterfeiting the offense, ICT is used to repackage or reseal products and so on. And they would look as if they are new, they would look as if they are original, when actually they are not. So there, the ethical values which are violated, we have honesty, contentment, and uh, deontology. So no value for money, expired products are consumed. So these are some of the challenges that we get. Then poor quality products sold as if they were good. So violation of uh, procurement processes. Critical data is concealed or changed. And uh, in the end, you end up paying more. Those of you who have been following up the news, you may see that there are so many things around procurement where goods sometimes cost more than what they are supposed to cost. And what happens is that people lose life if they consume things which are not proper, a property is lost, and the money is also lost. Now, <clears throat> for the last three slides, it can be noted that although ICT can help in curbing corruption, and that it can also, but it can also perpetuate corruption. That's why I say that it is a double-edged sword. So it can cut corruption, but it can also help corruption to thrive. All this indicates that it is not ICT which can curb or exacerbate corruption in the public and private sectors. Rather, it is the ethical personal advantage which leads people to engage in corruption. They just use ICT one way or the other. The ethical personal advantage is a conviction or personal philosophy of life which influences the way people think and behave. They tend to harbor materialistic values by hook or crook or fluke. So, now that is the way I'm looking at it that you have the ethical personal advantage, and the next box you have corruption. Now, ICT supports corruption. The benefits which come from that corruption activities are individual benefits. The broken lines to society and SGDs, those broken lines indicate that actually there is no benefit to society and there is no attainment of the SDGs. So that is the way you would look at this ethical personal advantage as perpetuating corruption. Now, <clears throat> again, we have talked about the SDGs and the ethical personal advantage. We are saying that it's so, it distorts, that is part from distorts the agenda, especially of developing nations. But this, as we have mentioned, uh, SDG number 17, underlying the principle of partnerships, and also the overall spirit being no one is left behind, when corruption is rife in a country, and across the continents, national advantage becomes, I mean, national development becomes an attainment. So when you are in your own country, like we are in Uganda, we have to think very critically, can we attain the 17 development goals by 2030, which means that we are left with about um, nine or 10 years from now. So one decade to go. In Africa, the corruption levels are so pathetic that some people end up even cheating themselves. In that way, the attainment of SDGs become more of a mirage and less of a reality. Now, what do we do? A solution, I'm talking about the ethic of, of communitarian subversion. As noted, the age, the, the digital age, whereby people in public and private sectors are using ICT, that in itself may not be a panacea to the problem of corruption, which is crippling all these sectors. The best way to deal with the corruption is to promote the ethical humanitarian subversion. This is necessary because corruption is not a technology issue. It is not a poverty issue. Rather, it is an ethical issue. 
Furthermore, it is not a personal issue as it involves many others who are often deprived of what they are supposed to what they are supposed to achieve. Okay. So we are saying that if we take on the communitarian servership, commun uh, it is possible to have the partnerships, not leaving anybody behind, development will come and the attainment of the SDGs by 2030 will be possible. Of course, communitarian servership or ethics has a number of uh, uh, issues or advantages or principles and uh, some of these, I would like to mention these principles, we have mutual responsibility, that one is promoted. If you have mutual responsibility, then corruption may not be one of them. Guidance, you seek guidance from experts, those who know not appointing anybody who is not an expert to guide you because that one is not also known. Participation. Everybody has to participate in serving the nation or the community. If there are disagreements, if there are conflicts, then mediation will be there. Trust. Trust was the basis of many roles of assignments in traditional society. And we are saying that community members were very careful not to betray the trust, or else they would do great calamities. But even now, when we are dealing with the people we teach, or when we talk about business, we say trust is still important. When you apply for a job, they invite you to an interview. The interview's role is simply to establish trust. Otherwise, the papers will have given them, the qualifications will have shown them, the experience will have shown it, and people will have written references about you, recommending that you are the right person, but they invite you for an interview. The purpose of interviewing you is to confirm or to establish trust that you are the person who can do the job. If they find that you can't do the job, the way you interact with them, then they may not give you the job, even though you had the the, the qualifications. Then integrity, everybody was expected to have integrity. And this meant that the people had to be dependent. The individual, the family, the community would be considered ethical if members had integrity. But this integrity does not only remain with individuals, but it also goes to businesses as well. There are people who trust some business, that that company even if you leave things there. That company, if you have a problem with the product, you can take it back. If you explain them, listen, and so on. So that integrity, sometimes people want to use the word customer care to explain what integrity is all about with a particular company and the clients. Then care. The principle is taught there by expecting every person to cultivate uh, a principle of care which means that everybody must be concerned about the other person. That is what's supposed to be in a community. If you have a business, you must have that care for the clients, for other businesses, for regulators. And regulators must have care also for the people they regulate. Then autonomy. Individuals are at liberty to choose the profession they prefer, to choose the friends, to choose property, to choose whatever they want. So <clears throat> it doesn't mean so that communitarians do, do not have the autonomy. No, autonomy is there, but it must be respected. Then unity also is another aspect. Now, how do we apply this to the business? Is that, uh, <clears throat> for example, when you look at Uganda, there are two levels of community. There is a natural community. Natural community is the one which uh, includes, of course, uh, tribes, clans, citizenship, nationality, and so on. Like we can talk about Ugandan community, the Bukunja community, whatever community it is. But we have also the operation-based communities. 
these are communities formed by professions where people uh, work, where people have different arrangements from other members of the natural community. That's why we can talk about the religious community, we can talk about the, the engineering community or the medical community or whatever. So, because what we are saying is that that is a community, they have their own ethos, they have their own values, they have their own etiquettes, they have their own professionalism, and so on. So, when we talk about communitarian, we are not only referring to the natural community, but there are also these operation-based communities. Or if you want, you can even call them professional-based communities. And therefore, those ones are equally important. In view of the above categorization, it could be right to argue that the natural community is the primary community, while the operation-based community is the secondary or the sub-community of the natural. So in spite of these differences, uh, we think that uh, Every community has members, it has values, and it, it controls the participating members. Now, if you are going to have corruption, maybe you cannot be members if one is not corrupt and another one is honest. If you have uh, corruption, then there are no values. If there are no, I mean if there is corruption, then there is no control of the participating members. For that reason, it would be better and easier to use the ethical communitarian subversion to deal with the issue of controlling corruption. This could be done in the following way. Use the infrastructure of the communities, like of course families, churches, schools, and so on, to inculcate the principle of communitarian subversion. In other words, you exist in order to serve. You exist in order to contribute to the community, not to destroy or not to flee from the community. So uh, slogans could be created to remind the people, and young people could be taught all these uh, principles. Now, I've not, because of the, 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 the technology again, we are in the digital age, uh, you would have also seen the, what, what, I, I, what I wanted to show here, that the ethical communitarian subversion leads to natural resources, and the natural resources are used for all citizens with the support of ICT, and then from there, when it is used like that, all people benefit equitably, and therefore the SDGs are attained. And when the SDGs are attained, then all of us can be happy that we have been able to develop and we shall know that both the public and the private sector where business is will have contributed equally to that attainment. And uh, I think after saying all those words, I would like to thank you for listening to me and uh, I wish you to, to follow my argument of uh, saying that uh, it is not poverty and it's not ICT which lead corruption and that ICT is so ICT for ICT cannot solve the problem of corruption. Why corruption? Because corruption affects both the public and the business sectors. That's why things are very expensive. That's why uh, business produces fake products. That's why people don't benefit, that's why people are complaining about the business sector. It's because of corruption. And how do you deal with the corruption? I'm saying let us go back to the basics of communitarian subversion as an ethic which you can inculcate in everybody so that uh, we all benefit. And if we all benefit, then we can attain the SDGs that we are yearning for in 2030. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so very much.
Professor Wilson Wilhelmande for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, I request that we give him a very big clap. That is, that was the ethic of personal advantage against the attainment of SDGs in Uganda during the digital age. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the discussant is uh, Dr. Charles Edaku, and uh, he shall be joining in later after the second presentation by Miss Nawato Diana. Ladies and gentlemen, our second presenter is Miss Nawato Diana. She is going to present logistics management in the digital age. What are the challenges Uganda is facing? Logistics management in the digital age. What are the challenges Uganda is facing? The discussion of the same topic is Dr. Sadati Lutaya. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Diana Nawato currently is a PhD candidate at Nkumba University. She is a lecturer in the Department of Management and Supply, Supply Chain Studies. She holds a bachelor's degree in business, procurement and supplies from Kampala International University, a master's of business administration specializing in human resource management of Kampala International University, a certificate in national trade services from Ireland, the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supplies at level five. She's a student at that particular level. And as I did mention earlier on, she is a PhD student at uh, Mpumba University. Ladies and gentlemen, join me. I welcome Madame Nawato, Diana. You have approximately 30 minutes to discuss for us. And thereafter, the question and answer session shall come in later. You're welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am humbled to be here. I'm happy. Um, I am serving a school that is um, bringing all this um, together so that we can be in position to learn more and um, probably recommend on what should be done for all the problems we are facing as a country and Africa at large. Um, I will be looking at logistics management and uh, for starters I'm going to look at uh, the definition of logistics. So um, with logistics it is the process of planning, implementing and controlling the efficient, effective flow and storage of goods and services and related information from point of origin to point of consumption for the purpose of conforming to customer requirements. Um, so I'm looking at the number of activities that are there. There are a lot of things that are there. There's planning, there's implementing, there's controlling, and um, there's making sure there's an effective flow and storage of goods and services. So we're looking at a point of origin, which is usually the manufacturing point, and uh, we're also looking at the final customer, or the final person who is um, consuming our product. So in here, within logistics, we are basically looking at movement of materials uh, within the organization. And the, the, uh, the different types of logistics activities here are three. So we are looking at movement of materials, uh, the raw materials that are coming in in the organization, basically. So the logistics activities here are basically uh, purchasing and then um, storage as to the warehouses, 
then we look at uh, uh, movement of materials, that is work in process or work in progress, where we're looking at movement of materials from where they were stored to the various production areas. So the activities here would be warehousing, handling, and then distribution within the warehouses. The last thing we are looking at movement of uh, finished goods to the consumer. And what exactly would we be looking at? So here we're looking at um, how we're going to do the packaging, the shipment, the distribution, and the various transport modes or distribution ways or distribution channels we're going to be um, focusing on to, to take our items to the consumers wherever they are, be it international or within the local spheres. So with logistics management, we're trying to look at um, how we're going to uh, collaborate the activities such as raw materials, procurement, production process, and distribution of finished uh, products. Then we're going to bring in the aspect of E. So the e-logistics here, uh, it is defined as the management of all the physical flows of an organization that sells goods on an online platform. So that's where I'm going to be, um, the discussion is based on these concepts. So um, I'll start with looking at the disruptions that are basically within the traditional logistics system. So before we move to E, we have our ways of working. And uh, to me, those are the traditional ways of how we, we, we've been working. Now, there's some of the, the, the introduction of the, the electronic means to logistics means there are some disruptions that are going to be somewhere along the way. Um, so some of the disruptions, one is that um, now firms will have to look at ways of how um, decisions are going to be made of how um, production is going to be made, manufacturing is going to be made. So we are looking at deciding the right mode of action. Right mode of action, uh, we are looking at our analog ways of trying to work or to do operations. And then all of a sudden, we are looking at a digital age that is coming in. So when a digital age comes in, it means we have to look for ways of how we're going to be operating, other ways of how we're going to be operating. Then we're also looking at new methods of production. New methods of production, how do we look at them? Uh, with the, we are looking at um, the ways we have been working. That means we will have to look at particular ways of possibly how we're going to add value to all the items that we're having because we're having an age that is coming in, an, a new era that is coming in. So we have to figure out other ways of how we need to uh, do the production. Probably we need to figure out ways of how to add more value, so that is looking through the value chain and figure out how a product can be more beneficial to the customer. Then we are looking at a growing customer base. Now, the more we are looking at uh, traditional ways of operation, we are also looking at a growing population. A growing population also comes up with people who are getting to buy more smartphones, who are getting to know about the technology out there. And then, um, so operation firms have to be in position to look at how best are we going to serve the growing customer base. Now, growing customer base would mean that we need to move away from this trend, the analog trend that we've been looking at, to try and, to, and, and, and do more so that we can serve the customers that are growing day by day in regards to the um, products that we are producing. Then we're looking at technology trends. Now technology trends, we are no longer, um, the economy is no longer static in one way. We are looking at different trends coming in. And then that means operations, uh, product uh, firms are supposed to be also steady to move with the trend. If the trend is looking at new technology coming in, then that means new products that are in line with the new technology coming in should also be produced. Then uh, lastly, we are looking at the growing attention that governments are paying to environmental concerns. Here we are basically looking at the aspect of sustainability. Um, there's need to focus more on the sustainability aspect in our operations, in the firm's operations. Sustainability basically has three pillars. So we're looking at the economic aspect. As you are trying to look for profit, 
then you also make sure that you do it efficiently and effectively. Um, then we are looking at uh, the social component, where socially we are looking at having uh, a lifestyle for the community and the employees that is favorable and, uh, and fair to them. And then we are also looking at making sure that the environment is not degraded. We look at um, less waste to the environment, we look at um, uh, treating of waste as far as um, pollution is concerned also, and all that we look at the environment trying to be uh, preserved for the future generations. In addition to that, you find that somewhere along the way, when we are looking at the digital world, um, there will be need for adjustments. And uh, what happens is that when we are looking at Africa and Uganda, you find that in Uganda and East Africa, logistics, botanics and inefficiencies are present at multiple stages within the supply chain. We are looking at loading, uh, then there's the aspect of delivery, when we're also looking at warehousing, then when we're looking at packaging, and lastly, uh, when we are also looking at waste management. So we're all finding lots and lots and lots of issues in such areas. And then the inadequate logistics contributes to high food losses in emerging markets. Uh, a continuing challenge in normal times, as well as um, times of crisis. So we're saying that due to logistics, inefficient logistics, we are having uh, a lot of bottlenecks when it comes to the supply chain, or we are looking at transportation, we are looking at warehousing, packaging, we are having issues there. As far as roads, we are having uh, an idea here that uh, there's so many ways that so many people are not in position to get their basic needs for instance food they're not in position to get food because the infrastructure is not accessible and that we look at when we're handling or when we are talking about uh, the logistics as far as uganda is concerned and other emerging markets The gist of uh, the conversation is here, mostly. So we are looking at um, logistics management challenges. First of all, I'll start with Africa, then I'll get to Uganda. So you find that uh, most of them are similar, though Uganda would have just some unique scenarios. We have an inadequate road network. This is the first one. And uh, this is the major one. The more we have a road network that is not working well, it is um, the, the connection to the various markets, the connection to the various consumer is not there entirely. Or in some places it is cut off, in others, in other places it is inadequate. Then you find that we are not going to be in position to reach every customer out there to serve them the way they deserve to be served. Um, then we have high traffic congestion. Now when it comes to traffic congestion, you find that the, the costs are rising up because you're using um, more time, cost in regards to the time that is wasted, cost in regards to um, the fuel that is being used. So at the end of the day, you find that we have a lot of costs that are being incurred as a result of trying to work within the logistics aspect. Um, then we have informal markets dominating most emerging markets. In formal markets, we are talking uh, like hawkers, street vendors. So you find that somehow it is hard. When we're talking about um, other firms that will be coming in to help us boost the economy, somehow it is hard because we don't have structured markets. When we don't have structured markets, it means that we, if we have firms that want to come in and develop us and help us develop, they'll have to establish their own structures. Um, Either they have to have their own distribution processes um, or channels established, or they have to uh, be in position to work 
especially in, 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 in making sure they establish their own uh, ways of how, it, how transport would be. Then we are looking at congestion around seaports. The more we have congestion, the more we have time that is being lost. The more we have clients that are missing out on delivery. So the, the more we have congestion, the more delivery time is not made. And then we, we usually, customers usually want orders that are fulfilled in time. Then we have competition for the limited warehousing space. We do not have that much of the warehouses to be in position to accommodate all that is um, that is in store. We are looking at raw materials, we are looking at working process, and we are also looking at finished uh, goods. So you find that even when we have the materials, some of the warehouses, some of them um, operating in a traditional way, where we, they are not planned very well, or they are not planned, planned rightly to accommodate all the stock that would materials that would ideally be accommodated there. And then operation, we have traditional uh, ways of operations within those warehouses. Then we have currency fluctuations. Um, usually these are impacting in regards to the production costs. Um, the economy, uh, most economies in emerging markets, uh, you find that they are having fluctuation of currencies. The more we have this, the more it means um, Cost of production are going to be slightly high. Then we have business process improvements. This is basically looking at trying to make sure that we improve our business processes as far as um, the trends are coming in. We need to look more at value addition. We need to look more at trying to, de to design for the environment, which sometimes is hard and complex because it comes with uh, having to have more, a little more capital, a little more infrastructure that can accommodate all that is needed as far as business process improvements are concerned. Then uh, sometimes in some countries we have restrictions on truck movements depending on the times. Now this would affect uh, delivery times and it would also affect our customers who will be waiting. So as far as order fulfillment and delivery times, um, the restrictions on truck movements would be um, an impediment. Then uh, we look at um, the logistics management challenges in Uganda. We have a lot of traffic congestion. Now, the traffic congestion um, in most areas and along the, uh, the key transport corridors, where we're looking at Kampala and Ginger Highways. Now, here you find that, like I've, 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 I've highlighted earlier, we're looking more of the costs that are being incurred. The cost of where these truck drivers are going to park, to stay, and uh, the cost of time, and cost of not fulfilling the orders of our customers in time. All those are costs we are going to, that are going to be incurred by farms. We have roadblocks and checkpoints um, that basically push up time and cost of logistics because you cannot be in position to schedule your time very well. You do not know what is going to happen along the way as you're moving. So this one's coming to kind of create a barrier um, as the, in the operations. Then we have inadequate infrastructure. We are looking at internet. We are looking at the available technology. We are looking at all the resources that we would want to help us. Sometimes we, do, we, we actually do not have enough of them. Uh, usually when it comes to the rainy season here, you find that internet is disrupted. You find that we have a lot of floodings. Some areas are entirely cut off. So that gets to be... Um, a very big impediment as far as operations are concerned, farms operations, especially transportation and distribution to the various areas. Then um, we have the high cost of logistics services. Uh, when we have high cost, when you have lots of traffic congestion, high cost of operation, you find that even at the end of the day, the logistics services are going to be um, looked at with a, a very high cost. So that means not so many farms would want to venture into, uh, especially the distribution of the f finished goods to the customer. Uh, we are looking at inadequate modern warehousing facilities. We do have not so many warehousing facilities, but even the ones we are having, 
we ha they are operating in a traditional way, traditional way. We have less mechanization, less automation, so there's need probably uh, to be in position to uh, work on that. And lastly, we're looking at uh, the, the lack of an agency within the government, um, which agency is responsible for the logistics. Now, this creates uncertainty when we're looking at, uh, this creates uncertainty when we're looking at, um, the legislations that will be responsible, uh, that, that, that are coming in. So just in case of any issues, especially when you're looking at international uh, shipments or distributions, um, what, are the, who, what are the departments that are responsible and what are the legislations um, that are in there just in case of a, a problem that is coming in. Uh, then um, the possible solutions. Now. Um, I'm recommending, I'm suggesting that the more we go in, uh, when we go in or when we do uh, digitization, you find that uh, we've been positioned to, to solve a lot of problems. To, uh, one, um, establish an integrated di digitized logistics network. An integrated digitized logistics network, um, we are looking at, um, we can share systems, especially when we're looking at um, uh, let's say with, with the telecommunication network, we can uh, companies can share masks and then be in position to reach the various um, regions. Um, so everyone out there can be in position to access the internet. When we're looking at softwares, we're looking at say materials management, buyers and suppliers can be in position to share some information which we can, where automation can take place. We, 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 we can be in position to look to use electronic data interchange to help us share information between the buyers, between the, bu the buyers and then the suppliers. Um, we can also look at improving the awareness levels of logistics services, trying to make sure that um, the masses out there get to know more about the logistics services um, that are out there. We can do this electronically through advertising uh, then we have trying to make sure that we select the right industries to work on. Um, selecting the right industries here would be those industries that are moving on with the trend um, to try and build us and build the farms that are there out there that are also trying to get with the trend. The more you look for the right partner, the right industry, then it means you're in position. This is where you were somehow weak as far as technology is concerned then you will be boosted with the other company that you're working with. Um, we're looking at building an e-logistics product portfolio. We try to build products, e-products, that would fit our customers out there. Um, the e-products can be distributed easily uh, in regards, so we get to do away with the order fulfillment issues and then uh, lead time issues. Then we can also be in position to share transport capacity by the different logistics firms. So different logistics firms can always work together and uh, move to be in position. Different logistics firms can always work together and then they share space as far as trucks are concerned. So they can be in position to save costs and time and money. We can also be looking at uh, distribution here. We've, uh, there are so many applications that are looking at safari share. When you're moving, you can share transport with some other person who is traveling in the same route where you're going to. Um, we're also looking at uh, improving awareness of logistics services, looking at more marketing that is um, of, as far as the logistics services are concerned. We can do electronic marketing and uh, this will help us to be in position to reach out the people out there and tell them about what, what is offered. Then uh, we are looking at the industries, the governments, and the academic world to work together. Um, how can that be? Uh, the government can always get propositions from um, the academia, for instance, and then from the government. They work together, uh, then come up with the module uh, proposal of how um, e-logistics can work very well. Like we are here, we're trying to propose, um, like I am trying to propose ways of how we can do better as far as logistics is concerned. So the government can always seek proposals um, from the various stakeholders we position 
in regards to how we can better our logistics. Now, how ready is Uganda as far as uh, e-logistics is concerned? Um, well, we can see the readiness in lots of areas. We are looking at a growing customer base. A growing customer base, basically we are looking at a population where people are using uh, smartphones. So the more of smartphones, they are Android phones. It means they can reach out to information on the global market. The more they can reach out to information, it means that's a platform for us to be in position to work with the electronic logistics. Then we're having rising social media platforms. Um, these ones we can, they, these can be used by the various firms as far as electronic marketing is concerned, as far as of, of the various products, they can also be used um, in position to sell. So we have Facebook, we have um, WhatsApp groups, where you find that people are usually selling online, uh, lots and lots of items. Then uh, we have physical assets, much with the virtual world. How can, can this be done? You find that we look at um, ways within which um, ways within which we can integrate uh, electronic the electronic uh, assets or electronic equipment within our uh, traditional industries. We can start step by step, and then we bring in let's say electronic procurement. We can also bring in the various. Um, uh, softwares and we integrate them within the physical world that we're working with and somehow along the way we move with the e-trend um, we're looking at private electronic innovations innovations where we're looking at the private sector bringing in innovation with regards to electronic logistics and how we can better that so these innovations and propositions can always be considered by the various firms and the countries and they later taken up for instance, uh, we, have, um, we have electronic villages here, or electronic innovations in Uganda, where they get to encourage people, um, entrepreneurs and startups as far as technology is concerned. Then we have the, in the agriculture sector, in the health sector, among others. Then we are looking at digitally enabled information services. We avail information. Information should be availed to the various people be it most especially on the websites. If we go to, so companies should have websites and those websites should have the information regards to what the companies provide. And this will help whoever is out there, the customers out there, to be in position to access that particular company, uh, even digitally, and get whatever service they want to get. Uh, we have shared logistics capabilities. Those ones can be done, we've seen them work. We have uh, Safari Share here. We have um, um, car, um, truck drivers. We have, uh, you know, transportation. Uh, we have farms that are usually sharing space as far as trucks are concerned. And then we have electronic distribution and transportation. So we've seen a lot of. We have self border coming in now. That is the readiness I'm talking about. We have uh, we, during the lockdown, we've been looking more at uh, deliveries done by. Um, we just get an app, then you get what you want. We get to Chikubo online, you get to buy what you want. You get to the markets, you buy what you want. You use a safe border and they deliver what you need. Then uh, we have the digital payment methods. This one is um, uh, we can use our cards and then we pay. We buy from wherever we are. The delivery will be done to you and uh, you'll pay using your credit card. And uh, that is how ready Uganda is for um, electronic logistics. Now, in conclusion, I, I say that a more efficient logistics sector would offer Uganda increased potential for economic diversification and growth. Businesses in Uganda requiring transport and logistics services are in every sector of the economy. Right from the producers of natural or raw materials to manufacturers of semi-finished or finished goods to the processors, we look at exporters and importers, looking at wholesalers and retailers. So it is, it is now that we get to be including um, the electronic means of operating in our logistics activities because it is going to help um, the farm to develop better, to satisfy its customers more, and then the country at large. So. Um,
that is all from me. Ladies and gentlemen, another clap for Madame Diana Nawatu. She has presented to us logistics management in the digital age. What are the challenges Uganda is facing? And uh, the discussant is Dr. Sadat, Sadat Rotaya. He will come in in that queue and a session. Thank you very much, Madam Nawato. Ladies and gentlemen, I did mention that Madam Nawato is a PhD candidate, so by the time she makes up three years, she will be a doctor, and uh, we are hopeful she will be presenting very many papers to us, and we shall be in position to manage our logistics, and uh, we shall get there. Ladies and gentlemen, in another development, I would love to request all of you to clap for Dean SBAIT, Dr. John Yamkama. Thank you for the initiative, and uh, we, are, we, are, we, we shall get going. Next time, we shall be wonderful. The theme is a state of business and management in the digital age. Outlook and prospect for Uganda and Africa. Uh, the third presenter is Assistant Professor Mary Nanyondo. She is going to present to us micro, small, and medium enterprises, COVID-19 aftermath. Are uh, you all said micro? small, medium enterprises, COVID-19 aftermath. Are you all set? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Associate Professor Mary Nanyondo Biaruhanga is an Associate Professor in Accounting at Daham University Business School in the UK. She earned her PhD from both Moth University, UK. She has a master's in accounting and finance and holds a first class accounting and finance degree. Prior to joining Durham, she worked at Nottingham Business School, Nottingham Trent University, and the University of East London, both in UK. Her teaching is multidisciplinary. It covers accounting, related modules delivered at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Her areas of research include small and medium enterprise finance, sustainability, environmental management practices, corporate governance, and corporate social responsibility, focusing on institutional frameworks in emerging and developing economies. She has published various articles in peer-reviewed journals available on her profile. She has received an Outstanding Excellence Award and its name is You Are Brilliant from Bournemouth University in 2015-2016. At the University of East London, Mary's modules were documented with the highest student satisfaction 2017 NSS scores. At Nottingham Business School, Nottingham Trade University, recent peer review observations indicate excellent teaching practice 2019. Internationally, at Macquarie University Business School, she received a principal appreciation letter for exceptional teaching practices that enhanced the student's experience. In terms of impact, 
and related to industry. Mary has a network of small and medium enterprises in Uganda and currently collaborating with Makara University, Business School, and Uganda Investment Authority to put together the small and medium enterprise entrepreneurship summit and eventually launching the small and medium enterprises business barometer and the links are there. Ladies and gentlemen, join me and we welcome Associate Professor Mary Nanyondo Yaruhanga and I'm told she will be joining us in five minutes. She is in the UK. We shall give her a clap as she comes in. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we wait for anyone to, to join in, I wish there was uh, a talk I Hello, can I double check that everyone is hearing me? Ladies and gentlemen, Madam. Hello, um, can I double check I'm, I'm loud and clear? Yes, uh, uh, Associate Professor Mary, yes you are. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am really thrilled with this opportunity uh, to be part of this um, life-changing um, conference, if you like, looking at the state of business and management in the digital age, looking at having an outlook and prospects of Uganda and Africa. <laughs> So um, as I've been uh, introduced, uh, that's all about me and I prefer just to be called Mary. <laughs> yes, so um, I work with Durham Uni, so I'm really pleased and I've got um, running research and I'm quite passionate about uh, small, medium enterprises, but um, I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, micro, small, medium enterprises, uh, the COVID-19 aftermaths and, and to find out if you're all set. Are ready um, going forward uh, with uh, uh, making your businesses uh, pan back to normal, if you like. So that's what I'm going to be exploring, ladies and gentlemen. And yes, so I'll just go straight into it, if you'll, if you'll allow me. So um, in terms of our, our um, presentation layout today, I'm going to be looking at the background uh, of what Entebbe is known for. And yes, um, you know, most of us will be knowing what Entebbe is known for. So I'll be just exploring facts and things you already know and sort of bringing them in a broader picture uh, to be able to uh, tap into entrepreneurship and business opportunities that may, may, that may be presented by um, Entebbe municipality. And if I'm ever so fast, you can always um, send a quick chat and say, oh, Mary, you're too fast or something like that. Again, if I'm not uh, loud and clear, I'm just going to be looking at the chat if there's something coming up for me. Um, nothing coming up. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'll be just looking at the chat, uh, careful not to be so fast uh, so that everybody can follow the presentation, ladies and gentlemen. So after I talk about the background of Entebbe or the facts that Entebbe is known for, I'm going to be exploring the entrepreneurship and then looking at a bit of statistics. I've not gone into detail with the uh, statistics and uh, bearing in mind uh, who will be attending. So I do, I do want to make it complicated. I just wanted something that all of us can follow um, depending on our, you know, our levels where we are at. So it's just simple statistics for us to look at, uh, you know, where SMEs are at when it comes to um, uh, numbers, composition, et cetera. Then I'll look at the COVID-19 challenges first by micro small enterprises. I mean, there are quite enormous, enormous, numerous challenges, but I'm gonna try and make it uh, sort of contextualize it to be, um, to be something that is applicable to our Ugandan setting. 
and then way forward and then I'll be waiting for uh, questions and uh, hopefully answers if I can provide them yes Right, so I'm originally from Entebbe, a bit of background about me. I'm originally from Entebbe, born and bred in Entebbe. I went to Entebbe SS uh, secondary school. So um, I, I quite know a, a bit more about Entebbe. It's a, a city that I love and I love to associate myself with Entebbe. And I really take this opportunity so important and precious that you actually consider me to make a presentation uh, to be able to support um, small medium enterprises in a way that I can do it. Right, so and Tebe is naturally beautiful. It's a beautiful town, you know, part of Okiso district and it's 40 kilometers away from Kampala city. So it's surrounded by Lake Victoria, which we already know it's got the beautiful green vegetation. It's got great landscapes. It gives us a cool temperature <laughs> and it's actually a natural charm. All that makes it really beautiful. So, you know, it's it's small in size, but it's, it's a key town in Uganda with important historical roles as we'll later on explore having the ad administrative capital. It had the ad admin capital of Uganda before, before I was born. <laughs> and obviously the role of um, being an admi administrative capital has moved to Kampala, you know, after independence. And it's such a well-organized and um, city and it's built with uh, great attractions. I'm using city because I know that Entebbe is going to um, get a city status sooner or later. So I'm moving away from town, if you like, and branding it a city. <laughs> yes. Um, so those are the beautiful facts uh, about Entebbe. It's got a population of about 79, 700, but these statistics for 2011. So things could have changed by now. And uh, it's you know located on the peninsula of Lake Victoria. Peninsula so beautiful. And I put this beautiful picture here and you know, show uh, the peninsula that Entebbe is located. And it's go, um, it sits really, um, it's an island. People like calling Entebbe um, an island, if you like. So there's a bit, bit of square meters, uh, kilometers, out of which uh, you know, 20 kilometers is water. So we're really privileged uh, to have um, water and for Entebbe to sit at uh, the peninsula. Right, so um, it's got the only international airport in Uganda, you know, so it's, we're really proud uh, being, you know, in Entebbe because people travel miles far away to come to Entebbe, which has the more, you know, one international airport and it's the head, it provides the headquarters of, uh, you know, Uganda Civil Aviation Authority, which is a government agency responsible for licensing, monitoring and providing regulation for, um, you know, civil aviation matters. So it's, it's it, you know, its home is in Entebbe and obviously the Ministry of Works and Transport, and this also has this ground handling, you know, of, um, of goods and services, the NHAS, the DAS, all of those are in Entebbe. And then also Entebbe hosts the official state house, isn't that beautiful? So, and one of the UN largest uh, logistics base in the world is in Entebbe, and pretty much uh, essential government offices are in Entebbe. So ladies and gentlemen, you're in a beautiful town or city, if you like. So now that you're in a beautiful city, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, entrepreneurship uh, that we need to embrace, especially when we are in Entebbe town. We can't just proud ourselves coming from a uh, you know, beautiful city like that, and then you know, uh, not taking advantage of all the beautiful um, you know, uh, items of facts that Entebbe is coming up with. So entrepreneurship, um, ladies and gentlemen, takes many stances. For example, I've got nine of them here, but it could be more. <laughs> so we have the micro, small, medium enterprises. We've got the large companies, which are just few in Uganda. We've got scalable startups. We've got uh, social enterprises, um, innovative enterprises. We have hustlers. We have hustlers, uh, the market vendors. Uh, we have uh, the, the imitators or the followers, the people that just you know sell products. We have retail retailers, we have a research industry, and we have um, people in the bio market. So entrepreneurship is quite broad, and it takes very many different stances. So depending on what you want to tap in, there's um, opportunity for everybody. And it is, you know, somebody tells, say to me that the sky is the limit. But recently, Jeff Bezos has um, discovered the sky is not even the limit at all. So entrepreneurship in Entebbe then. So in Entebbe, it takes majority of businesses as micro 
and small and just a few handful of major main surprises. So uh, if I want to bring it into perspective for anybody who doesn't have a clue of what uh, micro enterprises are, I know you know colleagues could have uh, explored uh, what a micro, a small, medium could be, but I'll still just, just literally just run over it really. So a micro enterprise employs up to four people, mostly one with an annual or sales or revenue turnover to assets exceeding 10 million. And then the small five to and 49 people, and then a medium enterprise, more than 50 people. So if I look at, um, you know, in terms of employment, because there are many uh, parameters that we can use to measure uh, or to look at um, enterprises. But if I look, take the, the proxy, for example, of number of employees, it sort of resonates to most of us because you can easily literally see that uh, this is just a you know, micro enterprise of only just got one person or two or four, maximum of four. And then you know that it's really a small firm. So most of our businesses or enterprises in, in Tebe are quite micro and therefore it's got the challenge that will later on look at that uh, micro enterprises have got to uh, deal with. Right, so uh, I have a composition of business ownerships, um, you know, in, well, broadly seen in Uganda. Um, so, uh, you know, having a broader picture of our, um, business ownerships in Uganda. Most of them, 93.8% are small proprietors. And then we have partnerships that have only 2.4%. And then we have limited, private limited companies, just 2.4%. And then NGOs, just 0.2%. And then others, <laughs> which are 1.2%. Others that are not named by the, you know, Uganda Bureau of Statistics, those are not registered, you know. So the statistics that was able to call that has registered um, enterprises. So you can realize that most enterprises are sole proprietors. And I've known Kimba Uni, uh, along Kimba Uni, uh, pretty well, uh, Baita area has got most <laughs> sole proprietors with uh, you know, businesses that are booming, but they're owned by individuals. So looking at ownership, uh, going forward to the edge of these uh, small enterprises, medium, you know, small, medium enterprises, you know, um, most of them, they just start and fall. But obviously, looking at the, you know, looking at the trend of growth, sustainability and um, being able to stay around for a good amount of time. If they start and fall, then that means we're not doing actually very well when it comes to sustainability over small and medium enterprises. So you realize from this data that um, majority of our SMEs, 28.3%, have only just started. They are quite fresh and they are quite new without enormous experience, without different shocks um, in businesses. If one wants to have a chat of, there's a big story at a Baita Ravidi for a lady that has been living there for ages. If, you know, having a chat with her, how she has been able to maintain her business for this long, uh, would be able to, um, you know, later on when I come home uh, in the National Entrepreneurship Summit, which we are putting together, I'll be able to have a chat, um, a real life uh, chat with such ladies that have, uh, and, and men <laughs> that have, um, you know, seen their businesses stay for longer, um, for us to look at them as icons when it comes to um, city developments. So, so having explored uh, the composition of SMEs, we look at the COVID-19 challenges faced by small med medium enterprises. Right, so we have the global challenges, global challenges which could be, um, you know, which face every business. We have the startup stage, Cross stage expansion maturity. In between starting and maturity, we have the survival strategies. All businesses do not start to fail, but businesses start so that they can grow, expand, and mature. So we're going to be exploring, uh, you know, survival strategy. I had a um, one webinar at some point with the Interior Business Summit, something like that, where I explored the, the survival strategies. And after the webinar, I had a few entrepreneurs coming forward to ask me how they can have survival strategies and. What stands out with the entrepreneurs in Uganda is we haven't got a backup for a backup plan. <laughs> a backup for a backup plan. What happens next when COVID-19 has hit? 
for example, a store that has been trading, um, you know, face to face, how quickly can we advance to trade online? Have we got the risk management um, portfolio to help businesses survive uh, such tragic times? So those are, it's a big debate when it comes to uh, survival uh, strategies. So looking at the global challenges, um, which are obviously competition, technology, we're quite, in Uganda, we're quite slow on technology. And it's not only just us, but it's something to do with all developing countries that we've been quite slow when it comes to advancement of technology, moving straight through to online rather than you know, getting stuck <laughs> with the pandemic. So I'll leave the global challenges and zero down to the local challenges. For example, financing, financing. Um, well, pretty much most researchers in entrepreneurship know that financing is a big deal. But uh, the research I've carried out with financing, I realize it's, not, it's quite overrated in the sense that um, entrepreneurs actually, some of them just choose to have um, what we call um, uh, you know, um, they, 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 they don't want to seek for financing, if you like. They, they exclude themselves, you know, voluntary exclusion when it comes to accessing finance. And the other thing is that, um, I mean, businesses, or if I say, if I look at it from the supply side, uh, financials are happy to lend out money. They're happy to give money. However, uh, entrepreneurs do not know how to tap into the resources. And sometimes they, you know, something that is popular is bank loans. I'm going to go for a loan. I'm going to go for a loan. But then the loan is not everything that there is that um, banks offer. They've got loads of things that they can offer. Um, even quick, you know, emergence, you know, if you like uh, overdrafts, though I wouldn't recommend uh, entrepreneurs to go for overdrafts because of the huge overdraft interest and the pressure that overdrafts bring. So they, they needs to be a, a long term uh, sort of plan for entrepreneurs to get financing. I'll let everyone go into that because that's quite my area of expertise. So the local challenges, talking about finance, low productivity, access to markets. Um, in the National Entrepreneurship Summit, I'm looking at having a, a fair trade, fair trade Africa come on board to help our entrepreneurs, especially in the agribusiness, which we do well. Uganda is quite gifted and especially, um, you know, the airport city, we're close to the airport itself. So why don't we have an agro hub where we have, um, you know, people in agro, uh, uh, agro businesses uh, have their uh, products together in an, an agro hub and then we can have fair trade uh, look at all the strategies that we need to get their uh, organic products um, to Europe or markets abroad so it's something that I'm looking at when it comes to the National Entrepreneurship Summit which will which will come up sooner than later. Then we have managerial capabilities. You realize that um, most of these small medium enterprises do not actually take managerial capabilities, um, you know, in, into something as something very important. Let's run corporate governance, which is even big. I wouldn't, you know, expect a small, well, a micro enterprise to have a, a, you know, corporate governance framework in place. But if you've got some bit of managerial capabilities, who says what, you know, who's who has the final say in this situation, then it could really help to reduce the local challenges. Then we have corruption. Corruption is a big deal. Even with the uh, small enterprises, you realize that we would go very far if we didn't have the component of corruption. But corruption is so rooted in our you know, entrepreneurship uh, stance, if you like, to the extent that it sort of limits, and we limit ourselves. If at all we make our businesses free of corruption, then um, you know, we can go to even greater heights. Then we have technology, which I wouldn't delve into because even big firms, big firms, the government itself, people struggle with tech, technology, if you like. So why would I, I would even expect more challenges when it comes to micro, small, medium enterprises. Right, so we move on to the requirements of SMEs. So I, I talked about access to finance, where we need to have synergy, creating that relationship, that cohesion between uh, the supply and demand. If I've got any financials here on the platform, I would be keen on exploring uh, how to create synergy uh, with the, um, the entrepreneurs, because what's the point of having finance um, in your deals when businesses are collapsing, when they can't tap into it? What can we do to make sure that entrepreneurs know what actually it takes for them to tap into um, the finance that you've got? 
And then we have our sort of infrastructure where we need to, you know, gazette a space for uh, an agro hub in Entebbe. It takes it takes sort of a, a joint effort for, for us to be able to establish an agro hub where um, entrepreneurs across, we've got people that do lots of agriculture across the lake. <laughs> I haven't been across the lake, but I know that most of our, our places in Entebbe get their agro products across the lake. So if you can have an agro hub where we can, you know, have a all firms like all entrepreneurs farmers if you like they're not even they're not even like keen on the words like entrepreneurs they, they know themselves as farmers where farmers can come and pop their items to buy at um, a decent price and then partner with uh, a fair trade africa to be able to uh, um, ship those uh, lovely organic products to the uk or even abroad so we need to have our transport networks with our farmers from across the lake and you know, have a privilege on the ferry, for example, or that one takes uh, in terms of municipality, if the mayor, um, I know that there's been change in leadership with the mayoral position, but <clears throat> it's something that I had started with the former mayor, so which we can take forward to make sure that uh, you know, entrepreneurs have a privilege on the ferry, for example, if they're bringing their um, agro products to markets. Then in terms of access to markets, I've got Fair Trade Africa, where I'm in close contact. Then we have our sort of our trainings that we wanted to put forward because at some point I wanted to partner with Nkimbe Yini to get the National Entrepreneurship Summit sorted so that we can have the managerial capabilities. Why not the uni stepping forward to train these entrepreneurs? You know, it's, we have all the knowledge, we have all the experience, we have all the expertise at the university. Why don't we step forward and how take the experience, you know, to the people so that we can have, uh, we can be present. We need to be present in the lives of uh, businesses especially if we you know pride ourselves in being a business school we, we don't want to see businesses collapse in you know in our site we want to help them and that what well, we can do that if at all we are keen as the university to make sure that we we bring life we breathe life into these businesses that are um, collapsing Right, say so the aftermath, survival strategies, <laughs> you know, expanding capabilities. Someone would be asking Mary, how do I expand capabilities? My capital is gone. I can't even, I can't even procure anymore. I'm literally down. So how do I expand my capabilities? Right. Say so there's what we call building on strength, building on strength. Have you exhausted, for example, who your customers were in the start? Where where your customers were in the start? Where do they go now? Now that you're down, I tell you what. Here in the UK, it is what we 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 capitalize on building on strength. We help businesses come back to them, like panning back to life, especially when they've fallen. So it is what we if I don't want to go borrow. In, in you know in the bank, for example, I'm not keen on interest. For example, I can capitalize on my customers have a meeting with my customers, explain to them what happened to me and explain to them how I can make them part of my business. You know, so in that case, I'm expanding my capabilities. And if you want to chat more about that, you can always, you know, let me know how we can do it. We have crowd financing platforms, uh, you know, a business engines that are happy to boost businesses that have sort of uh, hit the dead end and all that is an expansion of capabilities. We've got innovations, for example, online trading. And um, I had a, a conversation with a, an entrepreneur in um, in Chitoro area, and you know, he, he's been such a huge hardware and was couldn't you know trade face to face. So we resorted to online trading, you know, having a, a simple little app where customers can order online, and then you need to be diligent, diligent, and deliver services or products as they've been ordered not something fake you know so if you exit corruption out of your business then it's going to be one of the hugest steps for success of your business and then having to be part of an international supply chain now international supply supply chain is quite overrated for a small or micro business itself instead of having an international supply chain have a local supply chain 
have linkages, you know, through business to business, you realize that most businesses are like, oh, this is my business, these are my customers. You start envying, you know, each other. There's no point in envy at all. Why don't you build on strength, have linkages through businesses? If, you know, if a product has run out on store A, you need to have that network, you know, that, oh, it's available at store B, or it's available at store C, or someone is going to compile. Instead of having one, you know, five vehicles going to Kampala to procure. Why not have two maybe or one? So, oh, I'm going to Kampala, what would you like? You know, help each other and reduce costs. Then looking at skills development through collaborations in Kimber Uni, I you know, here in the UK again, um, universities are sort of the fountain of knowledge. If businesses are failing, for example, they'll run to universities and we have a, you know, colleagues that are willing, they, we do it actually on a voluntary basis. For example, I'm involved with a Durham County Business uh, Council where I give surgery, like I, I have a platform where a entrepreneurs can ask me questions because we we've researched we have researched ideas and research has moved more to impact you know what's the what's the impact your research is causing it doesn't help us much to have publications in writer journals foster journals but when our research is not actually practical so i would appeal to uni the business school for example to take the lead in terms of uh, skills and um, development in entebbe uh, uh, municipality Right, so for starters, how do you find business ideas? I'll tell you a story. When I was uh, doing my undergrad, uh, I was at Uganda Christian University. So I, I realized that students all the time, they need something, we used to call it escort for cups of teas. So in my hostel, I realized that students all the time, they go to the canteen, canteen to buy maybe bread or um, a donut or a chapati, something like that. And I would actually go and buy as well. And we used to be so crowded in a place in the morning. So it's like, why did I tap into this? So I tell you what, I started making pancakes, you know? <laughs> I started making pancakes and chapatis in my hostel, in my room. So I realized every morning, instead of students going to the canteen to crowd there, they'll come for my fresh chapati and fresh pancake. So I made a lot of money. <laughs> I made a lot of money, um, you know, selling pancakes and chapatis. So I found a business opportunity in my area, in my community. Now, um, somebody who is online here, and you're a student in a hostel, you know, something you can do. It didn't stop me from being married and it didn't stop me from going to any greater height, but it, it was a, an opportunity that I discovered and I made an enormous lots of money, which I used to, you know, pay tuition for my siblings because, you know, they needed it and I never lacked anything. And I was independent at university, which most of you need to look at how you become independent as a student. Right, you know, drawing from your personal personal experience, and then I did internship. You know, I did my internship in a milling plant in a milling company. It was called Eastern Grain Millers. For those who have been in Ontario for quite some time, you could be knowing Eastern Grain Millers. Um, it's behind uh, green fields. That's where it was. So I did internship there as a as a market air. I was looking looking for markets for um, the product was called Mama's Choice. If you tested Mama's Choice, you can let me know in the tag in the chat. So drawing from personal experience, when I trained as an intern, uh, the first thing I did when I immediately like, graduated from Uganda Christian University, the first class, I was given a job immediately to be a lecturer. So the first monies I got, I went into investment in a milling plant. And I had a milling, a milling business in, in, in Tebe Baita. That's where my business was. So I immediately borrowed from personal experience as an intern, and I went straight away to start up my own business. Okay. So most of you, if you're students here, or if you're still looking for a job and you did some internship, you why not tap into your personal experience, you know, to start you off, something that you can do. Then look for ideas to get other people involved, you know. Um, there's, there's what we call um, Uganda London Project that is uh, running right now. 
And it is only um, a student that started it and involved many Africans, especially for, from Uganda, how they got into my email, which and it's, it's in the public domain. I'm accessible in the public domain. So God got sent me a business plan. I'm like, oh, wow, this is quite good. I'm happy to tap into this. So getting the idea and involve, involving people. So at the National Entrepreneurship Summit, we're gonna be incubating ideas. We're gonna be um, asking uh, people to bring in their business ideas, and then we're gonna incubate them. We're gonna have a meeting with such uh, startup entrepreneurs and see how we can finance these uh, businesses to get off the ground and be able to start. So we may not be doing so much in the start, but we'll definitely start with just a few that we can look after to make sure that such businesses can start, can grow, and then can be able to mature. And then you need to get out of your way to ask others how they can help, you know, get out of your way, have a survey um, have a, a, I know of a passionate young man who, um, you know, went straight um, into the city center and started saying, you know, asking people to partner with them. You know, it's that kind of crazy social entrepreneurship where you have your business idea and asking people to listen to you. Some people go to, you know, places of worship, churches or whatever. And, you know, uh, some people go to universities and they ask for platforms. So it's getting out of your way to ask others and then give back through meaningful, um, you know, ideas to be able to see, you know, promote other people's welfare. When you're promoting other people's welfare, then you're promoting yourself. For example, if you have a cafeteria, you, you have hygienic food, you know, you're promoting people's welfare and in the end you're meeting your own needs. So you stop being like, we don't want to be self-centered on things, but we want to promote other people's well-being and welfare and in the end meet our own needs. Um, you know, business ideas or goals. Right, so financials on here, um, you can realize that um, entrepreneurs are not aware of the business finance that you offer, which is really, um, you know, it's not, it's not a good space to be in. So in terms of, you know, overdrafts, you can realize that, you know, finance, you know, businesses are only aware up to the rate of 53% that businesses offer, you know, banks offer overdrafts. Most entrepreneurs just know that, uh, you know, banks only offer loans, just 68.7%. We have invoice discounting, which is also available with banks, but only 40% know about that. Leasing or higher purchase, all these are forms of finance. You know, you can get a um, machine on higher purchase or leasing, only 46% of entrepreneurs. And this is in the whole of Uganda. <laughs> And then we have what we call credit cards or credit lines, which are not efficient in Uganda because of uh, you know, the theft, the corruption, like the bank cannot really trust uh, startups, for example. We have debt securities, we have uh, subordinate loans, participation loans, uh, all even financing instruments. So we have even insurance as well, but insurance has not done very well in Uganda because um, you know, randomly people say that even if you insure and you get you need a claim, insurance companies will not even, you know, honor your claim, for example, they find a way of getting out of it. So if you don't want to tap into the formal debts, we have alternative debt, for example, debts from uh, people that are happy to finance projects. We have trade credit, trade credit, get goods and credit and pay later. Again, you need to build a good relationship with the supply chain. Then we have um, crowd financing. We have crowd financing platforms where you have a um, you know, business idea. I've, I've quite looked after a few crowd financing platforms and I'm happy to help if anybody has a, a sound business idea and they want to get finance um, you know, through crowd funding. We have peer-to-peer -peer finance buddies, you know, buddying up together and financing each other. Again, it also, it's an element of trust that has to come in. Circles, you already know what circles are. <laughs> and then friends and family are happy to give you finance. You know, if you've got friends and family, I haven't borrowed from friends and family, but I've got friends, other friends and family that have come to borrow money from me. And I'm happy to, you know, borrow that money if it's lying on the account. Why not um, invest in, help to invest in the business? And I've been lucky that my money has been returned. <laughs> yes. Uh, so those are some of the finances that you can be able to tap into. 
Right, so, you know, the rate of access then, access to finance is quite low at the moment, and I'm looking at dates. So we have, um, you know, the highest as being 60.87%, um, and that is in, you know, overdrafts, and you have 56, that is 0.9%, nearly, you know, 57, if you like, in loans, and then we have 42.86 in, you know, leasing and higher purchase, but this is in entirely in, in Uganda, you know, so it could, Guess is that it's quite different when it comes, uh, you know, to Entebbe municipality, especially, especially if you want to borrow, um, you know, from, uh, uh, you know, um, the firms. Like I know that Centenary Bank is really good with advancing loans, and the interest is not really it's 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 high considering if I can compare it to the UK where it's ten percent, uh, you know, it's twenty five percent or even more. So, um, you know, it's quite expensive to get finance. So, which is why. I would highly recommend trade credit as being a good uh, form of finance, especially for starters. But again, the supply chain would not trust a startup uh, person to give them um, trade credit. So you have to build that sort of a, um, relationship, which is best on trust, that if you're selling the items that are given to you in credit, then you're able to pay the money back. And also uh, circles have been quite you know, instrumental in bailing out businesses. And then there are these horrible, um, you know, uh, they call them uh, money lenders. They're quite horrible because they keep on taking people's assets and amassing wealth in ways that are not really uh, ethical. So I've not put, um, you know, money lenders on here. Right, so time to harmonize the supply and um, demand functions, <clears throat> or if I say supply, I mean the uh, banks, or I'm going to say banks because this is what resonates to most of us, and then the demand, I mean entrepreneurs. Right, so um, lending rate is one of, uh, it's got, a, you know, a, a mean of, uh, well, the mean is out of five, so, you know, effective, effective lending rate. Um, when it comes to um, the lending rate, interest rate is quite high. So entrepreneurs um, pointed it out in the survey that I conducted. That it's one of the things that puts them off uh, finance. And it also pointed out uh, the, the content of collateral, CLT is collateral. Uh, banks or financials want high collateral. I don't even blame the banks because that's the way to mitigate the risk. It's really risky to deal with their uh, micro, small, medium enterprises. So they need the collateral to be able to, uh, you know, tap into, be able to recover their monies. <laughs> and then um, we have our uh, transparency as one over, you know, uh, you know, the very a key aspect that financials are saying businesses are non-transparent, especially if you don't have uh, published financial statements. It's not mandatory if you're a private firm to publish your financial statements. So there's a lot swept under the carpet, if you like, and financials are not really keen to, to lend to entrepreneurs that are non-transparent. And then FSZ, which is farm size, is also one of the aspects that financials are looking at if to, to be able to borrow your money. So if you're just one man, one man's business, how can they even trust you to give you the money? So if you're just one man's business and you have to tap into other forms of finance, for example, trade credit is a good way if you're a one man's business. And then there's sort of inconsistencies when it comes to what actually determines the, the access to finance because entrepreneurs on the other hand, they think that it's, it's really the, the rate that puts them off because it has a mean of 3.75 out of five, it's quite higher. And yet, um, you know, financiers, they, only, they think that collateral is on the higher end and obviously transparency also comes in because entrepreneurs know themselves that they're not transparent enough to provide enough information for um, uh, uh, banks, for example, if you like, to be able to assess their uh, credit worthness. Right, so supply side, create a synergy with entrepreneurs, you know. If an entrepreneur comes to ask money from you before you kick out uh, their, their, their application form, put it, you can put it on the side if you like, and then do your own background check. Give it about six months, you know, monitor this business, how it's been performing, uh, partner with this entrepreneur to make sure that you able, you're able to help them, support them, not just to, you know, throw the application on the side. And it's such a shame that even applications have corruption in embedded into them where someone has to you know tip their, their, 
the, the loan officer to give them money. I mean, why, why would that thing happen? Someone is already desperate for money and you want them to tip you to give you money. So in, bankers and financials need to be keen on the people they put on the help desks so that they don't actually put off our entrepreneurs. Um, in the National Entrepreneurship Summit, we're going to have financials on board and we're going to be able to explore more strategies on how financials can create um, synergy. So what is the long-term strategic plan for Intervis City? Networking, you know, I normally call it building on strength. Taking care of your own family is pretty good, but taking care of your neighbor's family is even better. And taking care of all the families in your neighborhood is the best thing. So build on strength, support each other, and then we'll all get there in the end. So SMEs need to partner with farms. We have the Uganda Investment Authority, which is really handy. The, the doors of UIA are open to every entrepreneur that wants support, advice, registration. Don't just go behind doors and register your business. UIA, Uganda Investment Authority, has got a one-stop center where you can register your business you know, without any corruption, without anybody taking your money. You register your business, become legitimate, open a bank account uh, in your in the business name so that you can be trusted and have financial um you know uh, financial transactions all recorded even if you don't have a computer you can record these things manually you know your revenues your purchases your revenues your expenses so that when the bank comes to look at your paperwork they have all the information they need for them to be able to to have that um to create that robust conducive business environment by financing your business as much as they can. So we have to enhance farmers looking at the agriculture sector, which has about 82% of the workforce, for example. So um, it, it could be more now. So, you know, Nkumba Uni has a role to play in this to become the think tank. <laughs> you know, Nkumba Uni becoming the think tank. Because as I said earlier on, that Yun is here, are consulted on literally uh, matters that are happening in the world. Because we do the research, so we should be able to help. Because it doesn't matter hmm, how many how many scriptures one has memorized. It doesn't matter how many academic publications you've studied, and it doesn't matter how many pilgrimages you've visited. But what matters is how wise and you know conscious enough you are to bring your understanding in the service of the people around you. So that is a wise saying of NASCAR. You know, it doesn't matter how much we've read, but if the unit is not felt in the life of people, then, you know, we're not really doing our best. So we need to be the think tank that is gonna help entrepreneurs run for solutions, especially if they're in trouble to make sure that we rescue their businesses from uh, collapsing. So we have, uh, you know, business to business linkages, improving the fish farming. I have visited um, uh, what, the fishermen um, on the, on the island of her, um, when that side of Kasanyi. Yes, those people really have their money, but the thing is, they they lack the knowledge of how to use and save their money. So we could have a fisherman workshop, you know, staged on landing site by Nkumba Uni, and then talk the language the fishermen understand you know if you can speak your your local language for example speak to them uh, financial literacy in their local language encourage them to open accounts encourage them to bank their money encourage them in any way possible to reinvest their money because we you realize that you know landing sites are hubs of of drinking and you know whatever life that goes on on land, landing site is quite horrendous you know but it's because we haven't played our part to be able to go to these uh, fish farmers, fish the mongers, and be able to to tap into the fishing resources and be able to help them make uh, best use of their money. I know greenfields very well, and obviously, if we help um, these uh, fishermen, uh, we can even help them to lens on how to supply green fields, for example, there's enormous demand of fish, you know, but all that happens when there's business to business linkages. 
Right, I talked about the parking hub, agribusiness. You know, this picture is going to be the picture on the left. Is you know the markets. It's what it's what I left in the markets, but happening. You know, lots of confusion and you know everything is just messed up. But we can come to a parking hub for exports. You know, the picture that's on your right. We can do that. We can do that properly, especially when we have a partnership and having an agro a business a hub and partnering with Fair Trade Africa. Right, so we need professional service uh, network, um, get to the bottom of every concern, especially from the finance side, get to the, these entrepreneurs, have a dialogue with them, have an entrepreneurship meeting, running, have a surgery, a consultation in your uh, premises where entrepreneurs can come just for consultation, that is in professional service network. And then finally, ladies and gentlemen, let's build bridges to help each other and not walls. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Africa. Africa. Professor Nanyondo, who are sharing with us micro, small, medium enterprises, COVID-19 aftermath. Are you on stage? That was the question she, whose answers she did provide. At Oklahoma University, I have just mastered one thing. That it does not matter how many scriptures you have, you have memorized. It does not matter how many academic publications you have studied. It doesn't matter how many privileges you have visited. What matters is, are you wise and cautious enough to bring your understanding in the service of the people around you? That is the question she is leaving to us. And uh, the other concept I have gathered is that you need always to have a backup for a backup plan. A backup for a backup plan. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go to the session of question and answer. As the professor learned in the online. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm seeing some bit of comments coming through um, on, the, uh, on the chat form. So I'm just going to run straight through them. Uh, right. Um, okay. Oh, so that's Jeremy. Jeremy. Through the chat room, um, uh, right, um, right, uh, it's, uh, Jeremy says thank you very much indeed, Mary, for the wonderful 
my second thought. Okay, that's the question. Thanks, Jeremy. Rachel, thank you. Um, Okay, uh, some of them have got no names, Mary, thank you. Okay, John, thank you, Mary. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. I'm only saying thank you. <laughs> I'm only saying thank you, so I'm not seeing any questions. I'm only saying thank yous. I can't see any questions to pick. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for appreciating me. Any questions you have for me? Yes, Anita, Anita, you've got a question, yeah? It's a question from Anita. I have a question, yes. I'm unable to unmute. Okay, Anita has got a question, but she's unable to unmute, unmute it. Okay, thank you, Mary. I'm old. I'm old in capital, but interested in saying, uh, like a small business, what should I do? Um, okay, how do you do? How do you do? Um, if you've got a business plan, if you've got a business plan, you can pass it on, uh, um, you know, manage, uh, the moderators can pass you my email and I can look at your business plan, how do you do? Yeah, I can have a look at that and then advise what I can possible on the finance that you can type in, how do you do? Yeah. I can look at your business uh, project and advise. Yes. Um, Anita, you've got, okay, share your email. Okay, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to share my email here, moderators, am I? Okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'm just gonna pop it here. I'm just gonna put my personal email. All right, so that's so right. Uh, just bear with me one sec, the Gmail does come here. So that's my personal email. So you can pop uh, your business plan there and then I can look at it for you. Okay, who well, uh, Viola? Okay, hi Viola, um, a question please. Hello? Yeah. Yes, uh, Prof. Uh, Mary, this is Anita. I just have yes, a question I, I would like to yes. ask. Yes, Anita. Thank you very much for the very informative presentation. You're I am welcome. equally passionate about uh, entrepreneurship and mm -hmm. uh, I'm just concerned about the high rate of uh, failure of the sole proprietorships or the, 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 the high rate of non-continuity of sole yeah. proprietorships. And so I just wanted to pick your mind on uh, what advice you would give uh, sole proprietors. Uh, because for me, as, as uh, I would think or I would advise that maybe mm -hmm. they would rethink stopping at the stage, starting and stopping at the stage of sole proprietorship and grow into partnerships or even registering these businesses as a company. Why? Because at the end of the day, these businesses grow. And as they grow, there they is lack of uh, you know, managing them. And sometimes the sole proprietors lack the managerial abilities to help this proprietorship grow. And so, yes, they are many, they start out well, they grow, but uh, just like you lay down the different strategies of, uh, you know, the, the different strategies of uh, continuity, the survival strategies, I think these strategies should be able to help them uh, grow from 
so proprietorship into uh, uh, very good partnerships by identifying people who have the same you know mindset behind yeah. the kind of businesses they want to set up so just hearing it from you or maybe you can just throw more light on it on how these sole proprietorships should not just start and stop but grow into maybe partnerships or companies that can thrive and so maybe there we shall realize uh, a reduction in the rate of business failures thank you very much mm. Right. Oh, thank you so much, Anita. Um, yes, I, pre I pretty much agree with you, especially if uh, these firms want to grow, but some of them do not actually want to grow. Yeah, so um, if they want to grow, partnership is the best way to do it, okay? It's the best way to do it. Partnerships is the best way to do it, okay? So um, I would pretty much support that. And business-to-business -business linkages, as I said, that if businesses want to partner, for example, you can imagine at a Baita Bavidi, where we have very many small small shops happening together. You know, so if if we had business to business linkages, then we have an enormous business hub in in Chitoro, which is not happening because everyone wants to maintain their own small space. Yeah. So the first thing we need to establish is: Do they want to be bigger? Do they want to grow? And I tend to do, um, when I come around to have a one-on-one um, -on -one with such entrepreneurs, whether they actually want to, to grow and how we can help them, you know? So I pretty much agree with you, Anita, that, you know, start, grow, partner, etc. but it all depends on the original plan. I've got friends here, they've got small businesses and ask them, um, how can we make these businesses grow or go past you, like past your generation? They're like, you know, Mary, we don't have any plans to become any bigger. So it all depends on the original strategy that was set before. Okay, so the fact that most entrepreneurs are small and micro, then the pandemic came in and they were totally closed out of business. How would they rise up again in the aftermath? How would these SMEs use ICT to be sustainable? That's a big question. And if, as I said, I've helped a few firms in Chitoro to trade online, but I've only been successful with a few because obviously it's a big problem really. And even you, you can see even in the education system, education is not, is not progressing just because there's a problem of internet. ICT is a big problem. So the first thing, if you, you don't, I don't want to, put myself in a space where internet or online ICT is going to put me off. But if I know my customer best, then I can be able to reach out to my customers. Use border borders to reach your customers. You know, if somebody orders something online or they're able to give you a phone call, make sure that you deliver exactly what they've ordered to be able to build their trust, you know. But if you don't deliver what they have ordered, chances are, you know, high that they're going to order again. So it's if we can instill trust in our businesses, then it's one of the best things that is going to help. The borrowing interest rates are high, and some of us are fresh graduates, yet we are not sure of the market, especially since people are just starting to adjust to ICT, thread, etc. I feel your pain as a graduate, but can you start small? I've got my siblings, I've got my brother Tony, he's a graduate, he's not got a job, but every day we've got business plans that we plan. So we've, if the, we've done lots of projects which are kicking off and they're starting. And I didn't just pump money into him, but I, I gave chance for him to have a business plan which I can nurture and build. So uh, Taliba, 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 Oliver, Tracy, if you've got a business plan, email me, then I can help you nurture it. And then you may be having loads of plans running in your mind, but I will help you map out the risk strategy because if you don't map out the risk strategy, then chances are high that your business is going to hit a dead end. Yes, Anita, thank you. That's okay, Anita. Thanks very much. Uh, fun, I'll, I better let go because I need to uh, give other presenters chance to, you know, pour out the knowledge. <laughs> so I'm going to go off now, but if you've got something coming up, I've left my email where you can get in touch with me and then we can get to the bottom of this. Any other questions? Thank you. That's okay. It's nice to, to be here, really.
Okay, that's all right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nanyundon. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome the doctor in making, Rwanga Musisi Akbeka, as a discussant for the topic of micro, small, medium enterprises in the COVID-19 aftermath and whether or not we are ready. You're welcome, sir. requested by the Dean of School of Business and Information Technology uh, to break down the presentation for Associate Professor Mary Nanyando. Um, he told me to delay my misunderstanding. Uh, uh, and maybe you can delay my misunderstanding, Professor. I'm going to try to do that. Um, and perhaps I can also answer some questions if time allows. I know I am the first discussant and uh, my colleagues are also in the queue. But first I shall try to break down her presentation because as she was presenting, um, the network kept on and off. The presentation was divided in an outline that she clearly followed to give a presentation. First, she gave an outline of Entebbe, an outlook of Entebbe. Uh, what Entebbe is, what are the good things about Entebbe, and how perhaps how uh, people can take advantage of uh, the strategic location of Entebbe. Talked about it as an administrative city of um, a traditional city of, of, of Uganda. I think when the Europeans were here, it used to be the capital city before we shifted to Kampala. I uh, talked about the fact that it hosts the only international airport currently in Uganda. I talked about the fact that uh, it surrounds Lake Victoria. I talked about the fact that uh, it houses CA, uh, CAA, uh, headquarters that is civil Aviation Authority and other things. Uh, so that was one. Uh, she talked about entrepreneurship. We we'll spent some time there. Talked about COVID-19 challenges faced by uh, businesses in Uganda and also services in the world. For that was her outline of the presentation, and we really thank her so much for uh, giving us a hint of what perhaps we need to do. I want to talk about entrepreneurship in uh, the late person's understanding. Entrepreneurship is business. It's how you come up with an idea to start anything that can bring you money. It may not matter what it is. And there are several businesses. In her presentation, she gave nine classifications of the different uh, uh, forms of entrepreneurship. She talked about the MSMEs, that is micro, small, and medium enterprises, as an umbrella of businesses that we can start as 
lay women and men. Now, uh, Goldman's are classified. She, 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 brief, uh, she talked about what a micro enterprise is, um, what a small enterprise is, and uh, what a medium enterprise is. And, and she said, for the micro, that is one that employs less than four people, and whose asset value is less than 10 million in shillings. So most of the businesses you see around here that employ less than four people and that have um, less than 10 million asset value when you add up all the assets, those ones are categorized as uh, micro as micro enterprises. The, the small are those whose asset value is between 10 million and And they employ people, although they are mainly not profit motivated, uh, not profit, uh, not profit uh, oriented. We have hustlers, people who do a lot of things. They are doing this, 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 and so on. And those are many, by the way, people that do many things. One person of a business involving a uh, uh, line of things. In most cases, they also have small, small capital uh, to run their various businesses. Then we have imitators, those who imitate others. They are also in business. Sometimes they are called followers. We have researchers and buyers and so many other categorizations of uh, Professor Marinando talked about. So, those are the different types of uh, entrepreneurship. There could be others, by the way, but uh, I think uh, that is what uh, basically she talked about. She went on to talk about how those businesses can be financed. How do you finance a business? Uh, talk about different ways of financing, including the, uh, bank loans. You can finance any of those businesses by obtaining a bank loan. You can bank loan is is, is, is is a product of banks where you can go as a business owner, where you can go as an individual and borrow money.
tanto drops, a tanto drops que se usan no. For example, you can have 10 million in the account, but you can withdraw maybe 11 million. It means the 1 million is in an open uh, account. You have uh, credit cards, you can have financial business with credit cards. Of course, depending on what kind of business you're doing, you can have uh, a family and friends supporting. I have seen some families that come together to support uh, their children or their relatives to start and run a business. You can get money from a circle if you are a member of a circle. This is a savings and credit cooperative. You can always get money there. Um, here to peer financing, this is where many friends get together. It is more of uh, uh, family and friends can get together and uh, your colleagues can really assist you um, to access funding for your business. We have crowd financing, you can pull up the funds together. That affect this is my categorized the two global and local challenges. The global challenges are at global level. We talked about competition as one of those challenges that affect.
Lemon and Mary Men. What can we do? We are saying that. Colin, can, can I please have the slides? We are saying that uh, one way of overcoming these challenges is first of all to understand what you're saying, um, try to maybe redefine what you're saying. Sometimes people don't understand what you do. You can redefine, you can be, you can be innovate, you can do some change. We may have seen how Google University is transforming from traditional, te uh, traditional teaching to perhaps embracing online teaching. But we are redefining what we offer. Uh, it's not easy because at some point you find resistance. Um, people don't embrace, but eventually we get there. So you can redefine uh, by way of maybe uh, embracing IT. You can partner, <coughs> come up with a partnership or network. You identify um, some other people that maybe do the same thing as you do and then work together on, 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 on partnership. See what you can do together. I'm sure we have, for example, such collaborations here. And, uh, it's part of networking. service with another person who also does uh, the same service. Slide two, eh? Hold on, slide two, please. You can... Uh, you need to have to embrace what we call soft skills. Soft skills are those that you need that are universal in every profession. They are very important for you to grow your business and to retain your customers. And there are so many soft skills. And I would like you to argue our deal. We need to see how we incorporate these in our, in our programs. Skills like communication, and that's very important. You need to know how to communicate. How do you communicate with people? Do you communicate well? Do you pass on information? Do they understand what you're talking about? That's very important for a business as a way of perhaps uh, getting it to another level. Respect is, is important. We need to respect people, the stakeholders um, that are involved with the our businesses. In Nkumba here we have students, we have government, we have uh, the community around us and so on. We need to see how we can respect each of those. Critical thinking, how do you look at things before you make a decision? If uh, a client came to you and they have presented an issue, how do you critically think to try to provide a solution to that client? Um, Teamwork. How do you work as a team? We've talked about this in, a, in, a, in partnerships and networking. How do you work together? But even within, internally, how do you um, um, uh, work as teams? Because some, sometimes things are harder when you're working alone. But when you're working as a team, um, the service for the product that you're selling is easily given to the client. But look at what is happening now. I think this 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 webinar is a, is an activity of team. We came together, we made brainstorming, we came up with the who presents, when is it going to be, and so on. So teamwork is important. Uh, flexibility. How do you how flexible are you? How adaptive are you? If you're not because the, the, the environment in which we do business changes and therefore you also must uh, come out to try to be flexible. Interpersonal skills. How do you relate with the 
with the with highlights because that's a very powerful uh, sort of skill that you need. You don't want to be someone who pushes others away. People normally get attracted to those that can relate with them very fast. And business is about that. So uh, precisely that is what uh, Professor Associate Professor Mary Nanyondo presented, and I want to believe that I have tried to break it down so that we can all be able to understand as lay women and ladies. I want to thank you for the opportunity once again. And uh, of course, I also thank the management of Kumba University for putting up this. We believe this is the beginning, and uh, we shall continue with such webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, Mr. Abubekar Ogamsisi. You have indeed disseminated the information quite well to us laymen and the laymen there. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to invite Dr. Tayas Haddad to discuss presentation Number two, on logistics management in the digital age, what are the challenges Uganda is facing? Dr. Sir, with due respect, I request it. You start staying next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, of all, what's up? Uh, first of all, I thank the presenters. So far. And those who present later uh, in this academic knowledge dissemination. Uh, my role is to discuss uh, the logistics management in the digital age, challenges uh, faced in Uganda. Uh, this was a paper presented by Ms. Nawata Diana. And uh, the presentation uh, was uh, categorized into three. Uh, the introduction looked at uh, logistics management, uh, which is a core component of the supply chain management. Because it talks about the core elements in the supply chain, that is acquisition, the movement, and the warehousing or storage of uh, materials of products and byproducts from the source to the destination. However, she noted that just like people's lives have increasingly been accustomed to digital ways due to internet evolution, so is the logistics industry. And it's because of this that Uganda has a lot of challenges uh, with regard to logistics in this digital era. The challenges she mentioned were consequential in nature and uh, among others included the following. The consequences of these challenges and the challenges themselves. The increase in the transportation costs due to poor and inadequate road networks. And then the compromise of the quality of the products and byproducts due to poor storage and warehousing facilities. And then the loss of business due to missed and delayed time deadlines and timelines. Of course, this could be as a result of traffic congestion, poor road networks, and other other problems. And then the delays in the production process due to prolonged lead times, again as a result of uh, poor networks, and then there are dire consequences in the health sector uh, that she mentioned, you see, as a result of the poor handling of the medical supply. Uh, in a bid 
to address these logistical challenges at hand in this digital age, of course, uh, she mentioned uh, uh, remedies that can be uh, put into place, and uh, these, among others, included or include, in summary, creating real-time and transparent communication channels. And then two, enable collaboration with network-based communication, and then automating routine procedures to produce uh, or to reduce, or at times do away with the complex complexity of the work. And then optimizing the inventory and supply chain demands across the multiple channels. Uh, these seem to be a little bit complex to be coped up with. However, she gave hope and showed how Uganda has uh, gone so far in its readiness for this electronic kind of logistics. She gave us uh, uh, areas like an increased customer base, that there is hope that majority of people are coping up with technology. People are owning these electronic phones and they are engaging in business online. Then she also said that there is a raised social media platform awareness among uh, individuals. And this, of course, uh, gives us hope that uh, at one time, uh, people are going to be there with the kind of logistics. And then she also uh, gave the digitally enabled information services. She gave examples of businesses having websites and uh, other, other kind of platforms where they disseminate uh, uh, their, their products. And then she also talked about the digital payment methods that many Ugandans have adopted and gave an example of the use of the debit and the credit cards. And then she also gave a point of the private e-innovations that people and companies and businesses more and be are coming up with applications and uh, innovations uh, to boost their businesses. The case in point is the border border application, the safe border. She also uh, mentioned uh, the, the, the Chikugo e online kind of retail shopping. So these are areas that really give hope that Uganda can cope up with the challenges in this uh, in, uh, in logistics in this digital age. Uh, in her conclusion say that to these interjections, of course with government involvement in the major logistical aspects, the effects of these logistical challenges in this digital era would be minimized. So briefly and basically, that's what the discussion is about. Thank you very much. Dr. Sadat Dutaria, thank you so very much for discussing and condensing the presentation such that all of us are able to understand it quite well. Ladies and gentlemen, this will come Dr. Charles Edaku our director Kampala campus to discuss the first presentation that was given or that was presented by Professor Wilson Mwinda Mande at Dr. Idaki's online. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Am I audible enough? Uh, Collins, am I audible enough? Yeah, you are audible enough, Doctor. So we are we are, are listening. Okay, thank you. 
um, once again, um, Dr. Charles Sedak and uh, I'm coming from or discussing from the capital city of Uganda, Kampala. And uh, I'm handling Professor or discussing Professor Monday's uh, paper. And the paper, uh, the title of the paper is The Ethic of Personal Advantage Militates Against the Attainment of SDGs in Uganda During Digital Age. Uh, the person and members, I start by making observations in regards to this paper and then proceed further uh, to discuss in detail what the paper is looking at. Now, looking at the observations, the author of this paper interrogates, interrogates the question of attainment of SDGs. But he looks at that from the driving factor of ethic of personal advantage. And when we talk about ethic of personal advantage, we are actually talking about how we usually put ourselves first before others or before anything. So uh, it also points to the aspect of uh, being egocentric, and probably in another context, we can say being selfish. That is what uh, ethic of personal advantage um, uh, focuses on or looks at. But it's looking at that in the context of our failure as developing countries and other countries possibly that have not uh, taken uh, strong strides in attainment of the SDGs. Uh, Professor Mande relates ethic of personal advantage to corruption. So he looks at ethic of personal advantage as a precursor of corruption. And therefore, uh, something that has engineered so many other ills within the economic, social, and political arena uh, in terms of realization of SDGs. We shall look at this in detail. He also brings in the aspect of ICT. He also brings in the aspect of ICT in the fight against corruption, looking at the positive contributions and the negative uh, contributions or the flaws inherent within uh, ICT. Um, I'm happy to note uh, somebody raised a question about uh, using ICT to promote business, but we have also noted the challenge that we're facing as a developing country. But um, he gave an example for it uh, in terms of uh, online teaching as one of the, the core contributions of ICT in a promoting uh, education, for example. But again, the negative aspect of it is that the very ICT has also uh, enhanced cheating of examinations and therefore undermining the quality of education. And you can uh, bear witness that this then will uh, definitely lead to our failure to realize the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, Professor Mande then fronts communitarianism, communitarian uh, service, uh, communitarianism or communitarian uh, servership as one of the, the magic bullets that we can use in order to fight against corruption and therefore uh, promote then uh, only uh, enhance the realization of SDGs. Now, when he talks about communitarian servership, He's talking about the communal uh, responsibility 
that was exhibited with the Ubuntu. And if you looked at in uh, Uganda here, we used to have Bonapa, uh, 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 no, not, not that one, Bulunji Gwansi, we used to have Bulunji Gwansi. And then in Tanzania, we used to have the Arambe uh, kind of um, um, uh, slogan, which, which was an aspect of uh, communal uh, subbership. So he's looking at this as a magic bullet that could actually fight corruption and therefore enhance the realization of uh, SDGs. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that, those were just highlights of Professor Mande's presentation, but I'm going to go deeper in discussing his uh, presentation. In his analysis of ethic of personal advantage, uh, which we look at as I, I made mention, we looked at as putting the self first before the others or before uh, any, anything else. Now, uh, ethical personal advantage undermines the realization of uh, the sustainable development goals. And when we talk of sustainable development goals, I've called them the extended uh, millennium development goals because sometime back in 2000, uh, some strong powers met somewhere and they decided, of course, to come up with a new uh, theory of development where they came up with the, uh, the Millennium Development Goals. But later on, when they discovered that there were so many flaws in terms of uh, realization of this, they expanded and extended the Millennium Development Goals to constitute the Sustainable Development Goals. Of course, we're not going to go into details looking at the flaws inherent within uh, SDGs. But what is interesting, ladies and gentlemen, in this discussion of ethic of uh, personal advantage vis-a-vis -vis realization of SDGs is how the Wanainchi, and I think we all know who Wanainchi are, the people, how the Wanainchi are pointing fingers at their leaders, accusing them of corruption, and that they are the reason we are not on course in terms of, uh, I, I think you could ask Collins to share the, the slides. Collins? Yes, I'm coming to that illustration. So um, uh, you could go to, yes, uh, that's where we are. So you could see uh, the interesting thing is that the Wanainchi point fingers at the leaders, accusing them of corruption and uh, 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 putting it uh, boldly that it's the reason we are not on course in terms of realization of SDGs. Then the top leadership, the drivers of the economy on the other hand, are blaming the entrepreneurs, the middlemen, those who are implementing the programs and projects as the main cause of our failure to be on course in terms of realization of uh, SDGs. What is happening, Collins? So th there is that blame game. While uh, the, the top leadership blames the middlemen, the middlemen also, on the other hand, blame the Wanainchi, uh, the Wanainchi uh, for, for laziness, vandalism, negligence, being inept in terms of bringing about change. Now, I see that as a vicious circle of the blame game and our inability then to, uh, to, to, to really touch and focus our attention on the main uh, problem. As you can see that illustration, the top leadership, the other side, the drivers of the economy uh, at the level of the of the level of the uh, ministers and, and the rest are blaming the implementers, the entrepreneurs, uh, the middlemen, those that are implementing uh, the projects, the programs. And uh, you find also down here, the Wanainchi, but in the middle, somewhere at the center, and that's what Professor Mani is looking at, that seems like we're pointing fingers in two wrong directions, and yet we're leaving out 
the main thing. The moral vice, the moral vice is the ethic of personal advantage, where we have, um, as a result, uh, failed to do many things. Colin, you can move to the next slide. So because of uh, that, yes, because of that, we ask ourselves a question. So where is the problem? And I've already answered the question that the problem lies within uh, the individual morals. And when we talk of the individual morals, we are talking about ethic of personal advantage. And the ethic of personal advantage has compromised the, the interest of the other. Ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about the other, uh, it, it, we, we draw it from the, the, the theory of reciprocity of roles. And when we talk about reciprocity of roles, we are, we, are, we are looking at a relationship between the two where we have you here and the other, the other side. Uh, Colin, you go back to shortly after the, after the, the drawing. You go back. Again, yes, there, that's where we are. So uh, when we talk about uh, the ethic of personal advantage, compromising the interest of the other, Colin, what are you doing with my presentation? <laughs> you are spoiling my presentation. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, he's going to address that. I think those are the, the related ICT uh, issues. We've been talking about ICT challenges. It has merits, but it has also the flaws, and that is one of them. So um, I'm, I'm saying the ethic of personal advantage then compromises uh, what we call our service uh, uh, towards the interest of the other. We fail to address the interest of the other. And I was talking about the theory of reciprocity of roles where my role becomes your interest, I mean, your right, and your right, your role becomes my, my right. So in, in conduct of that, the concept of the other comes in, which then the ethic of personal advantage compromises. The ethic of personal advantage also compromises uh, integrity. Uh, the ethic of personal um, uh, advantage also compromises integrity. And when I talk of integrity, our failure to have that self-worth, self-worth, it compromises uh, transparency and uh, turns forward what we call inward looking kind of approach as opposed to outward looking. It uh, compromises issues of accountability, which points to our responsibility to the other. Colin, you go back still. Okay, you go back, Colin. Uh, those are ICT issues. There's no problem. We shall get there. Uh, so I'm still looking at uh, where the problem is, Colin. Where the, now? Where is the problem? That's where you go to. And I was talking about how the ethic of personal advantage compromises the interest of the other, integrity transparency and accountability. And you find that in conduct of our business, we normally ask a big question. The Baganda call it Mfunirawa. Uh, and uh, literally translated for those who do not understand Uganda, it means where do I gain from? And, and that aspect of where do I gain from Mfunirawa, uh, uh, you know, brings about the desire for a tip to be pushed to do something. And most times you tend to be very reluctant in doing uh, what you're supposed to, uh, to do because you want to be pushed, you want to be bribed. Um, okay, so Colin is saying I share the, is it okay now Colin? I think it's okay now. We are, we are together. So I we yes. 
Okay, so we are on the consequences of uh, ethics. Okay. Uh, we are on the consequences of ethic of personal advantage. Now that uh, ethic of personal advantage has compromised our ability to serve the interest of the other, integrity, transparency, and accountability, and we're asking for something to allow us to uh, do something uh, we look at the consequences of ethic of personal advantage. And here we are, that uh, we end up doing shoddy work. For, for example, we compromise standards, we compromise quality, we are reluctant to doing work. And therefore, at the end of the day, we have shoddy work done, low output, and all that uh, related to that. We also, um, uh, you know, go in for issues of embezzlement, and here I've talked about money eaters from where he worketh, and, and that is the common phrase now, and their attendant uh, consequences. And, and <coughs> more... Sir? Yes? Um, I was just wondering um, if I could uh, yeah, put my webcam on for a second. I've uh, been working out really hard the last couple of, last couple of months um, in my dorm room. I've really, really uh, enjoyed Well, I've not got well, I got it very well. What you are saying? Okay, maybe that is something uh, different. Uh, it could be uh, not, not part of this. So I was talking about the consequences of uh, ethic of personal uh, advantage. And uh, I was talking about uh, that compromising standards quality of service, uh, promoting embezzlement. And, you know, apparently people talk about uh, every man it is from where he worketh, uh, which is something very clear. And, and then all these has got attendant consequences, ladies and gentlemen. For example, we have realized what we call stockouts in hospitals, uh, where drugs uh, delivered in less than a week or about a week's time. There are no more drugs and many other related things. But of course, I'm trying to do this and to relate it to how then the ethic of um, personal advantage uh, leads to failure to realize SDGs. So as we realize stock out, at the end of the day, we compromise uh, 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 the SDG uh, goal number three. And then uh, rising levels of poverty, as you can see, uh, if you read uh, last year's uh, Uganda Bureau of Standards uh, report about poverty levels, they are rising. And uh, we also see problems of mortality and morbidity rising up. And that also compromises um, uh, uh, G3, that's goal number three. Issues of hunger and malnutrition come in. Collapse of education system, I would say, we are on course towards collapsing the current education system very well. And uh, gender parity related issues come on board, as you can see there. Then we also see failure to forge global partnerships and co uh, cooperation, which is uh, related to goal number 17. Ladies and gentlemen, here I'm only highlighting some of the, uh, the goals under uh, SDGs, the 17 that have been affected, but all of them have been affected by uh, the concept or the, that aspect of ethical personal advantage. Now, uh, we go to the next slide, Collins. Questions for ourselves. What are the questions for ourselves? And one of them is what should be done to fix the problem? What should be done to fix the, the problem, uh, the problem of ethical personal advantage? and we're saying one of them is mindset change. That's what people say. I'm talking about what the public is basically talking about. Uh, mindset change, we need to do some kind of mindset change. We talk about prayers. Others say, let's just pray to our God to help us. Others are su suggesting wipe off the current generation and create another because all of us are corrupt. So, which is something very impossible. Others suggest uh, uh, policy reforms, Others suggest uh, the, stick and princi uh, the stick principle. 
uh, and many other suggestions along that, uh, that line. Another question is, who is most qualified to fix this moral question? And I'm saying the answers are with you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the answers are with you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, finally, Collins, the last, the last one, the real last. Go to the next. Yes. Finally, I say merci de coup. Thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so very much, Dr. Idaku, for that discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, I request that those questions for Professor Mande, Dr. Idaku, Madame Lakatmayana, and Dr. Sadat Putaya, you can bring them up. We shall use over 15 minutes and we proceed to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Program Director, the Chair of the Session, and thank you, uh, Dr. Idaku, uh, as well as uh, Professor Mande, who initially gave us a very informative uh, presentation. I have one question to you, Prof, uh, that requires probably clarity, and the next one will go to uh, Madame Nawaka, who I hope will join us soon. <coughs> Uh, the question is, why is it that the richest continent by far, uh, which is Africa, uh, in terms of natural resources, inhabits by far the poorest people in the world, and yet, against this background, inherits uh, values and beliefs uh, in line with Ubuntu? Ideally, um, your suggestion of the communitarian Sabership stands ideal because it's in resonance with uh, Ubuntu. How do we then intend to utilize this kind of approach in addressing corruption? Um, thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much for <clears throat> that question. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Charles Daku, the discussant, for the input he has given to this presentation. Now, the question is, why is the richest continent, which is Africa, has the poorest people on the planet? I think the answer goes back to what I mentioned earlier on in my presentation, where I did say, uh, actually I quoted Chinua Chepe, who wrote things fall apart. In other words, the Africans had, a, uh, they were on a course to development in their own way. And when the colonialists and others came in, of course, they not only come to steal, but they also came with various ideas, culture, uh, language, and uh, the way of looking at things. So that's why we, the development of Africa was cut short. And uh, I remember Walter Rodney, that uh, gentleman from the Caribbean, writing a book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. So, it is, that is the, the problem. And this is why sometimes when we look at these things, we see, for example, when we look at the World Bank, which says that those people who live on less than a dollar a day are actually at the bottom of uh, the poverty rank. 
And in Africa, people maybe who earn less than a dollar a day, if you look at incomes, there will be very many. But if you look at how much they spend per day, maybe they don't spend just a dollar. Because if you put together the, the, the firewood, the water, the, the, the food, the potatoes, the greens, and all that plus the labor, if you put a cost to each of those items, which make them survive every day, it wouldn't be just 3,000 shillings per family or per person. So our problem is the, the, the intrusion but from the outside. And I think we also see that there has been struggles if you look at the, 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 the WTO, the World Trade Organization, I think Africans are not doing very well. But even before that, for example, when we still had the coffee agreement, Africa would be given very little. For example, you're going to get about 29 tons, billion tons, or metric tons of coffee to export to the rest of the world. And you can see how much you can get out of that. When it comes to aid, for example, they look at Uganda. If you give Uganda $1 billion, do they be able to use it in the financial year? They say no. What can you give them? Give them $120 million for this and that. If you have to give them a lot of money, maybe spread it over a number of years. And as you know, that when you get little, use it, it gets finished. You use, get little, use it, it gets finished, and you cannot move very far. Furthermore, the resources that we have, including the human beings, they are all being taken now. You see now we have even, what do we call them? Uh, human resource organizations that export labor. But those hundreds of thousands of Ugandans who are going there, they are actually depriving us of the labor that we would have used here. And it is the same thing which happened during slave trade. They took so many of them, and uh, the ones they left behind, of course, were psychologically disorientated and could not do more. And therefore, this is why we are saying that we have to be, to look inward, to look at our own culture, as one person from Latin America did write a book that let us bring from our own wells. If you think what will be coming from outside, we shall not go very far. So if we put ourselves together, we use the resources we have. Because Uganda is not a poor country. <clears throat> Just like they say, our neighbor, DRC, is the richest country on, on the face of the earth. But the people there are very poor. Now, who, take, who, who, who really take and use those resources? It is the outsiders. So if Uganda will have the best climate in the whole, in the whole world, now, what are we doing with it? Other people are coming here. One time, let me tell you, we were at one conference, and somebody asked me, said, you come from Uganda, what are you doing with the fresh water of Lake Victoria? I said, we drink it, we get fish. He said, oh, not that. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you wait, next war, we'll build that water. In other words, they are saying, you cannot just sit here with such resources, using it, not to benefit them, but we think we are benefiting from it. For us, we are busy trying to keep our resources as they are. So I think that is one of the causes. I think it is the major cause. Of course, we have other causes like the, the, the climate change, global warming, and so on. OK, those ones are there. However, these are the very serious uh, challenges that we have from outside. You see the policies, the laws which are made Sometimes they don't favor us. And I think you can see just recently people have been calling over fish that this fish is from Uganda and it is not from Uganda. Now, it is not coming to a market. Why don't you let it just pass? It is from there, let it pass and where it's supposed to go. Why did somebody at one entry point find that it was okay, hear it, then at another point it was not clear? So those are some of the challenges we still have and that's why we are poor. But also our mindset. We have taken on the, 
the issue of being individualistic and materialistic, and we are not going very far. Just like one person said that if you, if you build a house, three-story house for accommodation, you and your wife, how many rooms do you need in that house? Said one. If it is one room, how much do you need you and your house? Just a six by three. Because the Mazomoto bed, it is not good for my duty. So you need a three <laughs> by six bed to sleep on. In other words, what is the rest of the building for? So this is what we are saying, that the, that, uh, uh, the ethical personal advantage trying to change our mindset. We are trying to say, let me get more. If I have a house, let me get a straight one. If I have a, a vehicle, let me get another one. Even if you get a vehicle, maybe let me get the, the, the latest model and so on. And this one has caused a big problem. But as Yas Sadaf has said, it has to start with us. For me, in my presentation, I say that we need to look at uh, some socializing agencies. Let's take the family, let's take the, the, the communities, let's take organizations so that they come back and inculcate the value of the other, of caring for the community, of caring for everybody. That is communal interest. Because if you act alone, somebody says that if you want to move very quickly and end somewhere, move alone. But if you want to go very far, move with the others. So for us, we can't move. And actually, if you look at it, uh, John, East Africa, we, we have East Africa here. But you can look at our relationship with Kenya. We have been fidgeting around a number of things. Look at our relationship with Rwanda. So how far can we go? Look at our relationship with South Sudan. Each one wants to move alone, and we are not going very far. We shall remain where we are, and uh, we shall remain at the bottom of the developed countries, simply because we are, even at national level, as I say, we are individualistic. We want our own country, only our own country. We don't care about the rest of the countries, and what comes out of that are wars and conflicts which do not benefit us, to make us lose, and that is the challenge. Thank you very much. There is another question for you here. A small one. Um, you have, in your last a comment, you actually mentioned funding as one of the stakeholders in managing corruption tendencies. Um, from my experience, I realized that uh, corruption has been too rooted from generation to generation. And uh, how are we going to manage this, given the fact that uh, the generation that is on is actually uh, digitalized? How can we train families or children to, 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 rise, to rise up to fight corruption from the ground since uh, corruption is regulated? Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor, there is another question here for you. It's what is the same? It says, Professor Mande. Corruption is a real curse, but how do we practically deal with it? Okay, thank you very much. Now, the weakness of the family. Yes, I can agree the family is becoming weaker. However, this is why I was saying that uh, we need the commentarian servership because when you look at a family, even the traditional society, it was not only the mother and the father for whom it was a responsibility to bring up the children, but it was also the, 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 the rest of the community, the rest of the village, such that everybody felt it was his responsibility. And uh, that's why we used to have that idea of whose child are you? Though these days people changed it to make it uh, have different connotations. But simply meant that if you say that is Kamsime's son, they say, okay, you come. Because we know Kamsime, 
and therefore we think that the way you are brought up, you are brought up in the same way uh, Kamsime was brought up. So I, I think we need also to emphasize the idea of the family, because that is the first root of any nation. Without a, without a family, you have no community, you have no nation, you only have individuals, like those you see in a marketplace. And therefore, nobody is responsible for anything. And this is maybe where we need the most important parent, that is the mother, uh, to take the upper hand in this uh, nurturing of the child, so that the child can really have the, the values that we expect. The next uh, question that, yes, corruption is uh, a curse and not individualistic for the good of the community, but only for ourselves. That's why somebody will get money here, would rather buy a house in Dubai and maybe have a business in, in, in Brazil, unemployed and who are poor. So that spirit or that mindset, I think Doug put it very well, we need to change it so that we look at our contribution to the community. Because if we don't contribute anything to the community, it doesn't help. I've been looking at the stories of, of millionaires in other countries, especially in the US. The, the ones you hear, the Rockefeller, the Carnegie, the whatever, even now, the Burgess and others. They say, when you have got all this money, you have achieved everything, please give back to society. And that's why they establish foundations to give back to society. And uh, I'm, I'm yet to find out in Uganda, those who have got all the money, whether they have reached a point where they are giving back to society through foundations, help the sick, those who don't have fees, those who don't have this, those who don't have whatever. The only things which come into help are rotary and other things which are not necessarily rooted in our social city. But I think we need to do something about it by inculcating the interests of the community. That's when we can achieve, I think, a change of the mindset so that we get what we have lost for some time. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's once again put our hands together and say a big thank you to Professor Wilson Moyenda Mande. The Emmanuel Kant of our times. Thank you very much, Prof. Ladies and gentlemen, we have requested the members to put in the, the questions in our chat and we shall be able to get to them in the next session of Q and A. Let's proceed to our presenter, number three, Digital Technology and Innovation Ecosystems. Digital Technology and Innovation eco systems. The presenter is none other than Dr. James Kaliuchi Njenga. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. James Kaliuchi
Hello, good afternoon. Afternoon, am I uh, audible? You are welcome. You are welcome. Proceed. Oh, okay. Thank you. Apologies. There was a bit of a technical hiccup. Is, is my screen uh, visible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is, doctor. Okay. Thank you very much. I missed part of the introduction, so I, I don't know what you said about me. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping it's all good. Uh, but as a matter of uh, introduction, then. Uh, the brief that I can give is that I'm currently a senior lecturer at the Department of Information Systems at the University of the Western Cape. And my area of teaching is mainly in business information systems. And uh, my research mainly focuses on uh, digital entrepreneurship and e-learning. So today I decided that I'll uh, talk to you about uh, the idea that has been forming our research that has been forming over the last two years on digital technology and innovation ex ecosystems. And the reason for, uh, for this research is we realize that there, there are certain things that need to be there for any entrepreneurial venture to succeed. And it really doesn't matter what the, in most cases, what the entrepreneurial mindset or acumen of the person doing the entrepreneurial activities are, but there are also, also other cogent issues around that affect the success of any entrepreneurial activity. And therefore, we decided that uh, in addition to what uh, others have been looking out for, for example, what are the characteristics of an entrepreneur, what makes some entrepreneurs successful while others fail, and what leads to the failure of as well successful ventures. Uh, we started uh, to think about are there issues around the environment that uh, affect the success of an entrepreneurial endeavor. And therefore, that's a, a synopsis of the talk today. Uh, most of the uh, relationships that I'll discuss today are what we observe in Cape Town. And uh, I'll try wherever, wherever possible, I've just put my camera on, I'll try wherever possible to uh, put some parallels uh, with what could be happening elsewhere in the world and what could be uh, relevant in the case of Uganda. So. By way of introduction, then, uh, on the topic, I'll start off by saying that um, it's foregone conclusion that ICTs have uh, changed the way we live. Uh, we've uh, created improvements, even in fields that are not IT or ICT related. And there's been talk about in the previous discussions or presentations of ICT in education, where uh, we've been able to offer these uh, services or education services uh, even during COVID. 
And then there is the effect of ICT or uh, IT in the critical infrastructure. And we have examples of failures in ICTs that have uh, had catastrophic impacts. Uh, for example, uh, looking at the failure of uh, grids or uh, communication grids, even railways, uh, electricity grids and the like. So we've also, uh, as part of our way of introduction, uh, moved and I, I really like that, it, that there's somebody in earlier discussion, maybe who said uh, there's a difference between creativity and innovation and we've moved uh, beyond that. I think what's important for this presentation and as I move on uh, is that we've seen over the last few years that cities, territories, regions are presenting themselves as the go-to places for entrepreneur. Uh, uh, the question that was previously asked, what, uh, why is Africa still poor? And the response was that the uh, talent is moving away from Africa to those cities or territories that are more appealing to this kind of entrepreneurship. Uh, so this is uh, what I, I think uh, would premise or form the foundation of this. Are there ways that, for example, we could look at uh, Entebbe as a silicon kind of place Across the border there, they, they, we talk about the uh, silicon savannas and the like. So if we were then, uh, I'm still on the, on the introduction, there are things in our ecosystems that we really need to look at so that we don't die as a human race and uh, try to acclimatize ourselves with these ICT-based innovations and in so doing, look at ways of uh, achieving the best entrepreneurial or digital entrepreneurial endeavors. Of course, there are some challenges that we, we might uh, need to overcome, and I'll go through them in, uh, in the presentation shortly. And finally, there is a, uh, what has it been emerging uh, in the last two years of our research, or my research, uh, and I will briefly talk to, to that during the last uh, phase of my presentation. So, uh, why did we choose this approach? Uh, briefly, uh, the ecological approach focuses on not, not only on the actors, but also on the activities they engage in and the tools they use. In this case, we're talking about these actors as they engage with the IT products or systems. And in so doing, they collaborate, they compete, they do so many other things. So when we talk about the, an ecosystem approach, it's more of the interconnectedness, interdependent uh, see and the relationship within the structures and the activities of the people. In the entrepreneurial endeavor, we're looking at the entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur uh, the IT artifacts and any other related artifacts that they use and the relationship with the environment. And it's a complex uh, set of, uh, say, relationship or network that we need to really understand. And the aim for the uh, current view of uh, the ecosystem approach is to make sure uh, or to look at ways where we can have a balance and efficiency in making sure that whatever we innovate in all the technologies that we use in the innovation really uh, get into the market and become uh, successful. Of course, when we look at the uh, DTIs, DTEs, DTIEs, or Digital Technology Innovation Ecosystems, uh, there are so many dimensions to it. Uh, in this slide, I highlight uh, four main uh, slides, uh, main dimensions rather. Uh, there's the legal dimension, 
And under the legal dimension, there are quite a number of issues that we could look at. Uh, one related to what the response that was given is about our immigration policies. It could be that uh, in Uganda, it's not easy for foreigners to start business or to come even uh, as professors to teach universities uh, or uh, as business entrepreneurs or tech entrepreneurs to come there. Then there are issues of uh, other laws and regulations. Earlier, uh, Mary discussed the issues of uh, credit and financing. What are the regulations on credit and finance, especially when it comes to something like uh, bankruptcy laws and, and the like? So under the legal framework, the, the, those issues that arise. And of course, uh, the other issues in the ecosystem under the organization and processes. Uh, in most cases, what we've seen in, in Cape Town and organization and, uh, and processes, there are technology parks that have come up uh, and quite a lot of them or quite a number of them. There are incubators. Uh, even at our university, we have a, a two set of incubators. Uh, there are technology transfer offices and again, at, at UWC, we have a, tech, a technology transfer office. And they are those clusters of knowledge markets and intermediaries that help uh, build or uh, participate in this digital ecosystem to help the digital entrepreneurs. And of course, uh, with those and the relationship uh, between those and the government entities, I, here in Cape Town, we have some support from the city and some support from the provincial government on the digital entrepreneur or what we call the mainly the startup hubs that are uh, sponsored either directly or indirectly by the city. And then on the human capital, uh, we like in Cape Town that we have four universities and uh, those universities have a wide range of offers, and I would assume that the talent that is here uh, helps really, really helps in the growth of the digital entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurial system. And of course, the issue of funding, I don't really think that I really I need to discuss it, given what Mary discussed on the various uh, issues or mm, awareness and approaches to financing. Uh, so if to say that uh, in our research, we've not so much focused on the funding uh, because we uh, or rather going forward, we'll not be focusing more on the funding because we feel that it's something that uh, most of the other researchers have looked at. And uh, given that uh, what we found out in our preliminary research that uh, is coming up, uh, funding is almost there when uh, there's a good business opportunity. So if our focus then is on the other dimensions, uh, what are we looking at? We're looking mainly at the talent marketplace and the marketplace and looking at what are some of the issues that the marketplace faces. and what are the issues that we really need to look at uh, to make sure that uh, there is full participation and we encourage people to participate in the ecosystem? Of course, uh, we first tried uh, two years ago uh, at the inception uh, to look at the benefits of participating in uh, the ecosystem. And mainly the benefits are the support that the, entrepreneur, the entrepreneurs get. And the non-financial support is actually the one that they rate very highly in their success. For example, they say, uh, at the beginning, we didn't know how to, uh, to choose our technologies and develop them and grow them. And with the help that we got from the uh, ecosystem, we were able to do that. Uh, Mary talked about the managerial uh, capabilities and managed growth. Uh, we discussed uh, some of the research findings. We discussed with some of the uh, founders of tech, uh, tech, tech companies that 
grew too fast and that they, at one point they didn't have uh, they developed cash flow pro, uh, cash flows problems and with that they failed and the other non tech non financial support that they really look forward to is networking and i think uh, mary also talked about that on the financial side it's not so much uh, the focus uh, here on the entrepreneurial support it's not so much on the funding but it's more on the bookkeeping and revenue modeling so that they don't, like I've said before, grow too fast and fail or go to, grow too, too slow and then their competitors uh, uh, wash them away. And then there's also the issue of the facilities and technologies to use. Of course, the, some of the innovation tech hubs have certain platforms that they use and initially the costing is very relatively, it's relatively cheap or affordable, as long as the other supporting partners are there. But what happens when the tech hubs need to, or the tech startups need to move away from that and they want to stand on their own? Of course, there's also the benefit of ease of entry to entrepreneurial environment. And when we go to especially the tech hubs and uh, interview the entrepreneurs there, the the fact that they can share ideas with other people in that space is a very important thing. And then there's the issue of access to the facilities and of course funding that has been discussed before. Of course, there are some of the uh, some challenges in the ecosystems and uh, this is especially true for uh, the people who are starting and who I think especially for those who are coming from school that they tend to trust and or they are not aware of the things that happen within the ecosystem. Uh, some of the hardships that uh, we've picked up and they could be also in other jurisdiction uh, is the high risk of collaboration and this collaboration is actually an, uh, encouraged in the ecosystem. We've had so many stories where there is theft of IP, where after extensive proposal, and I'm not against anyone sending a proposal to someone, uh, that your ideas are picked up and then they're being implemented elsewhere. Uh, we've had a, a, a situation where one entrepreneur, after presenting the ideas to a certain funder, the funder offered them money to buy them out. Uh, that's a case of what we call in business a hostile takeovers, and uh, where after pitching for ideas to find that uh, four or five uh, months down the line, there's a similar product elsewhere that you really did not know how uh, that would have happened. Then uh, with the collaboration also, there's some form of despondence in the entrepreneurs in that uh, they've attended so many presentations, say maybe seeking for the non-financial support or the financial support, yet after discussions, uh, very little action or no action is taken. And this is after probably you've uh, been hopeful that uh, in, in the few rounds that you've engaged with uh, the funding agency or the support giver that you will be next in line. And then there's uh, also when we start looking at the level, the, the feedback we are getting from them, because of the kind of engagement they they doing within the hubs, they might or within the community, they might not be differentiating enough, and this might mean that at the end, even though they are in different line of business, they might end up being uh, like offering the same services, uh, leading to a, or technologies leading to a saturation in the market or um, in services that are aligned to a similar line of business model that might not succeed in the future. And then there are also uh, this one that we've uh, encountered, I think it's in two or three startups that we interviewed where uh, certain uh, businesses establish some form of foundations or what they, they would say they, it's a contribution to society through CSR, but those foundations uh, 
are suspected not to be genuine, but who to actually sit there and try to sift the ideas that are coming through the market that might disrupt, disrupt the bigger corporations. And of course, there is the infrastructure limitation. And in this case, uh, mainly the infrastructure limitations comes into the, all the dimensions. Uh, whether it's policy, we don't have enough policies, and I'll look at that later. The technologies, um, uh, mainly where the technology, once we have, uh, say, uh, provided a blueprint for the text, and they have to develop that technology. Most of the uh, IC printing is being done in India, or the kind of technology, the uh, bespoke technology they need, uh, it's very difficult to get. And if they get, then the costing is quite high for what the market can really afford. But again, then uh, we discussed that and uh, viability of any business venture. And then under policies, although in Cape Town uh, we claim to be the best, there are still so many hurdles to buy, uh, to uh, to jump. And once you in the startup, as long as you registered for yourself as a business, uh, the tariffs and business permits that you pay are quite exorbitant and or high. And those are some of the things that uh, our entrepreneurs are complaining about. So. In a nutshell, then uh, we're seeing that there are some uh, issues that are arising in the ecosystems. Uh, I'll not deal so much with the funding, uh, safe to say that the eligibility, uh, as was discussed by Mary earlier, that uh, for the banks and other credit providers, they want a track record, they want formal registration, they have difficult criteria that it's very difficult for startups to meet, uh, some that want to offer equity financing, they want the equity financing that's not in the best interest or in the assessment of the entrepreneurs, it's not in the best interest and the like. So how do, are they dealing with this? So what we've seen uh, mainly is that based on the, the other non-financial support they've been given, most of these entrepreneurs are not going to, the, uh, to solicit for funds until they've really exhausted their internal funds and they're able to start, even if it's uh, selling their services or product to a smaller market, uh, in, in, in so doing, they have a realistic chance of knowing how much they might need, if at all. In some cases, uh, there are some uh, entrepreneurs, one or two that we've, I think it's, no, it's one company that we, uh, we interviewed and they said, after going to the market, they realized that uh, the products they're selling and the way they've uh, uh, configured their services, they actually do not need to go to the market for, for funding. Uh, what the, the company does is it, it, it installs wireless internet access. And once you buy into the services, you, buy, you pay for the connectivity equipment at a nominal fee, and then they charge you for the connectivity alone. And if you can, they, you, as a customer, you can buy the equipment alone uh, on your side and they only cater for the equipment at the transmission center and the connectivity, then they did not need the extensive funding. And that is one way of the, the those some, some of those tech startups are doing without funding. And of course, then uh, the, the factors that are affecting the particip participation is that uh, from what we, we're seeing is the access to technology, although there are platforms within the hubs, all the within those uh, support centers, the technology might not be appropriate to what the tech startups are doing. And where they are using the provided platforms, the support and maintenance of those supports, uh, the, the technologies rather, is not really geared to what they're doing. 
And it's very difficult when somebody else is managing the technology to integrate that technology into your daily routine so that you can start in a way uh, configuring that technology to the needs of your organization as the organization uh, of, or your startup as it evolves. And uh, within, again, those uh, ecosystems, the institutions that form, the relationship that form makes it difficult for, makes it difficult for the entrepreneurs to start structuring their startups in a way that it, it, they would like them to grow. Partly because uh, the, in our assessment that the, the, the field they're in or the, the environment they're in seeks or seems to hold that a certain structure is more important than the other. And of course, the issue of governance and compliance, there are so many rules that the uh, startups need to obey. And there's always been a comparison. Why is it possible? Uh, uh, why is it that uh, the most innovative digital enterprises, some of them are in countries like Somalia, where there are not so many laws or policies to follow? And the, the short and uh, simple could be answer could be that uh, in our more regulated environments, that it becomes very difficult even to innovate. Uh, so based on, on what we've seen, uh, we've uh, started looking at what, what could be other things that we really don't know. And uh, this is where I invite uh, you and some of, uh, some of you who are interested in this field to, uh, to start uh, thinking with me. How do the micro institutions that evolve within either cities or territories help in the formation or in the success of the digital entrepreneurs? Uh, we can ask this differently. Why is it uh, possible that in some jurisdictions like uh, it is in the Silicon Valley that some digital enterprises can succeed there while in a city like Cape Town, because Cape Town is not like uh, Silicon Valley, or we could say in Entebbe, these uh, entrepreneurs can grow. Or why is it possible? How is it possible that a certain entrepreneur can leave Entebbe and come and succeed in Cape Town? And what are those? Micro institutions, because if we look at the entrepreneur, the person who left Entebbe and came to establish his or business in Cape Town is the same person. So the qualities of the entrepreneurs are the same. And then the second part we are looking at, it's more of the business and technology architectures. And this is where, uh, in some of the observations, we saw that the business, either the, uh, either the business goes too slow and then it's, it fails because it, it can't fulfill the needs of the market or it grows too fast and then it heads into cash flows problems and then closes shop. And then on the technology architecture, it's where a company starts off, it has the base, the base for, uh, of the foundational technology, but a year or two, the technology cannot support its growth and it's in a continuous way of, uh, or rather a continuous upgrade or costly upgrade of its technology that to the detriment of its growth. So in that case, we look, we, we're trying to look at, is there a way uh, from inception that, or from startup that the business and technology architectures can be implemented or can be, as attained with some level of, uh, or rather can be determined with some level of certainty to make sure that the DTIs, or the, the digital entrepreneurs succeed. And of course, we've looked at the uh, issue of uh, non-financial support, and we want to extend that and see, is there, are there other non-financial support that are more important, say for the Cape Metro than others? 
And of course, we want lastly to look at the evolution of uh, the, these ecosystems within the Cape Metro. It's work that we've started and it's ongoing. And we would also like to partner with people who are thinking like that. And I'm sure some of these questions, for example, the formation of micro institutions that determine the success of entrepreneurs are things that we really need to investigate even for uh, cities like Kampala or Entebbe uh, and the like. So in conclusion then, uh, if we look at uh, all these, then I think that we are at a better stage now, uh, having gone through COVID, uh, having gone through the failure of some of uh, our earlier successful tech companies to start looking at why they fail and probably using the micro institution or the environment to see why they did not succeed and uh, build for the future. I will end there. I think I've exceeded my time by about two minutes. And my contacts are there. That's my email address. And I'm not so active on Twitter. So, but I, you can tweet me on that and I will respond. Thank you very much. Okay, in the meantime, I'll check uh, if there is any question directed to me. Ladies and gentlemen, if there are, if there are questions for Jira, we can passing on, then the attend student because he wants to leave. Questions for Dr. Njenga. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Njenga, for that. Uh, there's something you put forward as a question. Uh, let's say, what are the certain things may not be done in a certain parts of the world or Africa while in other places they can be successful? You give an example of something failing in Nintendo, and if you take it to Cape Town, it actually works out. Uh, I personally have an opinion that sometimes it's about systems and policies. Uh, there are some countries that are maybe good at putting up systems and policies, but are so poor at following them and putting them. While others are good at it, and they actually look what they are doing, and 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 they are uh, but also, I uh, think that uh, you can have the best policies, but in the yeah, macro level, you don't have the market or the people who can really engage with your innovation. So uh, th that's the other point we, we're trying to look at. Are there certain market conditions or uh, market opportunities that exist that are more appealing to certain tech startups, even beyond the policies. So, and then also uh, there's the issue of talent. What kind of talent uh, is conducive for the kind of tech startup that that particular entrepreneur wants to bring about. So if we look at talent and market and policies maybe, or there quite, could be quite a number of issues that we need to really consider. Thank you.
Thank you, Doc. Uh, for yes, uh, Dr. James. Yes, it's uh, Dr. Yankama here. Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, very insightful. I had initially typed uh, the question in the chat room, but allow me to present it. Okay. Uh, how do we address the issue of bandwidth and other connectivity disparities in Uganda and Africa? Thank you. Okay, so uh, there are a number of ways uh, to look at the issue, uh, the question of connectivity. Uh, the first one is looking at connectivity as we look at other public infrastructure. And that is uh, if uh, we want to improve on our logistics, like uh, it was earlier discussed, we have to have uh, good road networks, and then the responsibility of that road network uh, becomes uh, part of our development agenda. And therefore, we could have uh, partnerships uh, between government and the private sector to lay down the communication or the internet infrastructure. The other one uh, is where we look at the uh, places, uh, or rather the, the funding mechanism and licensing mechanism that have, uh, have been put about by government on the expansion of the internet and internet infrastructure and connectivity. So in most countries that I've read about, they have some form of the universal connectivity fund where for any person or any uh, company to get license for internet connectivity, they must uh, show how they are extending the connectivity to other remote, to either remote areas or far areas that are not economically viable. And in so doing, then uh, we can grow the infrastructure not only in those places where it's economically viable, but also in those other places that, that are remote. Okay, and the other thing that uh, we could do, and maybe we did it uh, when we didn't have so much bandwidth, was to uh, limit or shape the kind of uh, traffic that uh, comes into the network. Although that's, uh, that's draconian, and that's uh, what, uh, or what we say it's against the principles of the internet. But in institutions where it, it, it's maybe the fair things, the thing to do is to do that. So uh, in response then I'll say, the first thing is uh, to make sure that we prioritize the connectivity investment. The second thing is to look at the, our policies in regard to connectivity and especially universal connectivity when we're licensing the providers and three, uh, if the first two fail, is to look at ways of shaping uh, the whatever little bandwidth we have so that we can uh, equitably use it. Okay, any other question? Any other question from the floor?
and innovation ecosystems is Dr. Moses Gorova. He will be joining us later. Gentlemen, we proceed with the next presenter. And uh, the topic is finance. Can financial inclusion be the solution? Can financial inclusion be the solution? The answer to that question will be provided by Associate Professor Ruth Rumi, a lecturer in the Department of Accounting and Finance in Kumba University and uh, the discussant is Mrs. Viola Asimwe, a lecturer in the same department, Accounting and Finance in Kumba University. Ladies and gentlemen, Associate Professor Dr. Richard Virgobi is a lecturer in the Department of Accounting and Finance at Nkumba University. He holds a PhD in Business Administration and Banking from ES Missouri USA University of Rand Hansen Kessel in Germany. He has a Master's in Economics and Cooperatives from Trips University at Marburg University Germany and the Bachelor's in Science Economics and Cooperatives from the same university, plus a diploma in Cooperative Management from Uganda Cooperative College, Bukalasa. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Richard Mumubi has lectured in the field of entrepreneurship and banking for very many years and has authored very many papers in the same area. He is the person grounded to take us through this topic, financing for the agricultural sector for the digital era. Can financial inclusion be the solution? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to present to you Associate Professor Richard Mirimubi this afternoon. You must welcome Prof. Um, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much, Chair. Uh, all protocol observed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very much honored for being invited uh, to give a paper on financial, on financing the agricultural sector in the digital age. Can financial inclusion be a solution? Um, first of all, I want to thank the Dean of the School of Business and Information Technology for having chosen such a good topic saying the state of business and management in the digital age. In the digital age. Uh, this is something very, very important for us as a school and as a university. Because we teach students to go out there and start their own businesses. People have been talking about entrepreneurship. Not only starting the businesses, but going out to manage those businesses. But now one asks me, Ask and ask, why are some of the students who are, whom we have trained not going out there and start these businesses? Is it because they don't have any information? We are already in the age, we are already in the digital age, and that gives us information. The information takes you to learning. 
From planning, you get your objective. Okay? Then from there, you know how to control your business. But why are they not doing that? We have the managers. What are the managers doing? Because we have already trained. Eh? Professor Mande said it very well that some of us go out there and we become corrupt. So are we teaching managers who are becoming corrupt? So that, those are the questions uh, before I start my presentation. Um, why did I uh, decide on the agricultural sector? Uh, according to UBUS, we have different sectors. We have trade, we have agriculture, we have manufacturing, we have construction, and we have services. But to me, I find agriculture to be the most important because we are all here today. You have not yet eaten. If you don't get food, you are going to complain. Where is the food? Where has it come? Because the farmer may not have brought it. So agriculture is playing a very, very important role in our life. That's why I thought about it. Number two, I thought about financing. Can you sit here without one shilling, without a dollar, in your pocket? How are you going to move from here? So financing becomes a very important thing. Then the digital age. We need information. Who is going to tell you where that food is? We have Jumia. They have been sending things. You can, you can order anything you want because of information. So that's why I came up with a talk, uh, which is in my area, in our school, which is dealing with financing, which is, deal, which is dealing with financing, the agricultural sector, in the digital age, can financial inclusion be a solution? Um, oh, it's very good, you are presenting there. Okay, um, now uh, this topic, when it was presented, they said we are supposed to look at the developing countries, and I started with the developing countries, and Uganda belongs to that club of developing countries, which have various characteristics, which are pertinent to my topic here. One, financially, our country is not doing well. When it comes to the agriculture sector, <clears throat> we're in subsistence, okay? We just grow food for our, for our own stomach. Why are we not processing that food, okay? To get more money. When it comes to finances, you find very few people are involved. Some of us don't even have bank accounts, okay? What we have is wallet banking. Others call it breast banking, okay? Others call it socks banking. Why are we not embracing that? We have had uh, financial institutions came in Uganda, 1906. And by the way, they even never came for we the Africans. They, for us, they came because of the Europeans, okay? Because of the Indians. And actually, if you open a bank account, you have to go through an Indian. And that actually has even persisted. Even today, if you go in a bank and you find somebody, and you find the European there, don't be surprised to be pushed away and they serve that guy first. Okay? So now our people have shied off. They say, well, since these people running banks, financial institutions, don't trust us, why should I put my money there? Now we start asking ourselves, why financial exclusion? It has been there. And we are going to see how to move along. So now we are saying that uh, in our developing countries, literacy has been a problem. Our people are not financially literate. So that makes them go away and especially our people in the agricultural sector. 
Huh? You find 70 percent, they're living in rural areas. These people don't have information. They don't even understand quality, what to produce. They only produce what they want, and when it's over, could be the literal, they say it. Um, in Uganda, we have around three small older subsistence farmers who account for 70% of Uganda's export earnings and who also provide materials for the agro-based industries. But the question is, they are producing 70%, okay, contributing to that. Now, how much money is allocated to the agricultural sector by the government? Well, the government is the driver. The government has already committed itself to tell the Ministry of Agriculture. It's there. It has the Ministry of Finance. It's finance. Okay? It has got banks, financial institutions. Why are they not doing well? Why are our farmers all the time crying that they are not being facilitated? Is it because of not embracing the digital age? Can you please flash the digital age? Okay. Is it because they don't get that information? Can you continue? Yeah. That could be, could be the problem. Because you can see through Uh, you can see that the internet connection, actually we are in Uganda now, as of 1st January 2021, we are around 46, 46 million, uh, where you find that people were accessing the internet, or were around 12 million, okay? And those are mostly in urban areas, which are around 26.2%. Now, then you find that the mobiles, eh, mobile we have 28 million, okay? Those are mobile phones. And those are 60.3%. But now, when I made a comment somewhere where I'm saying that 738 Uganda, there's a gap which should be filled, okay? Now, we are seeing a problem here of information. And we are very pleased that we have the digital age, which we should actually embrace and operationalize. But do we have the opportunities? Yeah? Being digital is a choice. You can understand. I know that some of us who don't even have, who don't need smartphones, say me, I don't want it. It's your choice. And just like a choice to be rich or to be poor. Okay. Now, what are the opportunities now for the digital age for promoting business and management? Actually, overall, let me take one way, but let me tell the developing countries, but for us now in Uganda, okay? But before that, do we really have a need? Is there a need? Because I'm saying it is a choice for you to decide. Yes, there is. Because we want, if we, if we are digital, di digitalized, uh, we can allow easy access, okay, to virtual meetings. For example, now, okay, we have not walked to South Africa, we have not gone to UK, we have not gone to the US, but we are accessing our people. And that is wonderful. But we have taken a choice to do that, okay? We could even now, as we are carrying it out, have had even better machines. But we have said, no, let us have this. It's your choice, okay? Um, we think about um, the opportunities. What are there? <coughs> Training is a very big opportunity for us because we want to embrace this digital age to be able to run our businesses, 
and to be able to become good managers. Okay? We have, like we in Uganda here, we have the majority of the youth. Okay? They, they, they're interested in computer. They're interested in this or whatever, uh, these uh, gadgets, using them. And again, we also have our country, Uganda, which is embracing the connectivity to power grid. They want every Ugandan to have electricity. We shall come to the challenges there. I know some of you now are saying, are we all connected? <clears throat> then, um, digital innovations, smartphones, it's an opportunity. We have accelerated e-business, okay? We have companies, we have investors who are coming to these countries, okay? Those are an opportunity for us, okay? We have, they are coming here, some day we want partnerships. But the unfortunate thing is that there are those who come, they just want to do the thing alone. And I, I don't think that is right. We have the opportunity of having partners whom we can work with. So that when they go, we can take over. But of course that has to do with the government policy. We have the ICT policy. And it states very well that they want to have everybody in Uganda to be uh, digital inclusive. They say everybody. Now, what is the problem? Is it the policy? Is it the implementation? The government has got good things in mind, okay? Books have been written. Okay? Uganda's vision, mission, and strategic objectives of the fourth industrial revolution. Okay? By SWAP. Okay? It's stating that. We are stating that in Uganda that we need to embrace the digital age. But how are we going to operationalize it to be at that level? Sometimes we are crying. We say, well, in Europe we are doing better than we. Why are we not also doing better than them? Why are we not making our own apps which we can embrace? Why do, I, why do I have to wait for an app? come from UK or from, from US. Because you are bringing these people here, then you are allowing them, okay, to do business here, which you would have done. Now, why don't you have a policy that let us partner with these people so that we can do business with them and we manage our institutions with them. Embracing change is another opportunity. Where we have our people, we are very humble Ugandans, we accept change, but change should not break you, okay? But some of us, we are reluctant to change. Why? When you are bringing that type of technology, did you ask me? But why I won't say no, I don't need to ask you. This is my place, this is my country. I can do what I want. If you don't want power, so, embracing change is an opportunity for us, for the digital age, whereby we can be able to promote our businesses and our good management. But, the point is here, we have the formal groups and the informal. Now, if the informal are more, that change may not come and may come with problems. Now, why are we doing that? Can we go to the next one? Um, we are doing that because at the end of the day, when our agricultural sector is well financed, the farmers have got the right information. Then, at the end of the day, we shall embrace financial inclusion. Okay? We are, as, as I already said, we have so many people down there okay, who are lacking that information. They are not poor as such, but they are poor at getting that information. And some of us, when we get that information, we keep it. 
which is very unfortunate. Now, with financial inclusion, it requires, first of all, uh, to be financially literate. Okay? We are talking about literacy. By the way, if you cannot know how much you have got, how much you are taking out, actually you are financial illiterate. You are illiterate. Because you don't know what you have. Okay? So we are saying here, we have to embrace financial literacy for financial inclusion. And by the way, that is actually the ease, the financial inclusion, is the ease of access, availability, okay, of penetrating a financial system with the members of the economy, okay? Are you included? Okay? If you are not included, now let us think how we are going to include you. Now, we are also very blessed uh, with this financial inclusion because in 2011, uh, there was a Maya declaration. Maya declaration. Uh, this Maya declaration for the, was attended by all the Africans, and then they were represented by the governors of central banks. And they all agreed that we want to have our communities in our respective countries embracing financial inclusion. Okay? This was a great point. But since 2011, what target has Uganda set? Say, by, could be uh, okay, the other said somewhere that by 2020 we get 20 percent. But we are still having a lot of people in in there who are not include, include, included in the financial affairs. Actually, some of them could be. I'm not saying they're carrying on what a trade, but I think it's still there somewhere. Then the national we have a national financial inclusion strategy. 2017-2022. Uh, this one was uh, also done by Bank of Uganda together with the Ministry of Finance. It's very good. Stating all these very good things, okay? How Ugandans should embrace financial inclusion. Now, financial accessibility. It's another very important point, okay? Now, here we have financial institutions which are creating very good programs, okay? Two, we have the government, okay? I think you have heard of things like yoga, things like one of our Why are they being carried It's because they want people to access finances. But what type of approach is that? Is that a top-down or a or down-down approach? So, we are seeing the money is there. Eh? We are seeing, but where is it? Because eh? a, a person is asking you, yes, I had this money which was given. After the talk, the money, money was given by the president. Eh? <laughs> it was in, and the LOC here was telling us, but we have never seen it. Eh? So, now, what is the problem? Eh? We are on the issue of financing the agricultural sector which is most of them in the rural areas. Yeah? And they have chances of accessing this, this money, which is given. Now, where is that money, and how are they involved? Um, one of the things on the financial accessibility, I think we can make a plan, is not only thinking of the older people or the working class, because the working class are going to go away. Those who are working will also go away, and others. But what about the children? When you talk about financial accessibility, are they, are they embracing that? For us, we don't think about that. It is that child, that baby, whom you give the 1,000 children, the 5,000, by the end you take it away to buy a sweet. And the sweet is destroying the teeth. And then you're going to the doctor to treat you, and you're spending money which you don't even have. 
Now you start begging. But you have the chance. Now the same thing. If those students had got that money, why would we invest it in agriculture? Because that one is going to bring to create what? More production. Um, we also have the agricultural financial inclusion policy. Yeah. Uh, the Minister of Advice has that one. Okay? It's also there. So on financial inclusion, we really have the points there which we have agreed on, but unfortunately have not been implemented to the satisfaction of our people. Challenges. <coughs> um, what would be the challenges now? We have said we have got very good blueprints. Do we read them? If we read them, in which language are they? Some of them are in English, we don't understand. Have they been translated in local languages for us to understand? The, the finances, they are inadequate. If the finances have been set, yes, we can now, we are very happy the government is giving some money to, to go down there. But is everybody going to get it? So you find there are some preferences uh, we shall give A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D may not get, yeah, okay? So there is inadequate result of funding. <clears throat> but when it comes, I had we're talking about entrepreneurship. You see, when you're starting an enterprise, you don't have to worry whether you have cash or not. You already have your capital, which you got at birth, and your capital is your brain. The word capital, Latin, okay? Brain. You have your brain to use. That's what we say. You can even start any type of enterprise without putting in any money. But have we put that down to our children to understand it? Even we who are here, we may not even understand it. And challenges, skills. Do we have skills in financial literacy? Record keeping? Okay. Um, Records management skills, those are issues. Yeah? The skills, we have the skills to be able to manage our business, okay? To manage our own enterprises. Um, another challenge which we have is the electricity, the power grid connectivity. We have talked about that, I don't want to go back there. But the challenge here for in the digital era, as we manage our business and money, eh, we talk security. How secure is our information? You have also talked about it. Eh? The virus, the unwanted users, okay? And by the way, digital eh, era, it's, it's more vulnerable. Eh? Like now you have a flash where you put all your files, okay? But within a second, the virus is squeezed it. It's a challenge. How are you managing your computer? How are you managing those files? Okay? Then you say for us, well, we are supposed to embrace this digital era, age, because ABCD has said it. But what precautions are we putting in place? Hardware and software availability. It's a challenge. Okay? Some people don't have money to buy. We don't have the money. They are costly. And whether some of the softwares also with time they become obsolete, even the hardware. Okay. Uh, policy and legal issues. Some of them are inadequate. Okay. And actually sometimes obsolete. And whether some of these the problem also comes. Some of talk about policy here. Policy, a policy is made to suit certain people at certain times. Okay? I want not to go and put, put some money there because you know why you're doing it. Okay? People have, a, have what we call motives. Yeah? Is it a push motive or is it a pull motive? You have to think about it. Then we have 
increased share capital by financial institutions. Okay? Now, we, we are farmers, we want to be served, okay? To get to access credit from banks, but now who is coming, the regulator. The Central Bank of Uganda is saying now, we are going to increase the share capital, okay, for the banks. I remember this was done sometime back, our first April 2011. It was done. At the beginning, we had different type of uh, share capital. The locals first had 500 million, the foreigners 1 billion. Later on came 1 billion local, then foreigners 2, 2 billion foreign banks. Then later it came 4, 4, okay? 4 billion for the local uh, indigenous banks and 4 billion for, for the foreign banks. Then, now came 15 billion, okay, from the first April 2011. 5 billion for the locals and 5 billion for, sorry, 15 billion for the local, local banks and 15 billion for the foreign banks. Now, uh, just of late, they're, they're saying now, the central bank is saying that all banks in Uganda, the commercial banks, they are going to have a paid up capital of 150 billion. 150 billion. Now, here we're saying we want financial inclusion. Who is supposed to promote it? Are the what? Are the financial institutions. And when I talk of financial institutions, what am I talking about? I'm talking of the commercial banks, okay, that's in tier one. I'm talking of the credit institutions, tier two. I'm talking of microfinance, deposit taking institutions, and then I'm talking of the, the last ones down, the non banks, okay, the insurance companies, leasing companies, okay, insurance companies, okay. Now, if we are going to increase this money, okay, like now I'm saying the commercial banks have been paying 25 billion. Okay? Now they are going to 100 and 50 billion. Great institutions have been having share capital of 1 billion. Now they will be supposed to have 25 billion. Microfinance, deposit taking, by the way, okay, 500 million, they are now will be required to have 10 billion. Now, are these not going to play out? They, eh, either they match, okay? If they don't match, they will go. That's what happened. Last time with Nari Bank, taken out by Bacchus, which is now called us. But when the government says, we want to promote financial inclusion, we want to promote our agricultural resources, because that's why we're getting money for exports. Yeah? When you're doing that, but how much money are you putting in for the agricultural sector? Actually, if you look at the budget, which we had, which you have seen there, uh, our country is on the eighth place. We start with trade, uh, tra uh, the road sector, whatever it is, okay? Then you got security, you got what? Eh? I've been telling people, during COVID, all of us were not working. But what were you doing? Did you stop? You were eating. That food was coming from where? Was it coming from security? Was it coming from the road sector? Was it coming from health? Where was it coming from? From agriculture. Now that gives us a point to think twice. Which sectors are important for your life? Okay. Um, so um, I think the issue of share capital for financial institutions should be taken very, very seriously. I think we have some member parliaments who are listening to us, policymakers. We are not going to see the banks lose, okay? And then the foreign banks, because they have the capital. Ask yourself, how come banks are coming from Nigeria? 
Eh? Coming from Kenya, state of banks in Uganda. How many, how many Ugandans are having banks abroad there? But these guys are coming because they have, they have already penetrated every corner of their own countries, in villages, sub counties. Why don't we also subject here every financial institution to make sure that it has a branch in one of the villages, in one of the sub counties? But we are saying we are not going there because we are not making money. You have banks have been in Uganda for over 100 years. Tell you, can, uh, um, 1906, okay? And until we came to get the Uganda Fed and sell it to bank, 1952, which became the Uganda Commercial Bank, which has also been closed now, which you know very well. How are we supporting our indigenous banks to accelerate the drive of financial inclusion? So that we can also help our agriculturists. And how are we going to do that? We shall see that. Then uh, another point is lack of agricultural bank. Okay? These agriculturists, these farmers, they are saying that for us, we are not wanted in banks. They want people who are need. They put, uh, we put, uh, I put my money there last year. Last year, I put my 100,000. But it took me two months without going there. When I went, the account was closed. When I asked, they said, go to head office. Now the word trust is what? Is lost. Okay? Are we, have we made it easy? Have we made, is it conducive for a simple man? Even some of my students here, okay? You have, do you have a bank account? No, I don't have. What do you do? I have a mobile phone. Okay? But why don't you go to the bank and say, well, when I established a bank account, the account was closed. And by the way, the account has even been closed, they don't even tell you that we are closing the account. Okay? But, but when you're establishing that account, you got, you got a form, you fill it in, you give the telephone number, you give the email number, you give even a guarantor. They don't even consult you. So now, there's been some sort of what? Lack of trust. Now, we are saying, since we have 5.6 million members of the cooperatives, okay? We have over 2,000 cooperatives societies, and we have unions. Why don't these farmers organize themselves and set up their own bank? If we have 5.6 million members, let us take 10,000 shillings. That means they are earning money. Okay. They already have over 50 billion, whatever. But then, I'm only talking about 10,000 shillings. Somebody can buy shares of 20, 50, and quarter billion. But now, the point is, in the regulator of the financial institutions, we want to promote financial inclusion, interesting in having these farmers down there, okay, also start their own bank. Rigidity by various actors. Some people are very rigid. Some even have closed banks. They say today your bank is closing. But please can you open it? Say no, 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 no. We are so rigid. Eh? That's the rigidity. When people see it, they really start getting, put their money in banks or start anything. Are uh, inadequate products or gadgets. Now, uh, is there a policy for financial inclusion which is saying that to help everybody who is registered as ABCD to have a phone which you can pay for in installments? Because this is the way they can get access to the money. Okay. Uh, change. Some people have resisted to change. Like the farmers are very complicated people. These are the first. For they say me, I have been making my cow with hands. But we are saying, can you not change? They say no. My father was doing that and my mom. By the way, in entrepreneurship, we call those drone entrepreneurs. 
Now, this guy is well, this thing changed. Why are they doing that? Because they make a bad, bad experience. Okay? Now, um, when you come to read some of these things, um, you find one which is uh, lack of skills actually takes among the sum of the research is done 91 percent you find that uh, I know I think change takes 96 percent that's what people resist that's what you may see but people are not embracing what this digital age 96 percent has been found out then 91 percent because they lack skills you can even take an example we are in learning some people want to resist. That's why we're holding this seminar, so that people can get, you know, to know what's going on. Okay. Um. Now we have seen the financing. We have seen um, the agriculture sector. We have seen financial inclusion. Now we want to make recommendations. Actually, this seminar to me. Is telling us we have the digital era, age, uh, uh, we have the finances, but where are things not working? How can they work well? Because what is coming out here is going to be some recommendations which may go to, could be the policymakers, could be the owners of universities, and other people. Now, I would think my first recommendation. I talked about it already, was about the budget. Now, if Uganda, for example, budgeted to get 45.49 trillion Uganda shillings, okay? And then, on that money, it is only giving the agricultural sector one trillion point three. On the, it is the eighth. The agricultural sector is on the eighth. Okay? And the government knows very well that these farmers don't have people finance them. And the government knows very well that if these people produce, we shall get exports. They will export. Why are they not being supported? Why is money being debated for us to be given other sectors? That's what is my concern. So we are saying, read, orienting the national budget. Two, promulgating the national agricultural policy. There are some policies which have been done, and they are put where well, they are shared somewhere. They are collecting dust. Why do we waste money making policies which we are not going to implement? I think it's our work as a university, as we prepare and disseminate this type of seminars here, state and management of the state of business and management. Let those guys hear and let them read. But some of them, they appear to be very comfortable and uh, they are not going to be thinking about that. Another recommendation, improving access. Can we go to the next slide? Improving access to agricultural sector credit. Okay? Government should exploit the possibility of establishing an agricultural bank. I have said that. Now, that agricultural bank will serve the needs okay, of the farmers. But they're saying, well, I think we had a cooperative bank. It closed. That is history. Okay? That's about 30 years ago. Have you found out what the people want? We are talking about entrepreneurship here. You can't start any business without first going out to ask the people. Ask the people what they want, then come here and produce. That's marketing. Hmm? Marketing takes an upward in perspective, the corporate. Hmm? So the same thing with this. If we are going to start such an institution, can we go out and find out? I've told you about 5.6 million members are there. They are around. 
the sharks, there's the money lenders, are just taking advantage of them. So I think on the on the agricultural bank, I have. Can you go to the last slide? There's a slide there. Uh, can you move? Can you move a little bit? Since we're there, on the agricultural bank, can can somebody move? Move, move, move. Yes. Okay. I have suggested myself for so for financial inclusion using digital in the digital era, which is giving us information. Let us first get the number of all agriculturalists. Okay? In Uganda. These people, they can be registered. Okay? We have the ministry. We have the Ministry of Agriculture. We have Mira. We have Oya. Now, then we know who are going to be the customers. Okay? Now, all of them must be registered. Yeah? As long as they're interested in accessing funding. Now, from there, they can now join their wife. This is 5.4 dollars. Let them join their, their uh, let them start their work, the agricultural bank. Call it Agricorp Bank or whatever, I don't know. Okay? Now, also, we shall see the players in that one. Now, from there, let them decide to be able to access our money. We should have a special app, which they like a mobile, a mobile farmer's app. Okay? They can have some of you. You have your bank. There's a GFC bank here. Here you have your mobile phone. Now you can access your what? Your bank. And that's the thing you want. Now when they come here, the bank will be working with your mobile app. We'll be working with the, uh, with the farmers down there. Okay? The agricultural bank is aware because it has all the data. All the data is stored there. So if we can, if they can get their own app, I think that it can work. Can we go back? So that's what we have recommended. Then the other point which I was thinking about was the 24. Um, can we go back? The 24 stroke 7, 365 time should be on it. I, I, we have got so many institutions in Uganda. Maybe whatever it is. You call, call that institution. When you call, they have a hotline. Okay? They have a toll, a toll free line. They call it a hotline. You can call it today, tomorrow, one week, one month. What for? What does it, why, why are we doing things in a cosmetic way? If you have put things in place, make sure you follow them. Then, some of us already talked about experts. We welcome them. They are good investors, some of the brains. But how are we benefiting from them? Let us attach them to our people. Okay? So that tomorrow when they go, if, for example, now there is a man, I hear there is one coffee, coffee grower in Movende, which is very good. But how many coffee grower Africans has he trained? Yeah? as outgrowers. If tomorrow that gentleman leaves, what is going to happen? Okay. I remember uh, around our place in Fort Potro, we had Mukwano had tea. It was a tea estate. When these people left, the Asians and these, the things became bushy. Until after some years, do we want to go back in such a situation? I think we should understand our history and then we'll be able to correct, correct some of these uh, mistakes. Can we continue? Uh, another recommendation is, is we are saying that those who are handling digital information, okay, they should handle it with due diligence and care, okay? Not to play around with it. How much sure is your information on your phone? Are you sure that you have it? Somebody else has it. Hmm? How sure that our examinations here hmm? are not floating around somewhere? Okay. So we are saying that, that those handling digital data must act with due diligence and prudence in accordance with the laws, guidelines, 
code of conduct and ethical practices. Ethical practices. Yeah? I think Professor Mandy uh, dropped that home. I don't know. While committing themselves not to exchange. Hmm? Right? Don't exchange people's information. Don't sell it. Don't lease it. Don't destroy it. Okay? Without the formal permission or authority from the boss or whoever. Okay? Uh, by the way, for us who teach banking, uh, uh, this one was talked by Sapitna, the one who noted that if you, people bring their money and put it in the bank account, okay, you should be able to manage that money very well with prudence and diligence, okay? So I expect this also from the um, The illustration there, well, we have looked at it. Uh, could be we can go uh, the last part about the explaining that model, which we are trying to recommend. We as a university here, we from our webinar here, okay? If at all, I don't know what chair is saying and others. We are saying that we have the advocates. Now, who would be the stakeholders? They are the farmers, okay? Crop, livestock, fisheries, BKT, poultry, what have you. Now, what would be their roles? Right. Production, procurement, what have you. Then we have the distribution. Because we are must have, actually in India, they have done that. But I'm forgetting, I think there is something on there. Uh, we have here now, Minister of Finance should play a role. NIRA should play a role. Minister of ICT, UBOS, Farmers Associations, they should get this information, okay? But the point is, it should be a government directive. There should be a law, something must pass us through parliament to have our Ugandan registered. Even children who are, for example, born. I know it very well in Germany. When a child is born immediately, start getting the money on a monthly basis. So the child is registered. But you as a guardian, you get the money. But it is who? For that child. So the child is already digitalized, okay? He's already enjoying the, the digital age as, as a baby. But here someone's going to tell you, how can a baby get a bank account? We should not do what other people are telling us to do. It is good to decide what to do. If we find it good, let us embrace that. Then banking. I was saying, our agricultural bank uh, should be involved. Minister of Finance, Minister of Agriculture, Bank of Uganda, Uganda Women Bank, World Bank, IMF, IFAD, IFC, International Finance Corporation, um, UBA, Uganda Bankers Association, Enterprise Uganda Private Sector. They should be involved as stakeholders. Then, what would be their role huh? in agricultural financing? Coordination with other stakeholders. We are talking about networks, okay? Um, then the mobile app, okay? We must have a mobile app, okay? Because these guys to get that money. They don't need funds from Bali. They will get, uh, as long as we follow the other model, which has been recommended, I think our people down there should be able to be financed and they will be able to be also uh, digitalized, okay? and uh, become financial officials. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of my submission. Thank you. Uh, for the questions, I think that won't be handled by colleagues. Thank you. Yes. 
Associate Professor Dr. Richard Mirubi. Thank you so very much for the presentation. It was very insightful. We have learned very many things from there. One of them is that poverty is a choice. We choose either to be rich or to be poor. You made me remember my elementary economics of senior five. Uganda is poor because it's poor, discuss. So people should start discussing within themselves why they are poor and why others are rich. Thank you very much for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, I would love to suggest that we do give him a big round of applause. Hello? Good. And ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, I would request that those questions you can share them in the public chat. They will be attended to at a later stage. Right now, allow me to invite our last presenter, who is presenting topic number five on how to strengthen entrepreneurship within universities and working towards the entrepreneurial university. How to strengthen entrepreneurship within universities and working towards the entrepreneurial university. The personality presenting this topic is Dr. Ricardo Peters. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ricardo Peters is a senior lecturer at Sol Praki University in South Africa in the School of Economics and Management Sciences. Dr. Ricardo Peters holds a Doctor of Commerce in Leadership Performance and Change from the University of Johannesburg. He holds a Master's in Business Leadership from the Minnesota School of Business Leadership and the Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Western Cape. He teaches management and entrepreneurship modules. Dr. Peters has gained extensive experience in the private sector and academia and has served on various committees and boards. He has supervised PhDs to completion and published numerous articles, particularly in the areas of entrepreneurship. He has also extensively examined masters and doctoral thesis and has presented papers at various local and international conferences. Dr. Peter Ricardo has in the past organized and hosted international conferences on entrepreneurship and management and has also been involved in various exit programs, including having taught entrepreneurship at Jeep's International Business School in Sweden, on the Linus Farm Partnership at Han University in the Netherlands. Dr. Peter Ricardo has actively been involved in the development of new research projects and programs with a strong focus on community development and upliftment. He has also been involved with the development of academic programs over the last 10 years. Ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome Dr. Peter to present to us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will be sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, Doctor. 
Thank you very much. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, first of all, let me say thank you for a very informative session thus far. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, strategies for strengthening entrepreneurship, particularly in higher education institutions. Um, this is not the research project that I've been involved in. I thought that I would share with you what I call a lived experience um, in promoting entrepreneurship in higher education over the last couple of years or attempting to promote entrepreneurship. And um, my focus will, will be from the, from the perspective of um, currently we see, and, I, and, and, I, and I, I see it in South Africa, and I know it's, it's prevalent in the rest of Africa, we, we uh, our, our, our higher education institutions are faced with dilemmas such as lack of or dwindling or, or reduced budgets that we need to do more with less. Um, this is quite prevalent in South Africa, and I and I and I and I suspect it is prevalent in the rest of Africa and probably the world also, where universities are expected to do more with less. Um, the VC this morning in his in his presentation alluded to we can't do this alone, and that resonated with me. And um, I will be talking about. Um, the role of universities in terms of using entrepreneurship but also engaging with other partners in terms of government, industry, social organizations, citizens, other academia, and etc. Now, ladies and gentlemen, also today in our presentation, uh, many of the speakers alluded to the state of affairs in Africa. We find high levels of unemployment, high levels of poverty, and my view is, and um, some of you may or may not agree, but my view is that if we want to be, if we want academics of excellence, if we want to be world renowned, I always say, start by addressing the issues that is faced by your communities, right? So as an institution, it is a, as an institution operating in a particular area, it is incumbent on us to fundamentally make a difference to the communities that we serve. And that does not just mean being inwardly focused. It also means that we need to uh, go beyond just the teaching and learning and research. We need to ensure that we have mechanisms in place that ensures that our universities reaches out to make fundamental differences within our communities, that we produce research of relevance that also speaks to addressing the social ills that our, um, our, our, our communities face. So I've said two things. Universities are faced with having to do more with less in terms of budget cuts and resource constraints. I've also mentioned that in, in Africa, in many of our communities, we are seeing high levels of poverty and inequality. And I've said that, that it's, it's incumbent on our institutions that we make a or play a fundamental role in changing that situation. I think it was Professor Mandu who said that uh, you must give back. As institutions, ladies and gentlemen, it is even tougher for us now. It cannot just be a situation of us uh, producing uh, graduates uh, and uh, tackling research issues. We need to also make sure that those issues are relevant, the communities we serve, and that they also, um, uh, the work that we do is impactful and making fundamental changes. Um, just another another caveat on, on, on entrepreneurship. I mean, it has also been mentioned this morning, and I, 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 I was, I was, I was, I was enjoying it when I listened to many of the speakers refer to entrepreneurship being a mindset. Um, I've been grappling with the pro with the issue of in my research in entrepreneurship on tackling tackling poverty, inequality, and uh, uh, wealth inequality, especially if you look at the South African 
context where you have a large proportion of the population that is uh, not sharing in the majority of the wealth as a consequence of past regressive measures. So all these issues, I, I said it before and I, I'll say it again, we are sitting on a ticking time bomb if these things are not addressed or we don't put mechanisms in place to address these issues. And as institutions of higher education, it's incumbent on us to, as I mentioned before, to tackle these issues. And so for me, um, entrepreneurship, ladies and gentlemen, um, the term is broad, but to me it also means changing the mindset, changing the mindsets of people, our students. Um, a lot of the topics today was in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, these going forward, um, I've been involved in talks before and conferences where these issues, preparing our students for, 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 for what lies ahead, what's come to there already. And I think if you think about COVID, for example, it's been ushered in even quicker with having, uh, having institutions going, uh, moving online and having to use other forms of mechanisms to engage with, um, uh, with our students. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've put, uh, first of all, I want to say that um, it is incumbent that universities strongly start engaging with uh, our partners, other stakeholders in government, in industry, in social organizations, and even citizens. Um, this research even started back in the 80s with a triple helix model. And I think it's now the quadruple or the quant quantuple uh, model that is even extended to include, um, as I've got over here, social organizations and citizens. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking to you about, um, as I said, my lived experience in terms of uh, taking a, uh, 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 taking uh, entrepreneurship and, 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 and working towards embedding it into uh, a university uh, setting. And I will run through some slides as to how um, um, I've focused on it in the past. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, my perspective is always that sometimes we are faced with limited resources. Resources. So how do we how do we go about doing these things? So let me start. So first of all, ladies and gentlemen, the first point I want to make is that, um, unfortunately, at many institutions, you know, we talk about entrepreneurship. Everybody speaks that. Everybody talks the talk. But very very few institutions actually walk the walk. You know where we've um, uh, included not just uh, talk, but actively with this buying from senior management to support the adoption of entrepreneurship across the university. Um, I, I, I put that point first because I think when we start off, um, we need to realize that there needs to be buy-in from senior management to support a university working towards uh, and I say I use the term uh, entrepreneurial university very loosely because um, there could be universities that are engaged in entrepreneurial activities, but uh, obviously at, at, at different stages. So the first, uh, the second point uh, that uh, I, I, I noted was that if you're having um, uh, um, driven by the commerce faculty, obviously, because uh, this is hosted by the commerce faculty today. But also from from my my my, my experience, um, so you 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 sitting in a position as let's say as the dean of a commerce faculty or the director of, of a school, and how do you go about um, starting to raise prospective third stream income? Um, what I've noticed in the past that that worked well was the introduction of short courses consulting services to, to, to small, medium, and government organizations, research projects. In, in essence, what I'm trying to say is, ladies and gentlemen, in order for us to, to, to promote the academic project, there needs to be a focus on, in addition to the other sources of income that we receive, to also start focusing on means that we can generate uh, income streams. Um, introduction of management development programs, short professional programs, these things can all add to developing that income stream. Another point I want to make that is important is that uh, if entrepreneurship is important uh, uh, and 
clearly set out in the uh, the strategic documents of the university. I believe that there should be an effort to uh, embed entrepreneurship within the curriculum across all faculties. That could be maybe a long-term goal, but obviously in the commerce faculty um, to start embedding um, uh, uh, entrepreneurship in, uh, in, in, in the first day of all in the commerce faculty, but uh, in the, at a previous university where I've been before, um, it is also offered, for example, in the dental faculty, because if you consider um, many people who become medical doctors and dentists, they run their own practices. So these are the type of skills that they need. Um, yes. So also important, ladies and gentlemen, is um, if I think back to one of my um, previous strategies, and also it was a situation of having very limited resources. And um, we identified particular uh, professors that were internationally and nationally uh, 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 renowned for entrepreneurship uh, and uh, people with the likes of Professor Mike Morris from, uh, he was at Florida State University. Um, I think he's now at Notre Dame. He's the, he brought the Entrepreneurship Empowerment South Africa program to to South Africa, uh, Professor Tami Mazwai and uh, and other other renowned professors in the area of entrepreneurship. What we basically did was, um, because there was lack of resources, we uh, offered these people extraordinary professorships. And um, one of the strategies that I noted that worked well is that many of, of them would 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 prefer the, the accolade as, a pay, as opposed to, let's say, for example, being paid to come because um, they've already done very well for themselves. And obviously many of, of, of these uh, eminent persons are more than willing to assist. And uh, at, at that stage, we had six extraordinary professors that could consult to us and assist us in developing um, our entrepreneurial strategy for the university. Uh, from that also emanated uh, hosting symposiums and international and local conferences that attracted the likes of um, people like Zoltan X from London State, uh, sorry, London School of Economics. And um, I mean, if I look at my publications and my citations, I think I could be around four, five hundred. I speak at the, very much on the correction. His was around 68,000 which was, if you compare to many people, for example, in South Africa and Africa, that uh, that, that type of uh, uh, citations and the level of research output is obviously uh, 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 a, 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 a wonderful means of attracting uh, uh, people to your conferences and your symposiums. We also introduced, ladies and gentlemen, if you think about, if I speak about, uh, my my historical home ground of the Western Cape, um, where you had many financial institutions having their their headquarters, um, and also many people coming from universities, going to universities uh, uh, in the Western Cape, for example, coming from very poor communities. We developed programs like Yep, uh, the Young Investors Program, and these, in collaboration with some financial institutions gave students the opportunity to uh, learn how to trade online. Um, if you think about it, uh, nowadays with technology we have available, um, these is what, the, this is one of the, the needs you can train people from anywhere in the world. And also, if, if, if you also think about being from, a, from, from an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, once somebody has learned how to train, trade shares, uh, equities, uh, derivatives, foreign exchange, forex uh, trading, uh, you're essentially equipping them with a skill that they can use um, anywhere, uh, just having access to a computer and the internet. And with a company called Coronation in, in South Africa, we uh, gave uh, a couple of, uh, well, about 40 students a stipend, and then they were allowed to, they were first trained and um, a mentor, and uh, then they also started trading for themselves. And I've heard spectacular stories of some students doing very well for themselves. And now, given the fact that 
um, we have high levels of, of unemployment and we have uh, many corporates growing, growing, albeit jobless growing. They're not employing more people or they, they, they're finding other means to get along. And as we're all aware, with the fourth industrial revolution, if you take, for example, in the banking sector, you find many of the jobs becoming obsolete um, as, as more online platforms are being introduced and uh, et cetera. So these type of skills, ladies and gentlemen, um, also empowers people to, uh, to, 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 with skills that they can use, that can also generate an income for them, uh, other than, let's say, just uh, looking for a job in the formal sector, even though informal sector. Um, I've mentioned before, ladies and gentlemen, it cannot just be a case of being inwardly focused. It needs to be focused on, um, inwardly focused, I mean, uh, focusing on just the research and just the teaching and learning on the academic project. Universities nowadays, uh, even the research that we produce, I'm of the view that it has to be uh, meaningful, impactful. Um, it has to make a fundamental or bring about fundamental change in communities. Um, I've in the past been involved with uh, projects where we've interviewed um, thousands of SMEs in, the, in, in South Africa and uh, much of that work could, could have or was used uh, to write uh, uh, papers and inform government policy. One of the papers actually won a best paper award at an international conference in New York a few years ago. And um, there were 58 different nationalities uh, present at this uh, conference. And uh, though the work was uh, elementary in nature in the sense that we went out, we interviewed uh, businesses and their constraints to growth and what was inhibiting growth and uh, such factors. Uh, it was informative because uh, there, were, there weren't any studies of that nature done uh, at that time and at that scale. Um, I also said that, uh, well, this is, this is uh, probably a more, uh, uh, I would say, contagious issue, but should the university introduce an innovation center? Many of your top universities will have innovation centers. Uh, if you've got, uh, let's say, wanting to commercialize research, if you wanted to patent products or, or ideas, um, but also what about those universities that don't have those type of uh, initiatives that are maybe more focused on the informal economy? How could that uh, 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 be of uh, an issue? So uh, it, it's not necessary that you have to have, for example, an innovation center. Then I also spoke, ladies and gentlemen, about when you recruit academics, um, particularly in the area of entrepreneurship, I'm of the view that, and I've seen many of them before, um, and I'm not trying to uh, downplay anybody at this stage. I mean, many people have come through the ranks uh, from straight from uh, undergraduate degree, done a master's, a PhD in, um, let's say, for example, entrepreneurship. And um, they don't have any experience in actually being an entrepreneur. Um, being an entrepreneur to me is also, as I mentioned before, it's a lived experience. And uh, that obviously, uh, if you can get somebody that uh, um, comes with that experience, it obviously does bring a different element to, to, to your staff complement. But the, the nice thing about education is obviously that we can also learn and we have the resources available that can empower us today to, to learn the lessons learned from entrepreneurs. Then I also believe, ladies and gentlemen, that um, if people are uh, expected to be entrepreneurial, meaning that how you work with the resources, um, how you uh, conduct yourself in terms of your work, uh, I've seen many times, ladies and gentlemen, a simple example in a university environment that I've been exposed to before, um, because everything is highly regulated and, uh, you know, budgets, for example, for a, um, a, a, a a simple thing like a plane ticket, let's say it's twenty thousand, and uh, and you if if if, the, if you went directly to the vendor, you could get it at half the price. Um, I'm not saying that's a very simple example, but that is also an example of how do we incentivize pe people to start thinking about saving uh, resources for the institution. 
And I think uh, institutions of higher learning will probably save a lot of uh, funds, obviously done in the right way, if they can conduct their business more as a business uh, and less as a, as a, bu uh, a bureaucratic uh, uh, or highly bureaucratic uh, institutions as, as most higher education institutions are run. Um, I also uh, put this uh, part in here in terms of teaching and learning. Um, uh, the introduction of the fourth industrial revolution, ladies and gentlemen, um, and I, th I think many of the speakers today alluded to the fact that uh, we, as entrepreneurs operating in the in the in the, in, in, in this current uh, uh, technological phase, phase, the fourth industrial revolution, where innovation has become the talk of the town. Um, you know, if you're going to start a a spaza shop, for example. Um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing because there's different levels of entrepreneurial activity, but if you wanted to grow, um, you need to embrace the fourth industrial revolution. You need to embrace innovation, right? You need to in, in, embrace ICT. And um, one of the questions that, all, that was also raised by one of the participants is um, somebody who, st who couldn't start a business in, uh, I think it was Kampala, but they started in Cape Town. If you think about it, um, and I, I always remember the words of Warren Buffett, where he said that, unfortunately, where you, uh, where you are raised, where you are born in the area that you, that you, that you, that you start your business, it, that environment does count. Um, Elon Musk, who's a very, very well-known um, uh, entrepreneur in, in America, He's a South African, born South African, but I don't, well, let me not say I don't think, I, I, I question if he would have had the same level of success in South Africa had he started his uh, Tesla business here. I don't even know if he, if he, if he was, if it was Tesla existed before he started, but I don't even know that option would even, even have been available to him. So these factors do play uh, a big role and, um, and, 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 um, and that is why um, the fact that I'm saying we must embrace uh, 4IR, these issues is because um, these are the issues that make the, the world a global, a global village. Um, we can reach and we can move around much easier nowadays with the te technology available. Continue strong focus on network building and internationalization. Um, if you don't, and I, I, like I say again, once I speak from uh, an entrepreneurial perspective in a higher education environment and building continuous strong linkages with other stakeholders and other academic institutions, um, sending our students abroad. I mean, I know the complications of having to send students abroad because if you think about the US or Europe in terms of even exchange rates, it's expensive. It's quite uh, cheap for for Americans, for example, to send students to Africa, but vice versa, it's, it's a different story. But to be able to give our students that exposure uh, uh, two weeks or six weeks at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a foreign university, it also one of the means of opening up uh, their, um, their view of the world, the eye of the world, and also maybe even them changing their mindset as to how things need to be done. Um, uh, certain universities also that I've been involved with in the past um, has a strong focus on before you can graduate in terms of an entrepreneurial qualification, you must um, have started a business and ran it for a certain period of time and you must have had a certain level of success. Um, my presentation is very short, ladies and gentlemen, but my aim, the aim of my exercise was to... Um, inculcate or to reinforce the importance of working towards uh, becoming a more entrepreneurial university. And as I, as I said before, um, the level at where your universities are, is, it's different for different institutions, but um, going forward in terms of, as I said, tackling uh, the situation with many universities, and I think probably most of them in Africa and around the world would say with uh, limited limiting resources, and more demands being placed on, on higher education institutions. It's imperative that we start thinking more entrepreneurially. Thank you very much.
Good sir, Ricardo. We thank you very much. The presentation by Dr. Ricardo, and uh, he has mentioned that we live in a period of life that is permeated by change, and we should be able to embrace change at all levels. He has mentioned that uh, we live in an age where technology is changing by day, but a lot of institutions still have whiteboards and chalkboards. We must be innovative and entrepreneurial in teaching approaches. Approaches. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, let me request Madame Viola to come and uh, discuss for us financial financing for the agricultural sector for the digital era. Can financial inclusion be a solution. The discussant for how to strengthen entrepreneurship within universities and working towards the entrepreneurial university is Mr. Ziwa Akram, the lecturer in the Department of Computing and Information Technology. Madam Fayora, you're most welcome. I'll give you 10, 10 minutes. Sorry, the microphone is off, but I think I can start as we wait for as we wait for the IT person to put it right. Uh, I'm here to discuss a uh, uh, presentation by uh, Professor Richard Mumubi, um, financing for the agriculture sector for the digital era. Can financial inclusion be a solution? Uh, I'll brief this up by saying <clears throat> uh, this is more like uh, finding the unbanked, the Ugandan agriculturists who are unbanked, and also uh, trying to move away from the brick and mortar into what we call e-banking. Um, you should realize today that Uganda has agriculture as the mainstream of its economy and it also contributes about 50% of Ugandans a total export earning. Moreover, the agricultural sector is heavily hinged on smallholder farmers who live in rural areas and mainly survive on subsistence farming. So uh, what are the characteristics of the smallholder farmers? Uh, many of them have uh, small plots of land um, they also have small startup capital that was addressed by Professor. And they also have, they basically use the startups as methods of farming. And they also have limited access to finance, as uh, uh, limited access to finance for reasons of expansion and growth. And these smallholders, smallholder farmers, also have very small productivity levels. So what is the status quo for the Ugandan agriculture sector? Um, to add on what Professor uh, talked about, uh, we should remember that 20% uh, 20, 20 of the agriculturists in Uganda actually use the informal channels of access to finance, uh, while the 22% are financially excluded. We should also remember that 44% of the Ugandan agriculturists are not saved or banked, and that is why we are looking at financial exclusion as a problem for the agriculture sector. So where is the problem? Where are we getting the growing pains within the agriculture sector? The Bureau of Statistics latest census shows that only about 20% of the Ugandan households uh, have functional accounts. So where is the 80%? This is really a very big problem when it comes to financing access and credit for the agriculture sector. And what has the financial sector, that is the banks and the insurance companies, done to make sure that they actually bring on board 
the excluded population. Why do we have the 20% uh, only for the financial inclusion? Uh, we should uh, take it that 80% of the many banks in Uganda actually are located in the um, urban centers or urban areas and this is where not agriculture is done. Agriculture is in the, in the upcountry areas, it is in the urban, sorry, it is in the rural areas. So we actually have a problem that most of these financial services are accessed from the urban centers while agriculture is actually practiced in the uh, rural areas. This creates a gap and that is why we probably have few customers for the banking sector. Why is it that uh, most of these agricultures are actually not banked? Of course, there is inadequate branch network coverage in the rural areas. Then we also have many of these farmers uh, practicing smallholder farming. Yes. So it makes really financing difficult for them. is that farmers cannot move longer services even if uh, the bank is actually doing something to introduce probably agency banking these farmers the agency bankers are still in the small towns where the agriculturists cannot go to access the services and of course uh, something that you cannot ignore is the high illiteracy levels with the agriculturists when you look at the percentage of the people practicing agriculture many of them are actually so when it comes to, to if I know, they are ignoring it or they don't understand what is going on, leaving a very huge gap between the agriculturists and the banking or the financial sector. So what is the role of uh, the digital age? What is the role of digital age in financial inclusion? And can it really be a, uh, can it really be a solution to the 80% we identified as the unbanked. Of course, there's a very big and uh, net, poor network coverage in the urban areas, in the rural areas, sorry, which blocks information sharing to the smallholder farmers. We also have inadequate agency network coverage where you find the agents, the agents that could be extending the financial services to the people are put in those small areas and as we have seen before, it becomes very difficult for the agriculturists to move to these centers. And of course, I'm saying this again, there's a very high illiteracy level. So, uh, regarding or going back to today's theme, can agriculture survive in the fourth industrial revolution? Can digital financing transform agriculture? This is a question that Professor Richard left to us. And um, if I consider the Pins Corporate uh, Report 2018, it shows that within the last two years, mobile money is driving the digital financial inclusion. And that is the only thing that has been pointed out for the only element driving financial inclusion. And probably because uh, the biggest population can access the mobile um, networks or the mobile phones, but not all. <clears throat> when you look at the population that is uh, banked in agriculture, we have 58 accessing financial services. But out of the 58 accessing financial services, we only have 56 actually accessing the services through the use of mobile money. So to what extent can the inclusion be for the financial services? Are banks doing enough? Are insurance companies doing enough? What is the role of the central bank in making sure that the unbanked agriculturists are brought on board? When you look at the way mobile money actually works, it has very few benefits that cannot bring everyone on board. And there are micro benefits like
have really tried, but they're not doing enough. There's a lot that needs to be done to get the agriculturists on board, to get them be able to expand and grow. And uh, depending uh, on what a professor said, the mobile app should be used or should be adopted by the financial sector to be able to address the following as probably recommendations to add on professors. One, the mobile app should be able to help the agriculturists access land because one of the things that really uh, blocks their access to financial services are the small plots of land and leased land. This time they should have land on their own which they can use as collateral to access the financial services. The other one is uh, they need the financial app to, to make them access the much needed inputs like the quality seeds and the probably fertilizers. Uh, two days ago I was watching the news and I saw a mobile app for a company that lets farmers put in their codes, put in their details and then they're able to access the seeds they need because of the problem that is coming from the container village in Kampala where uh, the farmers are buying these goods. So uh, it has been identified that many uh, farmers are buying uh, seeds that are probably expired, the, the, the chemicals are expired, the, the, the sources are not reliable and they're not doing good on the side of the farmers. But while this mobile office uh, is adopted, I believe all the quality can be put to it and then the farmers can actually uh, be able to solve some of these challenges. This mobile app still can be able to, to let the farmers access the credit and be able to save their money without any worry. Um, probably now that they're dealing with agents, sometimes the network is down, sometimes uh, there are so many other associated problems. But when you have a unified agriculture app, probably some of these challenges can be addressed. And then uh, lastly on that, I would also advise the banking sector to concentrate on what they're addressing today as bank insurance, where many farmers can actually um, rely their hope that even when challenges come like for, pan for the pandemic where most of, most of the people lost their produce through uh, the markets disappeared we would watch the news and see farmers milking uh, uh, the, the, uh, getting the milk poured into the drainage we would see uh, farmers harvesting batches of matoki for 1,500 we would see so many people uh, really lose their produce because it is not insured at all. But I believe a level can actually be uplifted into the banking sector when we have quality insurance services which can be adopted through the sector. Lastly, I just have a case in point where one in it named Sima of uh, Shema, age 42, belongs to Mushanga Sako. She praises her Sako for having developed a future link of technology which gives members uh, ability to grow and expand their business through the financial access and she, she gives evidence to have grown her poultry farm from 60 bucks to 1000 bucks just by use of mobile money. So I believe if this could be um, given a bigger platform through the financial sector, through financial sector depending, financial inclusion, yes we have uh, e banking um, being a solution to um, e-financing or agriculture financing, but I believe that banks are not doing as much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Madam Mayora, for the discussion. It was very interesting. And uh, I'm forced to believe that the combination of Dr. Mirobi and Madam Mayora in that area can move us from here, from where we are to the next level. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm suggesting that I am, uh, I've been made to understand that we, have, we shall be having a conference in November this year. If the papers that have been presented today are further developed, they could do much better in the conference 
Good afternoon, members. Yes, good afternoon, members. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, Dr. Can you hear you? You can hear me, huh? Very clear. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I have my guest here, that's why I'm asking. I wanted to share the screen. So to share the screen, uh, someone unshares. Is it okay for me to share the screen? Proceed, proceed, Sorry. Proceed, proceed. I, I was asking if it were possible to share the screen because I can see how to disable the screen sharing. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, please. So can you allow me to share the screen or I could go ahead without sharing. You can share, you can share. Doctor, you can share. I can share now. Okay, thank you. Okay, it has failed to share. I don't know why, but it's okay. okay. I think yes, you know. <laughs> I am using code and at the same time. I have a laptop and I have a phone. I'm speaking from the phone. Uh, can, can you see my laptop? Can you see it? Because the file is on the laptop. Okay, let me discuss, I think, without the screen sharing. technology uh, and This is a topic that was presented by Dr. James Njega, and the discussant is Global Moses, that is myself. The key terms here are digital technology, then innovation ecosystems. I realize that he focused so much on the innovation ecosystems, but quite obviously as part participants, we have to ask ourselves what is between digital technologies and innovation ecosystems. And that's what I was waiting to hear from him, because we have innovation, we have ecosystems, then we have innovation ecosystems. Then we needed to know the relationship between the digital technologies and the innovation ecosystems. I am, it's unfortunate. Okay, I can now share, I think. Good. Yeah. Hopefully now you can see my slides. You can see the slides now, yeah? Okay, so uh, the, the key terms there are innovation. So what is the is an innovation ecosystem and what should be the relationship between digital technologies and the innovation ecosystems. Of course, he came up with this diagram that looks at those different dimensions, the technological infrastructure, innovation infrastructure, financial infrastructure, and the policy environment. And what does that mean? Well, we have the what we want to call the entrepreneurs. Uh, but who is an entrepreneur? We have students in our universities who do wish to be entrepreneurs. But you find that in universities, there are 
detached from the government, they are detached from the industry. They are of universities, but we just stop at ideation, we write them, we get promoted. We never move those ideas from the first stage to the next stage of innovation. These ideas into products that business and um, we find that there has been innovation still. Innovation products are produced even at university level, but they never come to they never get to make to make money. So I think the idea of ecosystem is that we need to break these silos, connecting governments, universities, and the industry. So the entrepreneur should be working within that circle. Otherwise, each one of us is still working in our own silos. Those with their ideas, they are hidden within their gates, ivory towers. They, those with their money, they are also keeping their money. That's why you find that countries like Uganda, for example, we may assume that we don't have innovators or that we don't even have entrepreneurs. Because I normally ask students when I'm teaching research that if a white man was to come here and take away whatever was made by white, what is going to remain? Don't you think that we are going to remain naked? We'll see the laptops going and the smartphones, eventually our, our shirts and trousers and everything else will go. We shall go back to the Stone Age, meaning that there's no innovation in most of African countries. The question is why? So you find that some of the answers may be within this, that there's that we talked about. What about if we are in that ecosystem? Could this best research be translated into applied research every time it is worked on, or it should be on the shelves of our libraries to pile dust? Okay. So from ideation, that conceptualization which is done at the university, we take pride in publishing conceptual papers. And yet others benefit from that. There are some predators out there who are just picking the ideas that we have published and have been promoted, and they trusted that those ideas into products and they sell them back to us in these developing countries. We they call us their market. Okay. So how do we move from ideation to innovation, then next to entrepreneurship? And what is the role of that innovation ecosystem? Okay, what about if we have that kind of collaboration? Now, what would be the role of information technologies? That is the next thing I, I saw him talking about, though I realized he was, may not have looked at it from that dimension. The question is, within that innovation ecosystem, maybe you have collaborative systems. Are digital technologies drivers or enablers of the innovation ecosystems, or are they beneficiaries? Okay. So the digital technology, is it an enable or like we can have collaborative systems connecting government, universities and industry, and we can be able to align the digital technology strategies with the innovation ecosystem strategies. So uh, I don't know whether the main, the main presenter is around. I actually wanted to ask him that question. I thought it would be around at this time, point in time. But these are some of the things we look. Strategies. Companies like Huawei interact with each other, okay, in that innovative environment. Lenovo, for example, for I, when I was in Malaysia, I worked for Lenovo. Mm -hmm. Lenovo is now one of the biggest companies selling computers. Actually, it bought IBM, and I think IBM was the first company to make computers. But while working for Innova, we had so many different types of computers there. Idea parts and they, whatever they particular supporting. I was in Malaysia, but I was supporting Australia and New Zealand. But every day I would ask myself, what is Lenovo, what is China about this? It's, there's something called machine. But Inside all the chips you find most in America, all other cards, even the software running there is Windows from Microsoft. 
but this product is for China. But of course, we also had software that was helping us engineers on ground. Our bosses were in China, so if they go shoot, if there is a, an, a, 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 if there's a part that is required, you order it from China by filling in that customer relations management system. A part is shipped, shipped there, then another engineer will pick it and take the customer. Now, that was also another ecosystem, but not for innovation. That was for service delivery, okay? But this ecosystem, when you look at this Lenovo as a computer, you find that there is that ecosystem that brings Lenovo to be the best computer. Different parts made by different people and they can really work together. Even the cars we drive, you find that the car, uh, the tires are made in South Africa, the chairs are made from the other side. Now, if these people were not to call, it and then we did an engine but we don't have anything called a car that happens with Boeing it's also made by different countries in that kind of ecosystem these ecosystems we have not built them that much in Uganda and I think that's why we're having this kind of conversation as we also look at the role of technologies so I look also at the digital technologies as beneficiaries uh, we look at these are also as beneficiaries uh, even technology itself has benefited from these innovation ecosystems. So the discussion here, actually that's what I wanted to find out from Mr. James, whether uh, their research was so much on as enablers, but I realized it was so much of a driver for the innovation ecosystems. And he actually used the TO, our model in the computing world, see it. We have that technological, organizational, and environmental model. It's called the TO model. So that's what he used to look at the different factors, including technological factors, environment factors, organizational factors, which could be affecting these innovation ecosystems. Uh, but in brief, uh, what we need to appreciate and what I appreciated from that particular presentation was the need for the connectivity, which we were talking about, and how it can be embraced in our country because each part is still working in its own silos. Uh, the academia is on its own, the industry is on its own, and the government is on its own. Yes, the government, that Ministry of Technology, to help fund projects from universities because it's from universities where we we have these budding entrepreneurs all those people are talking about the Steve jobs the microsoft the biggest of microsoft these became entrepreneurs when they were still at university but if their ideas were not to get funding from government obviously they wouldn't be the entrepreneurs they are today so that is my understanding of that whole presentation and that is my simple contribution for now in the interest of time. Thank you so much. Dr. Gorova, Moses, thank you very much for the discussion. You have really simplified the work that uh, Dr. Njenga did present, and I suppose members are much better in a better position than they were in before. Innovation, innovation, innovation. A friend was challenging me recently that if you are head, place only five eggs, why do you accept your head sit on only five eggs? Can't you buy fertilized eggs more five? And you give it more five chicks, you don't change. On hatching, you'll be having ten chicks, not five chicks. Innovation. We need to scratch our heads and uh, we think better. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. let us uh, invite Mr. Zua Akram, a lecturer in the Department of Computing and Information Technology, to discuss for us how to strengthen entrepreneurship within universities and work
paper that was presented by Dr. Ricardo Peters. Mr. Zua Abram, you are most welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I thank the previous presenters on the various topics. Thanks for his uh, presentation, entrepreneurship within university and working towards entrepreneur and entrepreneur university. Uh, First of all, it's something that uh, as universities we need to embrace. We, we've been colonized and uh, we've still remained for a long time. We followed the education system that uh, which was or which has been preparing students basically to look for white collar jobs but it's time that uh, it's now in ownership um depending on the discount Uh, sorry, on the presentation by uh, he highlighted uh, the role of uh, the various stakeholders that uh, the concept of the quadruple model. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Zimo Akram has issues with the connectivity. I would love to suggest that uh, we'll go to question and answer session, and uh, at the end of it, we shall have a word or two from Wakari Registry. Madam Diana. I would love to begin with you. People give you two questions. Come and answer them as we proceed. The other members can put their questions in the chat room there. We shall extract them and we give to respective persons. Thank you. Chairperson? Person? I had a interruption the network i don't know but the host has just unmuted me. me can i continue
And continue. Oh, my network. Still talking about how uh, the different stakeholders or the players. Promotion of entrepreneurship needs to start right away from the senior management and then uh, it trickles down to the middle level managers. Um, we need to see how we can develop courses which are hands-on because currently we can talk about entrepreneurship uh, the course or as a program when you look at it critically is it um, or we are still teaching theoretical entrepreneurship for people to think about what is is happening in there thinks about how it can be blended to bring in the appreciated because uh, the, the the visual the visual kind of line mm. uh, the line be able to relate to issues which are being taught to them um at the same time yes we need to embed entrepreneurship in our curriculum because So when you look at it, the value, uh, they do talk about so many things for them uh, practically. So where we need to, to embed in entrepreneurship in the curriculum, uh, we'll be looking at the key courses where we need to embed in entrepreneurship so to get this kind of exposure. Uh, Yeah, I, I, I agree of uh, maybe South Africa develop and um, uh, build linkages uh, with many strategic partners. Uh, for example, here in Uganda, we have the permission with a very strong, strong uh, partner uh, who can uh, be of help uh, when we reach at a time when we need an internship, for example, uh, because once we move away from class then when you move away from class yes where we are talking virtually but we also need to ask ourselves then from there where do we need to head ourselves where do we need to head so help us be able now to expose our learners we need a lot of um, workshops, symposiums. Uh, what I could... Mm. would agree is that within our timetable, how when management is, 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 is doing an annual calendar, where do we see ourselves as far as entrepreneurship is concerned? In terms of, uh, let me take an example. Can we have on the various stakeholders come and maybe showcase what we've been doing within the course of the year? The and how do they uh, maybe maybe the university? This is, this is where we passed through. And then so that maybe you can also get excited about Mm. 
the whole process. And so management should be thinking about how Reggio uh, put this one on our calendar. Uh, then the research output. You know, research is, is mm -hmm. meant to... inform policy to ask ourselves because the research has to, uh, the entrepreneurship uh, within appreciate school within the university then to have their own program uh, to have the research input and then have the output that can help the what places can we have partnership within high sessions of learning uh, we need to devise means of having sustainability project um, but i thought about it but we need also to have the inception stage where do we need to start from and then as we start then who are we working with so that we can be able to build projects that Uh, that can uh, live from not being supported or from outside. So now, Kumba University becoming an entrepreneur university is has been my dream. Him as a person, because uh, I happen to class of, uh, when I reach to a topic like or a chapter like product development. I do not do this. through telling them for them to go and invent how can they so that they are, then i've got good and supply so much that uh, mm -hmm. the number of resources are usually or to innovate what they want to present as a product being developed they have always come up with as products they have been able to make to make and for them They have always agreed thought about doing this in their lifetime. Because within class, we as lecturers, at the faculty level, we need to know that when I reach on a given day, so that we can test our students on how best they can be invested. Coming into a Pune university can only be achieved when we Start from the classroom level, then the university will embrace everywhere a lecturer who goes to the classroom or to the lecture room uh, to do to deliver. <laughs> has this aspect that how we can be able to many universities have uh, started apart from us who are. have not yet been uh, able to call it an innovation center, whatever name, but the purpose of having this center in place is to ensure that students can use it regularly, an idealization center where concepts now put into a proposal form, which proposal now will be presented maybe to how best you can take happen to to visit one of the entrepreneurship centers managed by the uh, the government mm. 
capital of Uganda under the military. And you cannot believe that a lot is happening there. So everything, they are doing value addition, they are doing inversions for new products, which we may be with existing products. And all sectors are there, and also vocational. But other universities like MUBS, other universities like UC you St. Lawrence first day is taking the right direction, which I'm calling upon my university. And then how do we inculcate this one to, to learners? I would advise that uh, themselves, within learners themselves, we can call them, we can call them any other name that we see as uh, shooting, but we need to leave students And the management with an invest on board. But once you give responsibility, once you give an assignment, then you be on the waiting side to see what advice is you can give or can be made better. The bulb, for example, uh, the, the bulbs we're using today. Uh, there has been, I, I understand there were, he failed 99 times. And then on bulb. So it doesn't mean be done, and then it can be built. Additions can be done to it, and then we shall get that final product, which we... Will be unique. We copyright from my university. <clears throat> we need to be organizing entrepreneurship awards, uh, maybe annually or quarterly, uh, to see those best inventors or best. Mm. Innovators that have come out with uh, um, to work on the mines because um, we are university. We know we are doing a lot of academic work, such work and the like, but. When we are you, well, I usually ask students, and so why are you here? Why did you come to study at a the university? But what I'm looking for is the thinking of these students when they are seated. Are they? Ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Mr. Zwa Akram discussing how to strengthen entrepreneurship within universities and working towards the entrepreneurial university. He was down there in Busuka, he did this work on and off. This statement, Madam Diana, answered her two questions. Um. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. May I see the questions, please, if possible? Okay. Um, there's a viewer who is um, wondering whether small businesses in Uganda are doing better since they could advertise their products on social media platforms? Or is technology helping meaningfully the local market or are businesses embarking on a train that has not yet reached our train station? Um, so what I'm getting from this question is uh, basically whether small businesses have been in a position to benefit 
especially when we're looking at social media platforms. So let's look at the social media platforms, first of all. We have um, WhatsApp, it's just like Swift. We have, um, we have WhatsApp, we have Twitter, we have Instagram, and uh, there's also Facebook. So for starters, my answer is yes. The small businesses have basically um, gotten so much out of this. How? Uh, one, they've gotten visibility as far as their existence. Uh, when you're looking at, let's say, the Facebook platforms, you find that everyone who has a Facebook account is in a position to see the people who are there. We have different um, small, small firms that are there. And, and we have people who sell clothes, we have people who sell shoes, people who sell furniture, people who are doing engineering. So we are looking at both products and services. All those people are there. So they can easily be seen by each person in whatever region we we have in this country. As long as you have network and you have a Facebook account and you sign it, yes, so that's one. We're looking at visibility. And two, we are looking at sales. People sell not only in Kampala or in the areas near them, they sell to people all over the country. And we're looking at use of um, electronic distribution services. So once you make an order, we'll get uh, usually uh, let's say you go to Facebook, they'll tell you uh, deliveries at your cost. So the, the person who is selling, we look for, usually they have their own people who do the distribution. And wherever you are, they'll give to you uh, the product. They'll specify the delivery time or the lead time, and you'll get the product within the time that's specified. So the sales have increased uh, as far as the small um, holders or the small business operators are concerned. Then another thing is that... Um, we are looking at lots of savings, uh, especially when you're looking at movement in regards to buying goods from the international markets. Um, let's say we usually, in Uganda, we usually do buy goods from, uh, we buy a lot from China. So um, we have um, Alibaba, we can use it, but that's usually business to business. But when you're looking at small businesses, we have, um, let's we have uh, an app we can use, you can buy from Chiku online, if you want, let's to, uh, say to uh, deal with clothes, we have electronics, we have clothes. You can just go, get to Chiku online, look for the pieces of shoes that you want to buy or the electronic uh, appliances that you would want to. Then you'll chat with the people, you'll do the payment, and then at the end of the day, within a specific period of time, usually they could say two weeks or three weeks, depending on the time that will be specified and you find that your goods will come here without you going to China. So that is saving a lot in regards to transport money. Uh, then we are looking at um, another way small businesses have been in position to benefit from the platforms is uh, we are looking at a way where people do advertise. And when they advertise, people come in. But we're also having other firms that are looking at it in a different way. Uh, because which way we are looking at farms coming in to use it as a, another mode of communication to reach out to their customers. If these other modes of communication can't work like physically going to the farm, we can use our Facebook account, we can use our Twitter account. So almost every organization these days has a Twitter account or a Facebook account. Just in case you have a problem, you can always go to, and you, you, you were not helped earlier, you can go to their Twitter account, you can go to their Facebook account, and you raise your problem, and then your problem is solved. Now, for small, small businesses operating, you see, when we get to Facebook, me, I operate a lot on Facebook, because I've seen there's a lot of potential out there. So there's, uh, there's a group that is them tried and tested. We usually get to see, to, 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 to complain, about the disservice we have gotten within the various organizations and these micro businesses that have been serving us. And then you go there, you try to shame the person, and most organizations, by the way, are linked there, or even the small organizations. So you find that whoever is concerned, when somebody brings up um, a claim, somewhere along the way it will be solved. If they have an issue, they'll still come back because we can all, we always, people always get to get, go back to that Facebook account and then say, I have been helped in this way. But so all of these platforms are still working. So this is how people of small businesses have been in position to gain from there. Um, 
So we are embarking on a lane that is uh, taking us very far. So the more we work on uh, making sure we have the available infrastructure, then that will be very good for us and the small businesses. Now, um, the second question, Madam Baiba was asking about um, about I think the question was about production, uh, man the manufacturing sector, logistics as far as the manufacturing sector is concerned. So usually, I said uh, earlier in my discussion that um, logistics activities or the types of logistics activities are usually in three sectors. We are looking at uh, uh, when materials, when we are looking at movement of raw materials as they're coming in from this, uh, the supplies, how we store them, um, for those farms that have a goods receiving unit, how they're going to do the storage, how later transportation is going to be from there to the final storage or the warehouse. And then, uh, so, uh, then the other uh, part is movement of work in process. So we're looking at materials handling within the warehouse. How are we doing the storage of these materials? How have we, how have we um, kind of organized our warehouses to accommodate the different types of materials that we're having? So when we look at all that, I think that's exactly the sector you're talking about. And then the last type of activity um, is looking at movement of finished goods, how goods get to reach our customers or consumers out there. So these two you're saying have been kind of looked at. Now, the, the, the one that is not easily seen is the movement of working process usually taking place within the manufacturing um, sector. So it won't be seen because uh, usually uh, manufacturers would kind of make sure they do it within. It's not that we're going to, to see the processes taking place, but what happens is that the output, the deliverable at the end of the day is going to be good. We're going to have quality goods, we're going to have standard items, we're going to have order fulfillments, we're going to have packages that are recyclable and that are well, environmentally friendly at the end of the day. So usually what happens within movement of work in process is that we are looking more at materials handling, which systems we are working with. So here, our organizations can choose either to be traditional, use physical systems, they can use to be um, automated all through, or they can use to look at both of them. So this will depend on the resources that they are having. But most of the times, when we are looking at the E aspect or the digitalization aspect, we are looking at trying to make sure we do automation. So here we're looking at if there are firms that would be in position to integrate their systems with the suppliers as far as materials management is concerned. In that we save time, we save transport money, and uh, so that we, we have a system like an economic order quantity system. Or when we, we can set inventory level systems, whereby if you want items, or automatically as materials are getting to be finished in the warehouse, the other supplier gets to know somehow, automatically, because of the systems we have set, we're sharing with, and then the, the supplier gets to know, and then they do the deliveries of the materials. Of course, we have to, first of all, set the items that we will need, the few prerequisites that will be looked at, but I'll not go into that. But if we set such um, integrated systems with the suppliers, it means we're going to be efficient in the deliveries, we're going to have uh, less of solid, um, uh, as far as less of solid materials, and then that will help us. Another thing is, um, we, if we are looking at, say, there are farms that do automation and we have computer-aided manufacturing, that is still within the production. Now, the more we have computer-aided manufacturing, we're going to have standardized products. We're going to have efficient um, quality and, and efficiency and effectiveness within our processes. At the end of the day, what does that mean? That the final consumer will have a quality standard. So it will come out and uh, what we are having, me as a consumer, you as a consumer, will be in position to have tested what took place in this farm. So for farms that do not have that much, you find that we will not have, we will not even be certain of the deliveries at the end of the day. This is where order fulfillment fails. This is where packaging comes and then the items are damaged somehow, or items are not in position to satisfy um, the expectations of the particular customers out there. And um, probably, I think that is all. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Madam Diana Nabuatu, the youngest lecturer in Kumba has. But yes, so she's the only person who shall have a PhD at the age of 33 or 32, inshallah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for the patience. You have that virtue of patience. Very many veterans are not patient. You came in by name, it is four o'clock, and you're still patient. I would like to request that we get a maximum of four questions. If we can get them, then thereafter we shall have closing remarks from our academic registry. There are no more questions in the chat room. I don't know if there is anybody with a question to the person who's going to present the later. Thank you, Program Director. I know that we pressed. Just have a question. Um, but perhaps I need clarity on, and uh, maybe even moving forward to the next conference that we. We look at our education and we look at agriculture and I wonder whether we are on the decision table to start with and whether we actually
Thank you. Now we are going to prevent things in the way. Thank you very much, professors, for answering the question. We can now talk one more thing about the first, second, of the fourth industrial revolution. I don't know if there's any other person with a question. Any other person? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for having presented the different papers, the different papers, those that have posed questions, and all those that have attended this webinar. Allow me to invite our very only academic registrar, Professor Andrews Yiga, to come and talk to us. Professor, that's Professor Peters. I uh, know we always add this Peters Andrews. Yiga. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Allow me to remove this. I must thank management and the organizers of this webinar. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Presenters, internal and external, a big thank you. Discussants, you have done a good job. Since morning, you have given us information in terms of content as well. So you have served what you were tasked to do to serve on this webinar. At the same time, you have responded to questions that pertain to us. In your presentations, you have asked questions, some of which have been answered, others still we are yet to ponder. You have designed questions for a takeaway, still for us to ponder. Since you have done a good job, I will not go over whatever you presented. Corporate re responsibility was an issue. The word ethics came several times in different forums. And it's more a question of orientation. Where do you come from to do what you do? And where you do it? Where do you come from? Family? And what definition of that family? That's where we pick ethics. And the moral issues are debatable at different levels. Again, morality in which environment? The Ugandan environment or the East African environment or the African environment? Which environment? The one which is already polluted? by our colonial masters, and who are still controlling us, directly or indirectly. Now, I'll repeat on something which is Ubuntu, which is, uh, has already been used, and the issue of our motto, OU. What does it mean? How does what we do perforate into our immediate communities? 
is what we do embedded in the S diggies. So here we have to do, as we move on, to develop robust and adequate human resource that is helpful. And here again, what we are doing by collaborating with other individuals out there, I'm talking of the issue of ideal, whereby we advocate that people support what they have helped to create. And an entrepreneur, most of you have written on, have you consulted the Wanaiki to do what you do? Or you simply turn into them and tell them what to do? Do you send them ideas? Do you cooperate with them? In other words, do you involve them? You know, people support what they create. And at times we ask people, what moral authority do you have to ask you or to blame me for this and that? Now, in whatever program that we write, we have to place it within the SDGs. Those of United Nations, those of our country, and we move on. And are those of our country supported by the country itself? I don't want you to lose sight in whatever you have said of the ongoing COVID or the post-COVID. Some are celebrating the post-COVID, but are we still in COVID? So what is it that we are saying during this period? And has been COVID, has it been a, an added advantage to us or a blessing in these days? Do we practice better within COVID or even after COVID? So those are questions, some of the questions you should ask yourselves. And what does the word ethics involve? There are so many words, cooperate, the core values. What is embedded in core values? Those are big questions you have to ask yourself. And our word digital age is beautiful. You can click on your phone and get all that information in a minute. And again, we should celebrate the double edged sword of our digital age, the good and the bad. Do the bad outweigh the good, or the good outweigh the bad? Now, in any society, there is always a remnant. Not everybody can be bad. There is always a remnant. Can we ride on the shoulders of the remnant and we'll move on? So here I have another quotation. We were born to be real, not to be perfect. So can we begin somewhere? We were born to be perfect. Should we move to and let us go from where we are, from our mega means to change the situation? We cannot just conform with an, an ESCO and we call it a day. Let us change from our quality, from the individual. Otherwise, I'm just saying that webinar was timely. The time was proper. And using the time as a big resource and the human that we already have here, let us do what we can to change.
the way things are today in Uganda and in Africa. I owe you, and with those few words, I take this honor to close this webinar. I owe you. Thank you, Prof. Professor Nanda, we are going to start drinking from our own waves. And this is the plan. If we, start, if we do this very many times, trust me, we shall drink and our water shall flow and we shall see what we have both been seeing. Thank you very much, Professor John, for the initiative.